Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday for our Network Threat Hunt training. Um, as we like to say, happy time zone, because for most of us, it's about you know 10.30 a.m. Uh, late morning, but for some of you, it's probably middle of the night or 3 o'clock in the morning. Um, so happy time zone, whatever time zone you're in. And if you're in our Discord, we always love to see where people are joining us from, so feel free to share that with us in the live webcast chat channel. Yeah. Uh, if you're not with us on Discord yet, I would definitely recommend joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share the link to the Discord server inside the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. Um, it is the Threat Hunter community, so it's not technically a company server, but there's a ton of channels around threat hunting for you to check out. And today, we're going to be all the way near the bottom in the live webcast chat channel under the Active Countermeasures section. And if you're seeing people typing, you're in the right channel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I see you got people joining us from Texas and Portland, Maine. That's awesome. Oh, Portland, Maine would be a nice place to be. Yes. Yeah, It'd I definitely like, miss. Like 90% less humidity than what we have right now. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, no kidding. Yeah, Maine is such a beautiful place. Yep. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. yeah. It's nice that it's still natural. You know, it hasn't been built out like, you know, most states have been. So. Yeah, yeah. Good, lo good logging roads to drive on. Oh. Hello, Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wonder how many people will go. We need to download a VM the moment this starts. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so if you haven't already visited the um, web page for this training, we would definitely recommend doing that now and downloading the VM um, or the labs ASAP. If you go to the ACM webcast content channel, we have the link for the page along with the PDF of the slide deck, or you could go to our website where Chris is right now on the screen, and you see that tab, the Threat Hunt Training tab. Um, it brings you right to the Threat Hunt Training page where you can find, again, the PDF of the slide deck, um, the recording from our last session, which will be replaced with this recording shortly, um, along with all the info you need to get set up with the hands-on labs. Yep, I will say the script is usually the easiest way to go. As long as you've got uh, Ubuntu set up that, Ubuntu 18 or uh, CentOS 7, just uh, grab this script and then just go to town. And it's April 83. Stuck was, in the hospital, but made sure to be here. Wow. Yeah, wow. I was about to mention that. <laughs> that's awesome. Yes, I've, I've never seen doing somebody, well. it, yeah. I've never seen somebody ask for the Wi-Fi password during their appendectomy. I think that's amazing. <laughs> wow. Oh, man. Yeah. Uh, although, I don't know, Florida, Texas, I think we're lucky we're not all working from the hospital. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. True. Oh, look Ooh, at the puppy. We have a new puppy. We have a new puppy butt. Hi, <laughs> puppy butt. Yes, we'd oh, like to so introduce cute. everybody to the newest member of our team. This is our newest QA engineer. He likes to lick <laughs> noses, of course. This is Kobe, and he joined Active Countermeasures on Wednesday. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Congratulations, Bill. That's very cool. Oh, thank <laughs> you. He's doing very well. Yeah. He's not quite <laughs> sure about the world yet, but. At 10 months, I don't think I was either, so. Yeah. <laughs> hey, he looks, looks pretty chill. He looks pretty Aww. chill. You're yeah, happy. doing great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably wondering <laughs> where all these voices are coming from. That's yeah. right. Well, they're in my ear, so that he, he may be able to see you a little bit on the screen, but there's no idea if anybody's talking or not. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, so you couldn't convince Deb to name him like Star-Lord or something, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> no. Or like, you know, doggy McDog face or. You know, so. Yeah. <laughs> Puppy McDog face. I love that. The, was it the British Navy? The British uh, yes. Marines? Yeah. Said, oh, hey, gee, name our boat. Bodie McBoat face. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was Bodie McBoat face. Yeah. <laughs> so I've seen Egypt and Sydney. Those are definitely the two furthest away so far. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we have someone from Pakistan, too. That's wow. awesome. Nice. Very cool. Ah, and a link to the training content in Discord. Thank you for that. Yes. 
Yeah, so once again, thank you everybody for joining us on a Saturday. Um, if you are new to Active Countermeasures and this is the first time you've attended this training with us, we then do- Then we're sorry. Yes. <laughs> we're sorry. Let's, we'll just, to, let, uh, let's just apologize in advance and get that out of the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, if you are new, you probably aren't used to this uh, pre-show banter either. So let me go over that real quick. Um, this is not the actual training quite yet. Um, this is what we like to call the pre-show banter and setup um, session. So for the first half hour, we like to start early and just, you know, chat a little bit, show off our new dog or, or um, learn where everyone's from and also answer any setup questions you have about the labs or the course in general. Um, but if you are new as well, uh, we do run this training on almost a monthly or bi-monthly basis. Um, so if you can't stick around for the whole session this Saturday, that's totally fine and understandable. Um, we hope that you guys have some life outside of work related things. So we are recording the session. What's that? And, <laughs> right? For us, we don't know. Um, <laughs> but if you do and you have to leave at some point, then the whole session is being recorded and we will post it on that page where you downloaded the VM from. Um, we also have another session coming up in October that's on a Tuesday. So if you know anyone who wanted to join us but didn't have the chance to, um, there is another session that's going to come up on a weekday for them. So we had a question in Discord. Uh, thanks for the class. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering if you could cover anything related to the net hunting for cloud in AWS in particular in this course, your advanced course. Um, so you can see I navigated to the Active Countermeasures website. I did a uh, went into webcast and did a search on AWS and came up with this one, AWS VPC Traffic Mirror. So this basically talks about how to go through and configure AWS to kind of work very similar to the architecture we're talking about here where you can collect traffic going to all of your EC2 instances, pull it all into one spot, have Z go through the data, and then you can go through and process the data from here. This is actually the blog post, but there's also a webcast on it as well that Bill was kind enough to do. With Chris's help. And just as a side note, at the bottom of that blog post that Chris was mentioning, there is a more general post on uh, cloud, and virtual machine monitoring uh, related to this. Obviously, the one that Chris is talking about is specific to AWS, but I'll post the link to the other one in the chat, in, sorry, in the live webcast chat channel. And so, so both of those are good resources if you're interested in learning how to do uh, any type of monitoring in a cloud. Hmm. I keep coming back to the blog entry. I'm having trouble finding the... Uh... So Chris, I think the webcast you're looking for, if I'm correct, is the sniffing traffic with Amazon um, EC2 with traffic mirroring. Yep, 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 yep. So if you just scroll down a little bit, you should see it on the um, webcast archive or yep, do it in the search bar. There we go. So yeah, and you I get a blog and you get a webcast on that, so. Yes, and both links have been shared inside the um, Discord channel for everybody. Cool. Oh, and Bill was right. I did that one too. Yeah. Wow. These start to run together after a while. <laughs> they really do. <laughs> Have I written a blog post on this? I cannot yeah. tell you how many times I've I've put in a search in Google for some technical topic, and one of the answers in the top ten results is a blog post I wrote, usually mm. about three or four years ago. Uh, and I'm like, who the heck is this guy? He doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. Oh, wait, that's me, damn. That's now, awesome. now, now <clears throat> come on, Bill, you and I have had this conversation before. We both use blog entries as basically a notebook. Yes, that's right. right? <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, this was cool, and it took me a little bit to research it, so let me do a blog entry on it, so when I need to remember it for next time, I can just go look at my own blog entry. So That's right. Um, you know, what's even better is, is you're reading your own work, and you're like, I know a, such a better way to do this. <laughs> yes. <Awesome. laughs> How could you have thought this? <laughs> uh, let's see. So somebody said, Ubuntu install question, running it on Raspberry Pi. I could only install uh, 20.04 LTS. I ran the script and it installed no issues. Am I going to break the internet? Uh, I'm not sure Rita will work for you. Yeah. Um, be, because the last, so basically, um, 
and someone came up for a hack with a hack with this where you could run it on 20 but you have to actually manually install mongo and i forget what version it was they uh they ran it on oh what version of mongo that was running it was like 5.2 or something like that um but if the labs work for you then yeah you won't break the internet so all is good yep uh, hi, if you download the VM, is it already configured for the training session? Yes, it is. So if you download one of the two VMs, you are all set to go. Uh, we won't be generating any traffic. You won't really need to go out from the VM. Uh, there is a couple of labs where we're going to do you know, research on an external third-party site, but that doesn't have to go from your VM. That can go from your host system, and that'll work just fine. Hi, from California. Hey, stay... Uh, Stay safe. <laughs> Sporting the Threat Hunter Tiger shirt this morning, AM. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and Bill's yeah, got on the uh, pre show banter shirt. And I've got oh, my yeah. ACM shirt on. Awesome. Yes, for anybody who doesn't know, um, we are part of a family group of companies, and we all together have a uh, general store called the Spearfish General Store. So that's with us and our sister companies, Wild West Hacking Fest and Black Hills Informational Security. And there's and and um, and anti siphon now. Got to add that one in. Yes, yes, anti siphon training as well, which we're working on some fun swag for um, that new company to go along with <laughs> too. Um, speaking of though, if you enjoy this training and you're looking for something a little more advanced. Chris does teach an advanced threat hunting class with Anti-Siphon. Um, we can share the link for that inside the Discord for everybody. But the next time he will be teaching that class is during the um, virtual Wild West Hacking Fest event that we're doing um, near the end of September. Yep, which hopefully everyone's heard that is now 100% virtual. Um, we were, you know, we had originally hoped things would be better by now. So we had planned an on-site event. Uh, one of the things that kind of threw a monkey wrench in it is uh, <laughs> where we where we hold the Deadwood event is just a couple of towns away from where they hold Sturges, which I think is the largest motorcycle event in the United States. Um, I think they got like 700,000 people that showed up and folks who are living in the area are saying, oh, yeah, we're a total COVID hotspot right now. So. Yeah. So rather than ask people to come into a COVID hotspot, <laughs> just, just to learn some, you know, cool geek stuff, we decided, yeah, we're going to just do this all virtual and call it done. So. Yeah. And as, you know, as sad as it is for all of us, it's definitely better to be safe than sorry. Oh, and, absolutely. Um, we still got a ton of fun stuff planned for the virtual event on the Discord server that we're going to be using. And it's it's going to be a great time. So if you um, want to join us, you can also attend Chris's training um, as the pre-conference training as well. Awesome. It's a crazy world right now. Crazy world. Yeah, that it is. No, I was thinking when you were listing off all of our uh, daughter companies, sister companies, cousin companies, whatever you want to call them, it's almost like we need like a rolling credits screen to, yeah. to yeah. list them all. <laughs> Uh, so let's see. Someone says, uh, I, I'm pretty new at this. I do have my uh, Security Plus cert and working on Network Plus. I'm self-taught. Awesome. I think uh, pretty much everybody that you see on your screen kind of came up that way. Uh, how tough is this going to be for someone new? It should not be that bad. Um, some of the packet decoding stuff, um, if you haven't been, if you're not too far into like the Network Plus stuff, uh, might seem a little bit uh, challenging to you, but beyond that, I think you'd be able to follow along just fine. Um, and, and I've tried to gauge the labs for a wide range of skill sets. Uh, basically, what I do with the labs is each lab is a ch is a problem or a challenge to solve. So I'll have a slide that is, hey, here's the challenge, and that slide on its own is kind of designed for the folks that have been at this for a while. Basically, read, you know, what is the challenge? What's the problem you get to solve? And now go figure it out. Uh, for the folks that aren't seasoned, they might read that and say, all right, I kind of think I know what that means. I'm just not exactly sure how to accomplish the task. Uh, after the challenge slide, the next slide is always the help slide. And the help slide basically kind of 
gives you some things to think about that'll help point you in the right direction to get things solved. If you read that and you say, okay, I kind of understand it, but I'm really new and I really have no idea how to go after this. Uh, after that will be uh, all of the exact commands you should go through and run. And then after that will be the answers. Uh, so if you're worried about the labs being too far over your head, uh, don't be, because I've really tried to gear this so that um, you know, from season to new and just starting out, everybody is going to get the same level of challenge out of it. Yes. And also remember the class is being recorded and you'll have access yep. to the recording on the same web page where you downloaded the VM. So if it's a little too much to, you know, take in all at once, you can always go back and watch the recording a second, a third, a fourth time to make sure you get it all down. Yeah, and CSIC had some good advice, which was just remember not to panic if you feel like you're getting behind. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, recognize that we all started and we're green at some point. <laughs> some of us are still more green than others. Um, and, and nobody knows everything. So, uh, you know, if you kind of get into this and you kind of feel like, you know, wow, you know, I, I've got so much to learn. Yeah, welcome to the club. That's kind of part of being in security is always feeling like, wow, I've got a lot to learn because nobody has a handle on all this stuff. Totally agreed. I, I used to I used to have a board for the number of times that I was able to teach Bill Stern something about Linux that he didn't know. And I think I'm up to six and I've known him <laughs> for over 20 years. <laughs> all that means, Chris, is that I made the mistakes about five minutes before you. That's all, That's all that means. <laughs> oh, we got a hello from Brazil. Very nice. So you got to give the class in Portuguese now, Chris. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that'll go well. <laughs> <laughs> that'll go well. Yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's a frequently asked questions document in the ACM webcast content channel. <laughs> and what's up there is from a July Threat Hunt class fact. Uh, dash 2021 dash 07. Uh, I haven't made any changes to it, so the times for the class may be off. Uh, they may actually be correct, believe it or not. But uh, if you've got some problems, you may want to take a look at that fact document. I'll go and update it and send up a new one when I have any changes to make. Yeah, I, I totally messed with Bill on that one because Bill maintains that doc and I changed the VM and the content <laughs> like three days ago. So no like, woo, yeah, hey, Bill, you know, I know you already don't get any sleep. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck is that spinning in the background? You're trying to hypnotize us. That's to let you know I'm thinking. So if yes. that stops, I've stopped thinking and somebody else needs to take over the class. As long yeah. as that's turning, we're in good shape. Yes, we like to say that's a uh, visual representation of Chris's brain. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I, I th it's not quite chaotic enough for that. But yeah. yeah sure, it's not spinning say, quite fast enough. Or... Yeah, it, it, it is a close approximation. So it's, it's the less scary version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we got South Korea here. Yeah. Oh, wow. awesome. Nice. Yeah, it's just so cool. Everybody comes from so many different places. You know, so we appreciate that too. So. <laughs> Thinking is overrated. <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to use your gut. Don't think, right? Yeah, really. Oh, another person from Canada. Awesome. Oh, that's cool. It, it's cool to see. Oh, sorry, Bill. Go for it. Oh, I just have a deep respect for any country that has a strategic maple syrup reserve. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Oh, that's okay. No, I was just going to uh, say that the, our, our uh, friend from South Korea is saying they took this class earlier. Uh, it's cool to see repeat offenders. And they were saying, yes. you know, they'd be glad to see it expanded. So we originally did it as six hours. And then um, we toned it back because we thought that was too long. And then, you know, me being me, just like couldn't fit in enough. <laughs> Within, I think we tried like four hours, and yeah, yeah didn't, that didn't work. So we're 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 back up to six again because I really do want to make sure there's enough time to do some good labs. Um, 
I kind of hate when I go to, when I like attend training and they say, oh yeah, and there's labs you can do. And you go through like 95% of the person talking. And then there's like one or two simple things you can try at the end. And it's like, yeah, no. So I've really tried to gear this. So half of the day today is going to be hands-on labs. Ooh, Denmark. Nice. Yeah, and it looks like they also took the course and are excited for the extended version. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good method. I mean, I've done that myself. I, I've attended like an online course and, and done it more than once. Yeah. And, and always pick yeah. up all the stuff you miss the first time. So. The first time through, you're learning terms and concepts and overall ideas. And then the second time through, you get to actually think about the hands-on individual details. And you're like, okay, I remember this from last time. Great. Now I can focus on. That's yeah. perfect. And the yeah. nice part is you don't have to pay twice for the course. How cool is that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will say the only one I've done that with really recently has been uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's Masterclass on critical thinking. Uh, if you haven't attended that, or if you haven't seen it, it is definitely worth it. Uh, that That's one I had to go through twice. Um, it basically just kind of goes through how to do good decision making, which sounds like a very simple concept, um, but he he executes on it really well, so. Yeah, I have, a, he's, I have a wonderful respect for his ability to be amazingly smart to start with, but not talk down to people, not to, yeah talk way over your level to make it to put it in a form that any audience can listen to and understand and if i can use that as a model for my own teaching uh, i'm a happy man right there yeah yeah i agree actually high intelligence like that is kind of hard to convey to those that are not at that same level so you know, i like that mm. yeah like me that's why i had to watch it twice <laughs> <laughs> Well, I haven't even watched it once, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, so if you sign up for my master class, his is really good. Uh, LeVar Burton has one on uh, storytelling that is awesome as well, so. <laughs> nice play, uh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> K-Phantom wins the meme award today. Yes, exactly. Awesome. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, and Ego, Egoldolf, I have no idea if I'm pronouncing your name right, but he said that um, they joined us back in January 2021 um, when we were using different platform than GoToWebinar. So that was actually the first ever run we did of the course. So, yeah, and actually that would have been last year. Yeah, was, yeah, over a year ago. And yeah. we had so many people that we couldn't get them on to GoToWebinar. I think we had to, to jump ship real fast. Yeah, we yes. had uh, over 2,000 people live. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, that that was one of those. Um, someone said, "Hey, so there's over you know 4,600 people signed up for this class. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> <laughs> should we shut off registration at some point? Yeah, we should. We should shut it off at 3,000. <laughs> <laughs> Too late. Tough to answer every individual question. I'll tell you. Yeah, really." Well, and I mean, there really is a huge amount of value here. Um, you know, there, there's similar courses offered that are ridiculous amounts of money they charge. So, yeah. So this is really an awesome thing you're doing. Oh, well, we have fun with this. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, Keith, you know the mantra, we suck at capitalism, so. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's it's just great, actually, just to share the knowledge, you know, so yeah. everybody can get better at this and, you know, fight against the bad guys. So. Yeah, and I, and I do want to clarify that because we have, like, had people write in and say, you know, how dare you slam capitalism? And, you know, I'm from an area of the world that was socialism, and here was all the things I hated about living there. And, it, it, you know, relax. <laughs> it, it, it's not about that. The, yeah. the that that mantra of you know sucking at capitalism is more about um it's more in alignment of who we are as organizations and that you know we like to share what we know uh john has been doing you know webcasts on different topics for years um i have as well um it, it's just 
you know, it's one of these things where you can try and hoard the knowledge and try and feel better about yourself because you know something other people don't, or you can share it and maybe others can help bring it to the next level so that we're all that much smarter. And, you know, we kind of go at it that way. So it, it's not, um, <laughs> it, 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 it's not a geopolitical commentary shirt. It, it's, it's a, you know, hey, let's just, uh, if you're good at something, um, help other people with that by making them good at it too. Totally agreed. It's not a political position. It's just the right thing to do. So, yeah. So. Anyone that objects to giving back to the community doesn't deserve to benefit from your generous efforts. Yeah, that's so... You know, Shelby mentioned there's a you know bunch of sister companies. Uh, none of them are venture capital uh, funded, and that's part of the reason why, is because uh, like you know what we sell, <laughs> what we sell uh, AC Hunter for is a, at a price. Um, when you look at our competitors, you know one of the, uh, the other things we like to brag about is that we're cheaper than their sales tax. Meaning that if you look at like what are equivalent threat hunting tools out there, what would it cost you to purchase them for the typical corporate environment with like a thousand people type of thing? Um, now look at our price and it literally is less than the sales tax you would pay on our competitor's price. Uh, that would never happen if we had venture capital funding. Um, <clears throat> the amount of free training we give away, the amount of webcasts we do and the blog entries and all that, that would never happen with venture capital funding because there's always that focus on, you know, how do, how do we optimize and squeeze every penny out of everything we possibly do? And that's just not how we roll, so. All right, and hey, we are um, about two minutes from the start time of the actual training. So yeah. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna go over all the housekeeping notes for everybody one more time, just in case anyone missed them earlier. Um, if this is your first time joining us for a training, then welcome and thank you so much for joining us on a Saturday. Um, we do have all of the chat and QA for our trainings take place on the Threat Hunter Community Discord server. So I've gone ahead and shared a link to the server inside the GoToWebinar chat for everybody. Um, it's not a company server, it's a community server. So there is a ton of channels around threat hunting and open source tools. Um, but at the very bottom of the server, there is a section for active countermeasures. And the, sec or the uh, channel that we're in today is the live webcast chat channel. It's the one with the big red dot. And below that, you'll see the ACM webcast content channel. You'll also see in that channel, there's a link to the lab download in case you haven't done that already. Um, and a link to the PDF for the slide deck for today. Um, along with that, I wanna remind everybody that this class is being recorded and we'll post the recording onto the webpage where you downloaded the labs within the next few days. Um, you'll also receive an email tomorrow containing your certificate of attendance from today as well. And if I could and throw in one more piece, if you're looking for the details about where to get the labs or the virtual machines or anything else, go back to the email that you got that registered you for this class. And unless Shelby corrects me, I believe all the details are in there. Yep. Yes, yep, if you can't join us and go, or in a Discord for some reason, that email you received from GoToWebinar should contain the link as well, so. Uh, I, so I noticed we've got somebody attending from New Orleans uh, where they have a category four hurricane bearing down on them right now. So, uh, wow, dude, if we can at least provide a distraction for you on like what the rest of your weekend's gonna be like, that's awesome. But, uh, you know, please stay safe. Like Shelby said, the, 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 this will be recorded if you can get out of that area now. Um, I know they like missed the deadline for being able to shut down the highways to be able to run all the traffic in one direction so they're not doing a mandatory uh, evacuation out in New Orleans. But uh, I, I did, you know, I, I did go visit there after the last nasty hurricane, like three months later. And even after three months, it was like, oh my God, uh, just what those people went through. So uh, yeah, yeah, Chris, dude, stay safe, please. Get out if you can. Uh, let's see, we had a question about the amount of memory. Uh, that would be uh, RAM. So don't need a whole lot of disk space unless you want to add stuff in. I uh, also saw some uh, challenges with the VMware virtual image. Uh, I'll go back and I'll take a look at those. 
not during not during class it'll be after but uh yeah if you're running into trouble with the vmware image best bet uh build up ubuntu 18 central west 7 on your own just download the script run that you'll be in good shape and keep remember the third option of setting up a DigitalOcean virtual machine uh, we have step-by-step -step instructions on that you run it for two hours you pay for two hours you can shut it down or six hours and you can be done with it. It's actually relatively straightforward. So yep. if you're running into headaches with vir VirtualBox or VMware, uh, it really is pretty pretty easy to do that way. And JSN and we're not chills for DigitalOcean. <laughs> yeah, and, and JSN, who is a very frequent contributor to our webcasts, said, "Yeah, if uh, Chris was in the storm, he would be rally crossing your car out of there. Hell yeah." Yes, he would. <laughs> Shelby, sure would. can you generate a new link, a uh, new invite for Discord? We're getting people who are saying that that uh, old link is no longer working. Sure can. Thank you so much. Uh, last question, and then we'll get started. Someone asked, if we're using the class VM, do we still need to run the install script? No, you do not. So it's three, and I got a slide on it in here. Yes. Uh, um, well, it's buried in there. Uh, there's it, you only need one of the three options. So option one is build up CentOS 7, Ubuntu 18 yourself, run the install script. Option two is download one of the VMs, uh, uh, or uh, option three is run it out of uh, DigitalOcean. So you only need to do one of those three. Cool. And in that case, uh, it's after the top of the hour, so we should get started. Yes. All right. All right. See you guys in a couple hours. Yep. I am. I am going to drop off camera so that I don't scare small children while we're doing this. Cool. And, and just one last time, I want to say thanks to everybody showing up today. Um, I know it's a Saturday and people have like lives, I've heard anyway. <laughs> I would not quite know what that is, but uh, really appreciate folks turning out today. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and as we said, <clears throat> excuse me, as we said, um, We've got a number of sister companies that are all interrelated. Uh, John Strand is the common theme between all of them. I uh, just wanted to say thanks to everybody that's put time and effort into making this go off. So in a couple of weeks is uh, Wild West Hacking Fest, which is the big event we host each year. Uh, there's some really cool training and talks that kind of come out of that. Uh, I'm going to be doing some of the training. So basically, there's two days where you can pick a training class, go through that, and then there's two days of the actual conference itself. Um, I've got some links here. You can, you know, go check stuff out if you want to. Uh, still time to get signed up for that if you're interested. It is a 100% virtual event. We were going to try on site, and it's just it's too scary right now. Other courses I'm teaching, I'm teaching uh, security leadership next week. Uh, so this will be cool. I'm like teaching today, down day tomorrow, and then get right back into teaching again, which should be fun. Um, I've also got an intro class that's kind of a pre to this one called uh, Getting Started with Packet Decoding. So if we, when we start getting into the labs and we start getting into a little bit of like what's inside of the packets that are going by, if it feels really challenging for you, that packet decoding class might be the next best step for you. Uh, if it feels like it's too easy, the advanced threat hunting class <laughs> might be the next best bet for you. Uh, so we try to give folks a, a good range of uh, content to be able to go. <clears throat> so like I said, you need one of three things. You either need to run that script, you need to download one of the VMs, or you need to launch an instance in DigitalOcean. Um, the the DigitalOcean instance, uh, Bill worked a deal where you get like $100 worth of credit, and you know you can run like a, 12 or a $20 machine. Uh, so that'll give you a couple of months of uh, free usage to be able to go through and do the labs. Um, login info is the same regardless of what you go for, with the exception being if you run the install script. So if you run the install script, whatever login you're using that needs to have pseudo access to the environment, uh, it will be that account, that password. So if you've run the install script, just replace you know login name, password with whatever you're using on your system. And we'll do a 10 minute, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll do a 10 minute break at the top of each hour. And then about halfway through, we'll double that just to give people a little bit extra time to like feed the pets, feed the kids, 
you know, do whatever it is you need to do. Hopefully not checking in on work email today because, hey, it is Saturday for most of us. Uh, but we'll take a little extra time towards the middle of the class. Now, <clears throat> this training is very different than any of the other Threat Hunter training you go to out there. Um, I'm going to buck a lot of the norms. Don't worry, I will back it up with data. I've been doing this for quite some time. Uh, the first class I ever did along these lines, I spent, um, I don't know, 15 years or so as a uh, fellow instructor for the SANS Institute. And one of the classes I developed for them was a log analysis class. That was back in like 2001, 2002 or something like that. Uh, it was probably one of the first in-depth log analysis classes at the time. Uh, so I've been at this for a while. There's a lot I've learned over those years about what works and what doesn't work. And I really think we're kind of caught up in this cognitive bias of, well, this is what other people do, and this is what I've been taught, so I'm just going to kindly blindly follow it. And I really feel like what we do today to try to find the bad people on our network once they get in is completely broken and doesn't work. So a lot of what this class is is kind of a reset or a reboot on that. You know, here's some new ideas. Here's a different approach. So I've had, you know, folks say, well, you know, can you cite your work where you got this cl class content from? Yeah, it's me. <laughs> and it's been my time in the field. You know, this is not a copy paste off of something somebody else did. This has been based on, um, I always try to take a little bit of an agile approach to security where I go through and define, you know, what are my goals and how can I test that? And is the process I'm using achieving those goals? If not, what changes can we make to try and actually obtain those goals? So you're going to hear some things that are going to be different than you hear anyone else. Just keep an open mind on it. So when we talk about modern attacks, one of the things I wanted to dispel, dispel right away, modern attacks, the ones you got to worry about, are not, you know, overweight people in mummy and daddy's basement that are, you know, hacking into things as you, you know, probably heard on the news. Um, you know, that is a very uneducated opinion on where we are in cybersecurity today. This is about money. You know, this is about a true uh, business model, meaning, you know, go back 20 years. And yeah, this may have been about, you know, I want to see more elite than Bill Stearns. So I'm going to try and own more systems on the Internet than Bill Stearns. You know, I, I, I'm a single attacker going after this stuff. That's not what's happening today. You know, when you look at like Sunburst, which was probably the big one from last year, um, there's estimates that was probably up to at least 200 people that worked on that attack. That's a full up business model, right? That's where you get to, you know, look at every aspect of it and how to optimize it. So when we talk about, you know, attacks taking place, it's not they have unlimited resources, but, you know, think about it. Anytime what you're doing makes is making money, that's money that can be invested back into making what you do that much better and that much more complex. And that's what we're truly dealing with today. So how do we try to catch the bad guys today? What's the, like the accepted process that everybody goes after? I hear people, I see people billing this as threat hunting. Usually it's marketing people trying to sell a product <laughs> that's been around for a while and they like to rebrand it every now and then you know, add the next gen title to the end of the product name to get you interested in it again. You know, what is the way we classically do this? Well, we classically do this with signatures, right? We go in and we say, hey, somebody attacked us using this tool and this methodology. Here are things that make it unique versus other patterns on the network. So let's write signatures to go after that and spot it when it happens again in the future. Well, there's a number of issues where that just does not work too well, you know, because we're going to generate those entries, we're going to pull them down to a centralized location, and then we're going to go in and we're going to try to pattern match on the things that are interesting. So one of the first problems we run into is that our logging is basically based on syslog today, you know. Now, maybe you're using Windows logging only, uh, maybe you're using an Elk stack, that's fine but the log format we're using is still roughly based on syslog, which was a spec that came out back in the late 80s. Um, there's no facility, there's no way to 
tag a log entry as being actually security related. There is a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, there is a facility called security, but it's actually for that local system only as opposed to being a true security event. One of the things that's sorely missing from syslog is a severity level of security. Because we have like informational, we have like a debug level, we've got all of those. What we need is one labeled security so that when a log entry gets generated that's security related, we have an easy way to go in and see those. Because that's kind of why we write signatures, right? Because we've got this big lump of logs coming in and we don't know which one might have a security context to them or not. So we try to pattern match to see something that might be security related. If, it, if we just had a severity level that said security, well, now you could say, hey, any log entry that has a security severity level, I need to stop and take a look at that and that make life a little bit better, but we don't have that. Also, everything logs differently. Um, I went through trying to write some consistent signatures for like Apache running on Linux. And then I tried Apache on Windows and found that like the alerts are totally different. You know, what you might see in a log entry is totally different. Uh, then I tried to compare Nginx to, uh, to Apache just on the Linux platform, and those were totally different. So one of the biggest issues we have is you can go in and you can write a signature, and that will work for a platform. It isn't going to work for everything. The other issue you run into is that when you're trying to find out what's going on in your network by doing centralized logging, you never actually centralize log everything. If you think you're logging everything, you're not. You're fooling yourself. One of the biggest problems we have is that logging is a failed open condition. By that, I mean, if I can get a system plugged into your network, I'm still gonna be able to get internet access. I could still potentially get infected, even though you're not collecting any log entries up from my system. There's no way to really define a requirement that, you know, let's say like I try to go to the internet, it would be nice if my firewall validated, hey, is that system, is, does that system have its host logs getting collected? If it does, great, I'll let it out to the internet. If not, uh, I'm not gonna let it go by. There's no way to write a firewall rule like that. At least not that I've seen. Um, so it's easy to end up with stuff on the network that quite honestly, you might even not know for sure is there. Now, what are these signatures of which we speak? Basically, this is regular expression matching. So we're going in and we're saying, hey, if you see this sequence of characters in a log entry, trigger an alert. Or hey, if you see this particular character, uh, string of characters in a log entry more than three times in a 10 second period of time, trigger an alert. Or if you see this log entry show up after that log entry, you know, trigger an alert. It's basic pattern matching. So we're going in and we're saying, hey, this is what we saw when somebody went in and did an attack in the past. So we're going to continue to look for it going forward. That's not really helpful. Again, this was fine 20 years ago when it was about mass propagation, when it was about I need to own more, Stearns, more systems than Bill Stern so that I can feel good about myself and feel like I'm more elite than him. Today, it's about money. And because it's about money, that needed investment is there to innovate. So I can go in and I can attack company A and do my research to figure out, okay, what are they running for endpoint protection software? What are they running for a firewall? What do I need to do to try to get around them? And now when I go to target company B, I can use a different infrastructure and a different set of techniques that are based on what, the, what their environment looks like instead. So my attack setup changes. Um, pattern matching on that just doesn't work. You know, this is based on kind of that old antivirus model, right? When you look at antivirus, antivirus went through a similar type of evolution as we're going through now. You know, old, old school antivirus would go in and look at every binary to see, is this pattern in it? If so, I'll label it as having this malware. Well, that stopped working because we started seeing so much malware coming out so, so quickly. So we had to move to other things like, you know, hey, was it digitally signed by someone I trust? Does this you know, binary have a hash that's known to be trusted? You know, We had to kind of flip the model. And I really feel like we're at that point with this too. We can't just keep trying to find old stuff. You know, <clears throat> Last December, uh, so Sunburst, yeah, I mentioned that. Last December, FireEye came out and said, hey, this is a Sunburst thing you need to worry about. 
And all the security vendors said, hey, no problem. We wrote a signature for it. Too late, right? <laughs> too late, not enough, not enough too late. To find out about Sunburst in December, did you know good? Because you know what? Whoever owns that channel, <coughs> um, they're going to stop using it now and they're going to iterate and go off to something new. So to be able to detect on Sunburst once it was publicly announced does not do you any good. When you needed to detect Sunburst was like back in the summer <laughs> when it was first starting to get propagated out. That's when you needed a methodology to be able to detect that type of thing. So again, the pattern matching, not so much. And this is old school. This is really old school. You know, we've been doing this since the 80s. And in fact, when you look at what do we, uh, when you look at technologies that we can use to try and secure our environment, the only thing that predates pulling logs into a central location and doing some basic pattern matching, the only thing that exceeds that is login authentication, have a password. That's it. Firewalls, intrusion detection systems, all that stuff came later. This is old. And we haven't really innovated on it that much either. So, so what if it's old, right? I'm old, <laughs> just because it's old. Hopefully, just being old doesn't make it useless. Um, yeah, there's data out there to say this is not working. You know, so I, ke I kept mentioning Sunburst. So let's talk about that one a little bit deeper too, right? So Sunburst. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, some, some folks got the cough cough. Yep. Um, so Sunburst got into SolarWinds environment back in like February or March of last year. So in March, they basically got into that environment, changed the source code so that when SolarWinds, you know, built their binaries and digitally signed them, they digitally signed code that had malware inside of it already. So you could check that digital signature and it didn't matter because the code was already infected. So as of March, you know, the code was infected and by late March, early April, it started getting pushed out into customers. And by the time we got into like, you know, mid late summer, there was 10, 20,000 different environments that were now in a compromised state. We didn't find out about that until December. Well, let's see, there's a lot of months <laughs> between March and December, right? You know, this says six plus months is average. That was more than six months. So, okay, that falls into the average. And further, when we found out about it, who figured it out? It wasn't Solar Winds, right? They didn't figure out that they were pushing out malicious code to everybody. FireEye figured it out, a third party. That's our pattern with advanced persistent threat. Rans ransomware is a little different because ransomware comes in contacts as many of your systems as it can, locks up the drives, and then the you know attacker announces it. Um, advanced persistent threat's a little bit different because the value is there by having long-term access. So you know when someone comes in under advanced persistent threat, six months or more is average. And more than 50% of the time, you're gonna find out from an outside third party. You're not actually, you know, the environment that got compromised isn't gonna figure it out for themselves. Uh, Verizon does a yearly breach report. And um, I'm not thrilled with the last one. I think they tried to get too cutesy with it. And a lot of the data in it, just quite honestly, it, it looks good in graphs. It's just not that useful for figuring out what you need to do to better secure your environment. But prior to the one they came out with a couple of months ago, those things were awesome. Uh, they had really good data broken up into different types of verticals. But one of the things that really stuck out for me was that when you looked at how often are people catching attacks by going through their system logs, it was about 2% of the time. Well, think about that, 2% of the time. That means that if your environment gets owned by an outside attacker 50 times, you might catch one of those. That kind of gets to a point where like, why even bother, right? It's easy to see that and just kind of throw up his hands and say, why even bother? I'm only gonna catch one out of 50. Why even bother you know, building this infrastructure and putting in the time and everything else? Yeah, this stuff isn't working. I mentioned ransomware. One of the things um, I've seen is some of the folks that kind of talk about, you know, how bad, you know, when compromises take place, how long are the system zoned for? They're saying, hey, we're getting better, the numbers are going down. They are incorrectly mixing together ransomware and advanced persistent threat. Because what is ransomware, right? Ransomware comes in, infects as many of your systems as it can, and encrypts the drives, and then it tells you, hey, I'm here and I infected your network. Well, that's not a valid detection, right? 
<laughs> you know, that that that's kind of like, you know, somebody stole from you and then showed up at your house and returned with the goods they stole. And the cops saying, yay, we did a good job. No, you had nothing to do with it. This you know, ransomware to me is kind of the same thing. So you need to break out those numbers, you know, ransomware versus APT, advanced persistent threat. So is log review threat hunting? No, it's not. You know, 2% success rate. That's just horrible. You know, over 50% of the time it's getting caught by outside third parties. That's just horrible. So what we are doing today doesn't work. Now, I know, I know if you go back to your SIM vendor and say, hey, so I attended this talk over the weekend and they sent centralized logging doesn't work for finding the bad guys. I can tell you what your vendor is going to say. Your vendor is going to say, oh, well, here's how to solve that. Collect more logs. Now, why are they telling you that? Well, go back and look what you pay for, <laughs> right? Most logging vendors charge you based on the amount of data that you centralize collect into that logging system. So, of course, their answer is always going to be you need to collect more data because they make more money off of you when that happens. Um, this doesn't work. You know, again, if you look at the data, this just doesn't work. Well, we've got some other things we try to augment this with, like threat intel feeds, right? Hey, what if I you know, diligently go through threat intel feeds to figure out are any of my IPs talking to an IP address that's known to be malicious? Again, this was great 20 years ago. It is not great now because, again, money is involved. <laughs> that opens up new possibilities, like changing the backend infrastructure I use. So I might use a certain set of servers as command and control servers when I attack company A. I don't need to use, reuse those servers when I go after company B. I'm going to throw them away and use something else so that there's no way to detect where it is that I'm actually coming from. So again, this is another one where this was nice at one point, but not so much now. And also a lot of these lists from my personal experience are just polluted. It basically, they turn into a catch-all where anytime someone doesn't understand what's taking place, they assume it's an, an attack and they report it. And I think one of the best examples of that is BingBot. You know, Microsoft Bing is a search engine. It has bots. Bots go out and crawl the internet to see what content is out there so that they can return information as part of your searches. So, you know, so to report a Bing bot because it, you know, ran all the JavaScript on the page, come on, that's what it's supposed to do, right? <laughs> do some research. So these lists tend to be kind of polluted and they also tend to be kind of dated. If you tell me you have an IP address that was known to be performing attacks within the last 12 hours, that has value to me. As soon as that time value exceeds three days, five days, it has a whole lot less value to me. If it's a couple of months old, that's even worse. And you don't get that context when these alerts go off, right? So when you get a match against a threat intel feed, it's not like you're saying, hey, matching on an address that was added to the database four hours ago because you'd know, hey, that's something I could pay attention to. If you get any dates at all, it's when, when was this data extract, last extracted out of our data set? Well, that does me no good because that could have been added to that data set you know, an hour ago, a year ago. And there's a big difference in value between an hour ago and a year ago. Well, but we've got network-based stuff that we use to catch this stuff, Chris, like, right? Like network-based intrusion detection. What about that? Again, network-based intrusion detection is pattern matching, just like we were talking about in logs, except we're trying to do it in packets. So you're gonna run into the same types of problems. So for example, this is Sericata with the um, bleeding edge data set to find advanced persistent threats. And when I went through and ran, that, ran this data set through Sericata, Sericata grabbed a couple things. It figured out, hey, somebody plugged in a USB device to one of the Windows systems. And that was now calling back to Microsoft to get drivers. And hey, someone was going to a domain that has a top level domain extension to .cc. And you know, sometimes people do that to try and fool you into thinking it's a .com. So that might be something worth paying attention to. In other words, it caught a couple of things that are simple to pattern match on. But in this data set at that time, was the Empire Command and Control set or, or control channel, which runs over HTTP, and DNS CAT2, which leverages DNS to do command and control. And it didn't blip on either one of those. Not only are those old, there's GitHub repositories with the code in it. Anybody can download those tools and use them. And yet they still get missed in most intrusion detection systems. 
Um, I see a lot of folks go off and say, you know, oh, well, look for text queries, right? If you see a lot of text queries, you know, going out to a domain, that might be command and control. And that's true. That is a true statement. However, don't assume all command and control is going to use text queries. Personally, I've seen MX records, I've seen C names, I've seen quad A queries. Yes, queries for IPv6 addresses and the IPv6 address was the command and control channel. Um, I've also seen DKIM used. So there's a security protocol that's supposed to help DNS be more secure, but it can actually be leveraged as part of being a command and control channel. So again, it, it's more the behavior you need to look at versus a pattern you can just match on and call it a day. So what should threat hunting be? Threat hunting should be a proactive validation of all systems. What I mean by that is we sit down and we say, okay, I don't know for certain if any of my internal systems are compromised. So I'm going to scrutinize all of them equally and all of them as potentially being in a compromised state. Not just my desktops, not just my servers, but my network gear, my industrial internet of things devices, everything that's plugged into the network. I'm going to go through and I'm going to validate all of them. It needs to be everything. And what comes out of that is what's referred to as a compromise assessment. A compromise assessment is an assessment of, your, of you potentially currently being compromised. That's basically what it is. So think of this as, you know, you buy a car and you want to insure it and the inspection and the insurance company wants to know the car doesn't have any dents in it that you're going to just turn around and try and claim three months later, even though you bought the car like that. You know, they want to make that, that would be the equivalent of like a compromise assessment. So it's a validation of all the internal systems to make sure they're not exhibiting behavior that may indicate they're currently in a compromised state. That's what a threat hunt should be. Further, a threat hunt should tie together those groups of tools we have. One group of tools, which is designed to keep the bad people out, those are our protection tools, right? So this, the protection tools are the tools that keep them off of our network in the first place. And our response tools are the tools that we leverage once we know the bad people are in. The gaping hole <laughs> is how do we figure out when our protections have failed and we need to go into response mode? So, you know, again, we were talking about Sunburst. Right? So malicious code started coming into people's network in late March, early April. How do you, you know, how long did it take to figure out that malicious code was there? For most folks, it wasn't until December when FireEye came out and did their announcement. Very few were actually able to detect it before that. How could you have detected Sunburst before that? We'll actually talk about some techniques on that in a little bit. So when you kind of cut through, so like what is threat hunting, right? I see a lot of definitions out there. At the end of the day, what is threat hunting? Threat hunting is the ability to come up with one of two possible dispositions for every single device plugged into your network, every IoT device, every printer, every desktop, you name it. You know, BYOD devices, yep, those two. One of two dispositions. Either I'm pretty certain the system is still in a secure state, or I'm pretty certain the system's compromised and we need to go in incident response mode. It's got to be one of the two. Now, this slide says generate one of three possibilities, but that th third one to me isn't a final, you know, which is I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm seeing things that are suspicious, but I'm not seeing enough suspicious things to want to push that big red incident response mode button. Okay, that's fine. That That's agile. That's iteration. That is okay. I can't, I don't know for sure. What do I need to add to my threat hunt process to figure out whether I need to actually go in instant response mode or not? And that might actually rely on the system logs. In other words, you heard me beat up on system logs a lot. It's not that I think system logs are useless. I think threat hunting in them is not as productive as it could be, but I think they can be leveraged as part of that process. So for example, I might leverage my system logs to figure out what process has been making these connections? That might help me figure out, is it in a secure state still or not? In other words, let's say I see that suspicious traffic going out to Amazon. And then I go in and I look, and it was the Slack.exe binary running on that system. Oh, well, we're a Slack shop. I expect to see people using Slack. That's just Slack. That's OK. OK, cool. Now, what if it's some binary I don't expect to see and I don't recognize? Well. Okay, that's just made me even more suspicious that I might have a system in a compromised state. So again, those host logs can be useful, 
just not as part of the first pass. They need some context. And the best context you can give them is, am I seeing suspicious patterns on the network, yes or no? So start with the network. In other words, rather than starting with the host logs, start with the network and use that first. One of the things I like about the network is it's the great equalizer. By that I mean, remember I mentioned that to go through and try and pattern match on suspicious traffic with a web server, I need to do something different for Apache on Linux versus Apache on Windows. And oh, by the way, you know, Nginx or any other you know, web or web proxy running on Linux, those are going to be different too. So I end up having to write unique signatures per application, per platform. But on the network, that problem goes away because IP is IP. So if a Windows system is compromised, the network behavior you're going to see is going to be exactly the same thing as if it's a Mac. It's going to be exactly the same thing if it's a thermostat attached to the wall. Seriously. You know, if you look at a compromised, uh, if you look at a compromised thermostat, that command and control channel looks no different than what you might find on a Windows system. So what I mean by the great equalizer is we can go in, we can use one process, look for one set of criteria, and it's equally applicable regardless of the platform. And we don't even need to know if the platform is there. In other words, that internet you know, controllable thermostat, we might not even know we have one. But now that we started watching the network traffic, and now that we saw something that looks like a potential command and control traffic, a channel, and now we know what IP address and MAC address it's using, we can run it down and figure out, oh wait, that's the thermostat plugged into the wall, or that's the refrigerator. This is something I need to go in and pay attention to. So by starting on the network, it allows us to have one consistent process to use, regardless of platform, and then we can pivot into the platform itself as required. So here's a good example. Don't worry about this tool right now. What I want you to look at is this chart on the bottom. My x-axis is time. So each one of these bars represents a one-hour period of time. My y-axis is quantity. It's describing how many times each hour did this internal IP address connect to that external IP address. And there's some things that are suspicious here. The first is, notice the consistency hour by hour. Every hour, about 120 connections are being made from this system to that system. Well, that's about every 30 seconds right? That's persistency of connection. So when we thread hunt, the first thing we want to go looking for is some amount of connection persistency. My internal system is in constant communication with the host out on the internet. If that's taking place, I damn well better have a business reason behind that, right? I better be able to identify the business need for that. It's a Windows system calling back to Microsoft to patch. Okay, that makes total sense. It's a Linux box talking to ntp.org in order to sync time. Okay, there's a business need for that. I better be able to understand why this connection needs to be taking place, especially when there's persistency and it's happening all the time. <clears throat> this graph here is describing how many times am I seeing a specific time delta between these connections. For example, I said it's connecting about 120 times per hour. Well, do the math, and that works out to be about once every 30 seconds. But if you look at this graph, what this graph is telling me is I, this is um, the time delta between connections is my x-axis. My y-axis is quantity. So I actually saw this many about, uh, what's that, 600, something like that. I think it's about 600 uh, connections that took place at exactly at a 30-second interval. But notice it was more around 28, 29 seconds that these were taking place. But we saw some 27s and very few 31s as well. This is what's referred to as jitter. We'll talk about this more a little bit later. But when we talk about a system that connects out to a remote host, closes the connection, connects out to a remote host, closes the connection, and does it over and over again, that's what we're going to describe as being a potential beacon. Beacons can be very consistent, right? I mentioned at NTP, Network Time Protocol. That network time protocol acts like it is a beacon type of communication. It goes off every 15 minutes to 30 minutes, depending upon what operating system you're on, to go out and check the time. But whatever time interval it uses, <clears throat> it's very repetitive. So it goes off exactly every 20 minutes, every single time. It doesn't try to vary its timing. This is referred to as jitter, when anytime I start varying that delta time. 
And the only time it happens is when someone's trying to hide the fact that it's actually a beacon. So when you see something like this, that tells me, oh yeah, this is really suspicious. But I'm seeing my internal host talking to this host out on the internet. It's going to DigitalOcean. Um, I don't see a host name associated with where they were trying to connect to. So I can't use that to rely on. It's definitely a beacon, but you know, is this something I need to worry about? Well, if I have a way to go pivot into the host data on this system, so I can analyze what application was actually talking to that IP address during this time frame, that might help me figure out what was causing this. So for example, in this case here, these two tools will work together to allow me to jump into the tool that's collecting host logs to be able to see, yeah, that internal IP, when it was talking to that IP address onto the internet over that time frame that we were just looking at on the last slide as well, that was PowerShell making those connections. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's bad, right? <laughs> Who runs PowerShell? IT people, red teamers, not much else, right? In other words, if uh, you know, if Mary in marketing or you know Steve in sales is running PowerShell, you got a problem. Their systems are compromised. You know, this is something I need to go in and pay attention to. Now, you might say, well, but Chris, in my sim, I have an alert that goes off anytime somebody runs PowerShell, so I'll see this. Yeah, okay, two problems. First is you're going to get false positives because sometimes people run PowerShell legitimately. Number two, it's only going to work if they're running PowerShell. What if I came in and renamed PowerShell.exe to be something else? Now you're not going to see it, right? If you're trying to pattern match on PowerShell.exe and I rename it Bob.exe, well, now your pattern match will miss it because PowerShell looks different than Bob. So again, using the context of the network, that makes this a whole lot easier. Now let's use that example. So it was Bob that was running, Bob.exe. Well, now I come in here and I see Bob.exe was doing this connection. Well, now I could ask myself, okay, what is Bob.exe? I don't recognize that binary. I don't think that has a business context in my environment. So it might not set off as many alerts as PowerShell, but it's still gonna set some alerts off and have you run it to ground to make sure you know what's going on. So again, combining the network with the host log entries, that's one of the most powerful ways to be able to go through this. So let's talk about some techniques. So we're talking about look at stuff on the network. Where do we begin with that? The best place to monitor this traffic is what is leaving your environment and going out to the internet and then coming back in again. So typically like the internal interface of your firewall. This is referred to as north-south traffic sometimes. You'll hear people you know, throw out the term north-south traffic. They're talking about traffic going out to the internet. East-West is described as two internal systems talking to each other. So that's what that whole you know, compass thing, thing means. Monitor the internal interface of the firewall because that allows you to see what the true private address of the internal system is actually doing. Now, how much data should you go through and collect? You know, in other words, I don't wanna just like pattern match because we said pattern match is gonna miss things. So I need some context. You know, what made this so powerful was that I had 24 hours worth of data and I could look and see that over a 24 hour period of time, every hour I'm seeing the same number of connections. So if I try to analyze an, a, a point in time doing pattern matching, or if I try to analyze a small amount of time, like 10 minutes, I'm not gonna be able to pull in this type of context. So how much data do you need? Absolute bare minimum is an hour. And even that, an hour isn't gonna get you everything. You need. You're not gonna be able to see things like long connections. A minimum to me is probably tw is 12 hours, preferably 24. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, but wait a minute, Chris, I am a three-letter government agency that I can't tell you what it is. And you know, we have some real advanced nation state stuff, stuff coming after us. I'm worried that someone might compromise an internal system and only beacon out once per day. What do I do? Well, then maybe you need to be analyzing data in week in week-long chunks or month long chunks, as opposed to just 24 hour chunks. You know, you need to kind of make that judgment call for your own environment. <clears throat> I mentioned sunburst a couple of times. Sunburst to me is the minimum bar. If you can't detect sunburst like activity without a signature, you need to up your game. Because that is, you know, that was nation state going after commercial organizations. That's pretty common these days. If you can't detect that, you've got to up your game. 
Sunburst was going off every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, the compromised system would call home, plus or minus a minute and a half. So about four times an hour, it was generating a connection out to the command and control server. Okay, how, mu how much data do you need to say before you would recognize that as connection persistency? And to me, it's 12 hours if you're really good. 24 hours would be easier. So with 24 hours worth of data, it's connecting out about four times an hour. So do the math, that's gonna be just shy of about 100 connections a day. With 100 connections a day, you should be able to pull that out and see that connection persistence. You should be able to go in and tag something like that. So that to me is our minimum bar that we need to be going after. One of the things I like to do as part of this process is use a threat score system. Right? I, I like to go in and assign numeric weights to the different things I'm looking at. There's persistency of connection. Okay, maybe that's worth you know, 60, 70 points. Okay, there's persistency of connection that looks like a beacon, but they're trying to hide the fact that it's a beacon by jittering the timing. Okay, that adds in another 15, 20 points, right? Now I'm up to like 90, you know? Oh, and I'm also seeing the fact that the user agent string is unique within my environment. You know, we're running uh, Windows 10 with Chrome on everybody, and this is not using the same signature as that for the user agent string. Okay, that's going to add in like another five or 10 points. So you have ways to go in and modify the score of a system. You have major modifiers, like it's beaconing or it's holding the connection open all the time. You have minor modifiers, like, hey, the user agent string is unique, or the way it negotiates a TLS connection and what uh, options it wants to use for data privacy and authentication is different than what you see on other systems on your environment, you know, those are mod minor modifiers. Those will just tweak the points a little bit. But this is far as this is to kind of help you not get wrapped around the axle, as I like to call it. You know, wrapped around the axle is you look at it and you say, oh, that looks really suspicious, but oh, that looks normal, and that looks suspicious, and that looks normal, and that looks suspicious, and that looks normal. And you end up in this, you know, feedback loop where you can't figure out, should I just identify the system as potentially being safe, or do I need to go in into response mode? Having weight values assigned to different attributes helps you with that. Because now I can go in and I can say, okay, anything that scores over an 80 is something that I want to do an incident response on. And now there's persistency of connections, so there's 70 points, and it's beaconing, but it's jittering it by like 20%. Okay, that ends at another 20 points. Hey, I'm now up to 90 points, and that's enough of a threshold for me to say, we need to go in and take a deep dive on that system. Or, hey, I saw persistency of connection, and then I went in and I identified a binary creating that connection that isn't associated with any work application that we run internally. Okay, again, that will get me up to enough points that now I know that's something I need to go in and pay attention to. So like I said, you've got major modifiers, you've got minor modifiers. You know, the fact that a system negotiates the TLS session differently versus anything else might, you know, it might just be interesting, right? It, it, it could be a problem, but not necessarily. So for example, usually people use Chrome when they go to the internet, but sometimes there's gonna be another process that kicks off on your system that's gonna go check for patches and pull those down. That's going to, that may use a different set of libraries to decide how do I best authenticate and provide data privacy for this connection. So you may have you know, all of your systems, sometimes the, uh, the way they negotiate TLS will look different, and that's okay. But it's a matter of running it down to figure out if it's okay or not. So here's a rough overview of the order you want to do things from, from, in my opinion, when you're going in and doing a threat hunt. The first thing you want to go in and look for is persistency of connection. That's the first thing. If I'm not seeing persistency of connection, I'm not going to worry about it. So I see a system talk to a host out on the internet, um, you know, 30 or 50 times in a five minute period of time, and there's no other communication between those systems. That's not connection persistency. That's just a busy session. Put that system aside and don't worry about it. But I see a system that talked to a host out on the internet 50 times, and it's evenly spread out about every half hour. 
oh, that is connection persistency. That's something I want to go in and pay attention to. So the first thing I go looking for is that connection persistency. The next thing I'll go in and look for is abnormal protocol behavior. Things like where it looks like they're kind of bending the rules on how that protocol is working. So, you know, I have an excessive number of hosts that are being resolved within a remote domain or something like that. Once I do those checks, now I do what I do is I start running down my endpoints. So this says this order shows do a reputation check on the external IP investigation of the internal IP. Those two steps can get swapped in order depending upon what your environment looks like. If you have an environment where you don't collect much data, so here's a test, right? Uh, drop a note to the IT team and say, hey, I saw, I think this MAC address is acting suspiciously. Can you tell me what user's desktop that is? If they can respond to you in like 60 seconds, you know, or let's give them five minutes max and give you that answer and give you some good context about what system is out behind that MAC address, do your internal check first because you've got some good internal uh, uh, recording taking place of what systems are on the network and what they're doing. But if IT comes back and says, I'll try and get that for information for you by the end of the day, do the external check first. In other words, if I know a lot about my internal systems, I'm gonna wanna run with that. If I don't know a lot about my internal systems, it might actually be easier to learn about external systems versus the internal. Go ahead and do that first. What we're trying to do is eliminate yeah, you know, if you think about it, we need to analyze every pair of connections that take place. Every time an internal system talks to an IP address out on the internet, we need to analyze every single one of those uh, pairs to see, is there persistency here? Is there a potential for a command and control channel? That's a lot of data. The order I have described here allows you to eliminate as many systems from that as possible as quickly as possible. So like in the advanced uh, threat hunting class, the one that comes after this one, you know, one of the things we go through and do is we look at, okay, we've got, I think there's like 300,000 connection pairs in one particular log file that we go looking at, or one particular PCAP file we go into. So there's about, you know, 300,000 instances of this internal IP talk to a unique IP address out on the internet type of thing. So there's 300,000 sets of pairs that you need to go in and analyze. And by using this process, we quickly whittle it down to like five pairs that actually need us to go in and take a look at them to see, <clears throat> is this potentially hostile or not? So that's what this process is designed to do. It's designed to reduce the work as much as possible. Uh, also, one of the things that I like to do is uh, create a feedback loop where anytime I run down a pair and it turns out it's okay, oh, this is just Microsoft talking to the Windows notification service or something like that, add those in as exceptions so that when tomorrow when i go in and do my threat hunt anything i've previously solved like oh hey that's just windows notification service don't worry about that gets extracted out of the data what's nice about that is while my first threat hunt might take me two days to go through and do my second threat hunt is probably going to take me 20 hours my third threat hunt is probably only going to take me about four hours after that I might actually be able to automate things to a point where an overwhelming majority of the threat hunt is automated. It's taking me less than an hour every time I want to go through and do it. Uh, so again, it takes you about three or four iterations to be able to remove all of that noisy stuff. But once the noisy stuff is out of the way, everything after that is something worth paying attention to. Okay, so we're talking about going after command and control channels. Does this create blind spots? Is there things we won't be able to detect? And the answer is yeah. If someone drops malware on your system and it does not have a command and control channel, that's going to be a problem, right? That's going to be a situation where um, we're not going to see the thing we're trying to look for and there's actually malware on the internal environment. Now, this doesn't happen that often. You know, probably the most public one that we've seen was not pet yet. But this is a very specific type of attack that doesn't happen that often. This is the equivalent of like a cyber bomb going off because it's not I'm looking to extract information. It's not that I'm looking to control somebody else's resources. This is I want to blow up the network that it came to. And if this gets out and happens to go out to other networks and blow those, those up too, I'm okay with that. 
that's a very rare occurrence for this type of thing to take place. So it does have a blind spot, which is any malware that doesn't use C2. Those tend to be fairly simplistic. They're going to go in and they're going to try to accomplish one goal, like encrypt every hard drive that you can possibly break into. But since there's no command and control channel, this won't work. We need to fall back on the protections, you know, the tools that we talked about in order to try and detect this type of thing, knowing that sometimes those protection tools do fail. So technique versus methodology. In other words, we're going to go through some things here that if you may look at and say, hey, I've got a five gig connection to the Internet or I've got a 50 gig connection to the Internet. And Chris, what you're teaching us isn't going to scale for me. This won't work. That's fine. That is fine. There's two parts to this for me. One is kind of understanding what's going on behind the curtain. In other words, um, I don't want you to buy a black box that's voodoo and unfortunately that's what a lot of vendors try to sell they try to sell you a black box that they tell you hey this solves all your problems just plug it in and trust it and sometimes you find yeah it's not doing what it's supposed to um so you know go back in my career and you know checkpoint and gauntlet were like the two big firewalls on the market first and for the environments that like the government ones that I worked with that needed to really make sure they were secure, they I always made sure they went with Gauntlet. And it wasn't the fact that Checkpoint came out of Israel. It wasn't that. It was that I tested both of them. And what I found was that it was actually pretty damn trivial to pass traffic through a Checkpoint firewall and have it get to the other side and not have it get recorded that that actually took place. Um, it was actually pretty damn easy. All you had to do was use ICMP or DNS. If you did that, you could communicate with the other side and Checkpoint wouldn't log a damn thing about it. Um, they didn't advertise that, right? They advertised it as being bulletproof. And, you know, this will stop all malicious patterns and blah, 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 blah. It didn't work. You don't know till you test it. So, but in order to test it, you need to understand how is it supposed to work? That's the kind of techniques versus methodology that I'm talking about here. So I want to make sure you understand how should these things work behind the curtain? How should this, you know, in other words, like, um, you know, we talked about sunburst being the, the minimum bar to kind of deal with. Okay, how do I test my network with that? How do I go in and create a sunburst-like connection to see, can my blue team detect that? Do they freak out? <laughs> Does my blue team detect that it looks like something has a sunbursty like, uh, you know, command and control channel on it? Or do they completely miss it? If they miss it, yeah, that's a problem. So I know some of this stuff doesn't scale. That's okay. We'll worry about scale later. Today, what it's about worried about is understanding the techniques, understanding the methodology. And for that, we'll be doing a lot of hands-on stuff that, you know, manual process doesn't scale, but that's okay because at least then you understand what the automated tools are supposed to be doing. And bad guys versus red teams. My personal experience has been it is much harder to catch a red teamer than it is to catch an actual bad guy because their business models are different. What's the business model of the bad guy? The business model of bad guy is they have to assess your environment. They have to find out what security software they're using and in order to figure out a way around that, they have to come up with a phishing campaign that, you know, or some method of getting an initial beachhead that your environment is actually going to fall for. They need to execute on that. They need to drop some malware on your system that'll get around whatever endpoint software that you're using and then probably pull down additional code. They need to then go in and do privilege escalation. They then need to go in and do some lateral movement. Uh, there's a lot. And then after all that, set up the command and control chain, right? So as an attacker, with that business model, you're going to focus in on where is my biggest problem area, right? It isn't just going to be, oh, hey, let me spend a lot of time on the nice to haves. This is a business model. You're going to focus on your problem areas. And the problem areas tend to be what endpoint software are you running? How do I get around that? How do I get your end users to fall for the attack? If I can make all that happen, the C2 is no big deal. Remember what the industry stats are six months or more and it'll be an outside third party that detects it. So think about your business writing software, you know, 
with those, you know, here's an immediate problem that will put us out of business today. We can't break into the environment. We can't get somebody to fall for phishing. I'm going to ignore those problems and focus my engineering team on the command and control channel that already isn't getting detected. No, you'd never do that, right? Well, the bad guys are no different. Now, when you get to red teamers, it's a totally different story. Because for a red teamer, it's they're usually getting paid to see if they can get a command and control channel set up. So if I can get it to beacon home once per day, hey, I win, <laughs> right? Because it doesn't have to be a functional command and control channel. Think about that. If something is calling out once per day, that means you can run one command per day. All right, how long is it going to take me to do privilege escalation, lateral movement, exfiltration of data if I can only run one command a day? It's going to take me forever, right? It's going to take me more than that six months it usually takes to detect that the attack took place. So bad guys don't do that. But for a red teamer, that command and control channel doesn't need to be functional. So they can get away with doing that and still get paid. So it's actually, like I said, it's harder finding good, really good red teamers than it is finding the actual bad guys themselves. So like um, one of the things we always use as a bar is the Black Hills folks because they get real creative with their command and control channels. If we can catch them, we know we're in good shape for catching bad guys because they get extremely creative and they can be really patient in what they do. But for the purposes of setting up your process, focus on being able to catch the bad guys. Right? So I said, you know, a red teamer could have a beacon home once per day. All right, fine. But, you know, again, sunburst, that's our minimum bar. You know, that was beaconing almost 100 times a day. If I can at least catch the 100 times a day, I'm in really good shape. So let's um, talk about what does persistency of connection look like. One possibility is a long connection. This is really simple. The compromised system calls out to a command and control server, and it just leaves that connection open all the time. If something happens on the network, like a router dies or some, the internet goes down or something like that, it'll kill the connection and then just immediately reestablish it again. So it just holds that connection open all the time. And one of the benefits to this for most attackers is where you, when you look at how do firewalls how do firewalls log things? Usually, the only thing they log is the initial you know, handshake of the initial connection establishment. So let's say I'm calling out to a command and control server on TCP 443. So that's the well-known port for HTTPS. And I call out, I make that connection, I just hold it open all the time. Well, there's only one entry in the firewall log for that, and that's it, right? Now, if I went and looked at the firewall state table, I would see that connection is still there days and days later. But I'm probably not gonna spend a whole lot of time digging through state tables. You know, be honest with yourself. When's the last time you looked at the state table for your firewall? Probably never, right? You look at the log entries. Well, this long connection would only get logged once. So it's a great way for them to go in and hide. Now, there's two ways to do this. One is, like I said, hold it open all the time. The other is to kill it on a regular uh, interval. Some folks know to go in and look for long connections. So they'll go in and they'll say, hey, anything that's been uh, running for like five and a half hours or more, that's something I want to pay attention to. And I use five and a half hours because that'll help me catch stuff that does business hours. Some malware might only trigger at 9 a.m. in the morning and then shut off at like 5 p.m. at night. You'll be able to catch that if you're looking at like five, five and a half hours or more. You know, basically 20,000 seconds or more of that is worth going in and paying attention to. So folks know to go looking for that. Well, the other possibility is to just set up the connection, run it for a long period of time, but shut it off at regular intervals that'll fall well below that five hour, um, that five hour mark that I talked about. So Metasploit is a great example of this. So Metasploit will call out, it will hold the connection open for 30 minutes, it will kill it, and then it'll immediately reestablish the connection again. And the nice thing about that is you never get a connection that runs more than 30 minutes. So if you check in for five hours or more, you'll never see it. And it's only going to be, you know, about 48 connections in a day. So if I'm in looking for beacons, typically I'm looking for thousands of connections taking place in a day. Well, that's only 48. That'll fall under that threshold as well. So one of the other things we want to look at is cumulative communication time. So if I can take all of these short, shorter sessions and add up the time that these two systems were in contact with each other and come up with something that, you know, hey, you know, once I add it up, it's still 24 hours worth of communications over a 24-hour period of time. 
that makes it interesting to me as well. And with that said, we are at the top of the hour. So uh, let's take a break. So we're going to go through and we're going to break until 10 minutes after the top of the hour. I will come back and chat with folks then.
And we are back. So I always get asked, um, hey, so how do I simulate beacons? Right? How, how can I go through and simulate something that, um, you know, I keep mentioning Sunburst, how can you go through and simulate something that looks like Sunburst? I gave a link to it, uh, and I already scrolled by, so I'm just gonna toss it into the uh, Discord channel again. But it's also, uh, I put a, a link to this in the uh, content channel as well, which is the one channel down below the chat channel that we're currently chatting away in. Uh, this is the Beacon Simulator uh, script was created by our illustrious Bill Stearns. Uh, this will support TCP and UDP, and it allows you to go in and set timing. So you can go in and you can say, I want to connect to this host out on the internet, and I want to do it you know, every 15 minutes, plus or minus you know, 90 seconds. Actually, everything is in seconds, so you need to put it in a second format. But you can go in and you can say, uh, do a UDP connection, do a TCP connection, whatever it is you want to go through and emulate. So the concept might be, let's say, you want to test the threat hunting capability of your internal environment. So go in and run Beacon Simulator, point it at some host out on the internet that is not work related, and you know have it connect out every 15 minutes, plus or minus 90, 90 seconds. And I'll sit back and say, okay, does the SOC detect that? You know, Do they raise a red flag and say, hey, we've got something here that looks like a command and control channel we need to go and pay attention to. If they're not catching that, you need to work on your defenses. So there's a real easy way to go through and kind of test that type of thing. And I'll talk more about beacons in a little bit, but for now we were talking about long connections. And long connections are pretty easy to emulate. Uh, although I saw somebody uh, post the comment, long connections, yeah, like this webcast. Yeah, okay. You know, webcast could definitely be one of them. Um, by the way, uh, team, if someone could sh just uh, toss into the Discord channel uh, that we're back, and if folks can hear audio, they should reset their web interface. Uh, please you know, let folks know. I've noticed that uh, for the folks that run the actual GoToMeeting software, uh, connection tends to be pretty stable. When you're on the web interface, sometimes when we don't broadcast for like 10 minutes because we're taking a break, uh, it doesn't always come back for some folks. So if somebody could post that in, that would be awesome. Thank you, Bill. All right, so let's get back into it. So we talked about connection duration. How are you gonna figure that out? Uh, one of the best tools for that is, this is like definitely one of my favorite tools, is Zeek. Zeek is a network recorder. So if you know what a PCAP is, right? You know, you, if you understand what a P packet capture is, Zeek is kind of like a stripped down packet capture that just has the stuff you're typically most interested in. So things like how long did the connection take place for? Who was talking to who? What ports were being used? What application was being run across those ports? Uh, Zeek is awesome for that type of thing. So we'll be using Zeek in a couple of labs today. But one of the things that Zeek records is the duration of each of these connections. So I can go in and I can look at the duration time to say, okay, was the duration more than 20,000 seconds? If it was, that's something that may be worth going in and paying attention to. Yeah, now there's two options here that I'm showing, right? So here, I'm just going in and I'm just like listing out the raw output. And there's two formats you can run uh, Zeek in. One is um, kind of a CSV format, which is what you're looking at here. And then the other is JSON format. JSON format is easier for other systems to process. It's a whole lot harder to go in and kind of parse as a human being. So I tend to kind of fall back on the CSV one just because I, as a human, tend to spend a lot of time looking at my Zeek logs um, and always refer, end up referring back into them again. When you look at it though, you know, this is kind of messy, right? Everything's kind of run together and it's kind of hard to read. One of the things you can do is you can easily clean that up, output up. So here I've gone in and I said, I want a cat con.log. Con.log is the, Zeek will record a number of different log files. And we'll talk about those formats in a little bit. But the main one is con.log. That has an entry for each connection in there. By the way, why would I want to use Zeek instead of uh, like raw PCAPs? The answer is storage and retention. Compressed Zeek logs take up about 1 20th the space of a PCAP. So if I have enough disk storage to store, let's say, five days worth of information, and then I got to purge my PCAPs to free up disk space. Well, I could be storing 100 days of Zeek data in that same amount of space. 
which means that if I find something and I need to try to run back, hey, has this actually been here for a month or two months, which happens more often than you would think, you still got the data for that. Um, so Zeek's really cool for that. Um, but again, con.log is the main log that shows all those connections taking place. Notice I'm running it through columns T, which will help the columns line up. And then I'm saying less space S, dash capital S, which will allow me to now use the arrow keys to kind of navigate through all of this. So in other words, here you can see it was line wrapping. So we got, <clears throat> here's the destination port, protocol, and notice service wraps to the next line. And then we get duration, blah, 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 blah. And then we have uh, local response, and then it line wrapped to get to missing bytes, historical of uh, history, original bytes, et cetera. <clears throat> this way, everything just lines up nicely. I could use the arrow keys to see what's off to the right, but everything's still nicely lined up, which is kind of cool. So just a little trick you can try. And in fact, um, if you've got your VM up and running, CD into like the lab one directory, and you can try this command cat space con dot log and then pipe it through column dash lowercase t and then pipe it through less space dash capital s and you'll notice you'll it'll load up a screen similar to what you see here and now you can use the arrow keys to move to the right or use the right arrow key to move to the right left arrow key to move to the left up and down arrow keys work page up and page down work as well it makes it a whole lot easier to view data that's kind of CSV format, but doesn't actually fit within the width of the screen itself. The other thing I can do with Zeek is I can look at cumulative talk time. Now, Zeek doesn't give me this per se, but it's real easy to go in and calculate this. I've got a couple things going on here. Let me talk you through them. So I'm catting con.log. And oh, by the way, if, if you're kind of new to Linux command line and some of this stuff doesn't make sense to you, one of the things you can try is to kind of break things out. Let's, keep, let's use a simple example first. So for example, type in cat space con.log and just hit enter. And you'll notice that all this data just flies by on the screen and it's hard to read. Okay, now pipe that through columns dash T and hit enter again. What does that do for you? Well, now it lines things up, but it still scrolls by and it's hard to read everything. Okay, now pipe it through less space dash S as well. And you'll see you get nice formatted uh, data. So anytime you see a command that's fairly long like this, and you're wondering like, what's this doing? What's taking place? Anytime you see it getting piped into a new command, try the command before it, and then try you know, the two commands combined together, then try the three commands combined together, and it'll allow you to step through what the data looks like each time. And you'll see that it becomes easier and easier to process as you go through. Uh, but if you're not familiar with any of these commands, it's a great way to kind of come up to speed. Uh, does Zeek analyze PCAP files and generate the con.log? Yes, it does, Muffinhead. Uh, there's two ways to run Zeek. One is have it listen on an interface to be able to monitor all the traffic that that interface can see. So I may install Zeek on a system that is attached to like a mirror port or a span port that's monitoring all the traffic going in and out of my firewall's internal interface. That's one way to use it. The other is if I have PCAP files, I can say Zeek space dash lowercase r space, the name of that PCAP file, and it will go in and generate these log files for me. The only difference between running it on an interface and running it off of PCAPs is when it's running on the interface, Zeek will also create a con dash summary file that gives me summary information about the connections that took place. It does not do that when you process a PCAP file. But beyond that, you know, it's the same old, same old. In fact, uh, things like timing, right? Um, Zeek has a timeout that it uses so that if a connection stops communicating for a five minute period of time, it'll assume any new traffic it sees is part of a new session. Well, it does that regardless of whether you're listening on an interface processing a PCAP file. So even though you can see all that data in the PCAP file, it'll still, once five minutes goes by, and the uh, timestamp on the packets, it handles it the same way it would as if it was listening on the network. So it's very consistent that way. But again, let's talk about this command. So I'm catting con.log, so that'll just take the contents of con.log and spew it out on the screen. And then I'm using this tool called Zcut. Zcut allows me to go in and say, instead of showing me every single column, like we had here, 
there's only certain columns I actually want to go in and analyze. And in this case here, I'm saying I want to analyze, this is the, the nomenclature for source IP address, destination IP address, and the duration of the connection between those two systems. So I'm saying just extract those three pieces of information only. Then I'm running it through sort. So what sort's gonna do is it's gonna say, hey, when the uh, source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, get that data together one line after the other. So it allows me to organize all of my connections between two different systems so that they're grouped together within the output. Then I'm running this weird looking command here. What's this? Grep is a pattern matching tool for text files. So it allows me, I can go in and I can use, the common use case for it is to say grep space, some character sequence I wanna say within a log file. And that log file might be, let's say my firewall logs. So if I wanna see all of my, you know, permit, you know, my, my allowed traffic, if the firewall logs it by saying allow, I could say grep space allow space firewall.log and now I'll just see those entries and all the denies will get removed. So grep allows me to go in and look for a specific pattern. I can also do the opposite of that. I can say, show me everything but this pattern. And the way to do that is the dash V. So dash V means everything but this pattern I've specified. See this dash E caret dollar sign? What that's looking for is blank lines. I'm gonna run it through this tool here, Data Mash, and I'll talk about this briefly in just a second, but Data Mash is a numeric processing tool. So it allows me to add up numbers, it allows me to find minimum values out of a range, maximums, means, all of that fun stuff. But it wants to work with numbers. If I have a blank line, Data Mash doesn't know how to process that because it's a blank line, there's no number there. So I need to remove any blank lines from my output before I run it through Data Mash. So that's what Grep is doing here. Grep is saying, hey, Grab everything that isn't a blank line and now pass it to the next command. And my next command is grep dash v dash. When Zeke sees a connection that gets rejected or you know that the port's not open or something like that, if there's no real connection that takes place, Zeke will log that as a dash. So now you know it's not so much a zero duration as it was, yeah, that connection just couldn't happen. Well, a dash is not a numeric value. Data mash is gonna to wanna to work with numeric values. So I'm saying grab everything but lines that have a dash in them. And it'll never have a dash for the IP address. The dash would only be for the duration. So anything where the connection had no duration, we're just pulling that data out. And that isn't gonna skew anything because we're looking for at cumulative talk time, which means we wanna add all of the duration times together between two different IP addresses. If the duration is zero, obviously there's nothing to add in there, right? Anything plus zero is still that anything. So we're getting rid of all the dashes and then we're dumping it through data mash. So data mash is an awesome data processing tool. It allows me to take things like this type of output and process certain numeric values. So here what I'm saying is data mash, when column one and column two match, in other words, the source and the destination IP address are exactly the same. Remember we ran this through sort, so all of those would be one right after the other. So now we're telling Data Mash, look to see when column one and column two have the same values in them. So now the source and the destination will be the same. I want you to sum or add up the values shown in column three. So now every time that source IP address talked to that destination IP address, we're now gonna add up all the duration fields between them. Sort-K says, I wanna sort the data again. But dash K3 means don't start sorting at the beginning like you normally do by default. I wanna sort on K3, the third column, one, two, three. In other words, we wanna sort on duration. Dash RN, dash R says do a reverse sort, so larger numbers before smaller numbers. And dash N says handle it as a numeric value, not as alpha numeric. So that makes sure that all of our data, you know, that the bigger numbers actually always show up a little for the lower numbers. And then I'm piping it through this, through this command head, which says, hey, I want you to go through and I want you to show me the first 10 lines of output only. Head, you can say dash and then a number, and it will show that number of lines of output. So if I said head dash five, it only see the first five lines. If I said head dash 20, it would print out the first 20 lines. If I don't use a dash number, it defaults to 10. 
but um, yeah, so that's how to go in and do cumulative communication time if you're in using Z. Well, can I get long connection information out of firewalls? And the answer is no, <laughs> you can't. Um, when you look at a state table entry in a firewall, typically the time that gets recorded for an entry is not how long that connection's been running for, it's the amount of time that's gone by since the last time any traffic was seen on that session. Firewalls aren't trying to keep track of how long the connections took place for. Firewalls are simply trying to keep track of, should I keep this entry in my state table, yes or no? And they use timeout values to decide whether they should purge an entry or not. So a firewall might say, hey, if there's no traffic between these two systems for an hour, I'm gonna purge that state table entry. So what you're seeing is how long since the last packet, not since the session began, there are very few exceptions to that, you know, that we're that I'm showing you here. So we need to get it someplace else. One of the best tools for doing it that I've found is Z. Um, you can do it with things like Wireshark and T-Shark, but they get it wrong. They pattern match on when was this IP address and port combination first seen and last seen, and those could actually be two separate sessions, and they're not smart enough to know the difference between the two. So what I found is that by looking at uh, comparing T-Shark's duration to like uh, Zeke's duration, Zeke is always more accurate than what you'll get out of T-Shark. T-Shark might make the durations look longer than they actually are. So those are my long connections. Now, what about a beacon? Well, a beacon is just simply a repetitive communication between two endpoints. This says between your repetitive connection establishment between two IP addresses. That is a classic beacon but it could also be a repetitive connection between an internal IP and a fully qualified domain name that might actually be not one, but multiple IP addresses. You gotta be able to pull those together and be able to look at those as well. Um, so again, it's that repetitive connection is, is kind of that signature of it being vegan. So how does command and control work, right? This also this is also true for long connections, by the way. Uh, the, the architecture is applicable to long connections. It's just the, the uh, signaling is different. So I have an internal compromise system. It's sitting behind the firewall. My attacker can't talk to it directly because the firewall isn't letting in a connection establishment, and this is on a private address that, it can't, that they can't route to anyway. So what they do is when they compromise the system, they include some software that says, hey, on some regular basis, connect out to this command and control server. And if there's anything I want you to do, that command and control server will have those commands sitting in its queue. So this system just calls out on a regular basis and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And most of the time it's gonna hear back, nope, go back to sleep. And then it'll pause for whatever period of time it was told to pause for. And then it will connect back in again and say, hey, do you have anything for me to do now? This is a long connection. It's just going to do that once. It's going to connect up and say, hey, I'm here. Any commands show up in the queue, send them to me right away. That's the only difference you'd see in the architecture setup. So with the long connection, it'll connect once, hold it open all the time. With a beacon, this is going to go off at some sort of regular interval. So again, if I'm the attacker and I have a command I want to run, let's say I want to see what processes are running in memory, I will submit that command right? Hey, show me running processes, whatever that happens to be for the particular operating system that I've compromised. Whatever the command I would type at the command line to see that information, I just simply queue that up on the command and control server. And now the next time this thing checks in and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? It's told, yeah, I want you to run this command to list all the running processes. And now that data result will get exfiltrated out as part of that same command and control session. Now that it's up on the command and control server, gets handed back to the attacker. So this acts almost like a proxy or an intermediary, if you will. Now, that shows the internal system directly communicating with the command and control server, but it doesn't have to work that way. I can leverage DNS servers for this too. For example, I can go in and yeah, tell the compromised system, hey, I want you to do unique queries within this domain. So what this compromise system will do is say, okay, I want, I need to look up this fully qualified domain name. Hands that off to the local resolver. Local resolver says, okay, I don't have this entry in cache. So let me go out to the root name servers to figure out what to do with this. 
And the root name servers would say, oh, hey, that's a .com. That uses these servers over here. Go talk to them. And then I'll go to the .com servers, and they'll say, oh, hey, evil.com. Here's the authoritative server for evil.com. Go ask it. And now this will go in and forward this DNS query to that external DNS server. This external DNS server is actually a command and control server. So when queries come in to resolve things, those are actually a compromise system asking, hey, do you have anything for me to do? And the answer that comes back is going to tell them what to do. Now, I can't use the same query each time because this might cache information. So one of the side effects you get of DNS being used as a command and control channel is a large number of unique queries that are part of that remote domain. And we'll talk about how to kind of pull that apart just a little bit. But if you're looking for internal systems connecting out to go looking for beacon traffic, you can't just do that. You got to look at the DNS server. The other thing that's nice about this from an attacker's perspective is DNS servers do tons of connections out to the internet all the time. So seeing that this system is sending out a thousand, you know, thousands of connections, it's not going to even blip your radar. What you need to look for is it's thousands of connections going to one specific command and control server, one set of command and control servers. Notice this is still going to look like a beacon. So if I'm monitoring the internal interface of my firewall, I can see this as too many queries that are part of a remote domain I don't recognize. I can also pick up on this as being a beacon. But you also need to be able to do this to a fully qualified domain name. Let's say the attacker takes their command and control server and puts it behind a, a, a content delivery network, like Amazon or you know whoever. <clears throat> well, now when they go to resolve that command and control server, that might resolve to any of the <clears throat> CDN servers that are part of that network. So my beacon signal is no longer going to one IP address only my beacon signal is actually going to multiple IPs. Further, these CDN servers might be hosting data for legitimate domains as well, which means it's not only, my, you know, it's not only the fact that the, my beacon traffic is broken up over multiple IPs, it's also the fact that legitimate traffic is gonna get mixed in with that as well, and I need a way to separate out the beacon traffic, or the, the, the legitimate traffic as well. So the way to do that is to not only look for beacons that are going from one internal IP to one external IP, you also need to look for beacons that are going from an internal IP to a fully qualified domain name, which means you need to be able to see the DNS queries and you need to be able to match those up, which is another thing Zeek is really good at. The Zeek will look at queries that go out and the answers that come back and give you that mapping of, oh, hey, this fully qualified domain name mapped to these different IP addresses. Now you can go look at, okay, when were they talking to those IP addresses right after that query? Now I can go in and distinguish, uh, you know, potentially malicious beacon traffic versus normal traffic that's taking place on the network. So there's a couple of ways I can go in and I can analyze for beacons. One's based on timing. So I can go in and look for that repetitive time interval. Again, I made the comment that if I see 50 connections between two IP addresses, that take place in a five minute period of time and then I see nothing else for the rest of the day, that's not persistency. That's just a busy session. But if I see 50 connections take place and they're all spread out about 30 minutes apart from each other or a little bit less, you know, maybe about 27 minutes apart from each other each time, that is a beacon. That's something I need to go in and pay attention to. So that's going in and detecting beacons based on timing. Now, one of the things attackers will do is they'll introduce what's referred to as jitter. I talked about that earlier. And jitter is just, hey, instead of going off exactly at a specific time interval every time, vary the timing up a little bit. So we talked about uh, sunburst was going off every 15 minutes, plus or minus 90 seconds, which meant when you measured the deltas between connections, they could be as short as 13 minutes and 30 seconds, or as long as 16 minutes and, and 30 seconds. Why do they do that? Why do they jitter things? They jitter things because most tools rely on what's referred to as k-means clustering to detect beacon activity. So k-means, if you go in and do, do a Google search on that, you'll find a nice wiki that describes the algorithm. But basically what k-means is for is it finds repetitive patterns in large data sets. 
So let's say you had a million connections go out to the internet yesterday, but buried in that data is one of your internal IP address talking to a host out on the internet once per minute, and it does it once per minute all day long. Well, that's a repetitive pattern. K-means will detect that. However, what if the attacker says, okay, I want a beacon once per minute, but I want to jitter that plus or minus 50%. Well, now the delta could be as short as 30 seconds. It could be as long as 90 seconds. K-means looks at that and says, oh, that's not a repetitive pattern and doesn't actually indicate that as being a beacon anymore. So tools that are designed behind, uh, with K-means for doing beacon detection fall flat on their face as soon as jitter is involved. And the way the vendors typically get around that is they just write a signature. Well, wait a minute. We already said signatures don't work because they change shit up all the time, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's not the way you want to go. So one of my first questions <laughs> for uh, someone who's going to, you know, create a threat hunting tool that is designed to identify command and control channels that I'm considering purchasing, my first question is, what algorithms are you using to go in and detect beacons? And if I hear K-means, yeah, no, we're done with this conversation. Because K-means was helpful 10 years ago. K-means is not helpful now. I don't think I've seen a beacon signal that doesn't jitter that was an actual attack, not a red teamer or just somebody messing around, but was an actual attack in at least two or three years, maybe longer. So where is that AI voodoo the marketing is talking about all day long about detecting G jitter beacons? Oh, okay. So let's go down the AI road a little bit. So what is AI, right? AI is <laughs> basically an intelligence that's along the lines of about a hummingbee or a puppy that you're feeding it data and you're hoping it's going to learn the things that you want it to learn. I mean, to me, this is kind of like raising kids, right? It's, um, I always thought it was, um, so there's a, there's a movie that comes up every year at Christmas time called Christmas Story. And it's about little Ralphie who wants the BB gun for Christmas. Yeah, I think most people have probably seen that movie. And one of the things in the movie is, you know, Ralphie is out helping his dad change the tire and he uses a swear word. And then it turns into, oh my God, where did you learn that swear word from? Well, through the whole beginning of the movie up until that, his dad is, you know, swearing like a drunken sailor all the time. In other words, he taught him things he didn't expect him to learn. That's one of the problems we run into with AI, is that we're, we're taking a problem that we're saying, this is too hard for my complex human brain to go through and, um, and solve. So let me throw some software at it and hope for the best. In other words, I can't solve this problem. So let me hand it to my two-year-old and let them try and solve the problem for me. That's effectively what we're doing with AI. Um, one of the best ones, best examples of this I've seen was the old Microsoft chatbot. Uh, folks may have been on Twitter for that, where you know Microsoft set up this chatbot that you could talk to, because hey, you know verbal communications. We've been doing that for like twenty thousand years now, so we've got to have that pretty well vetted, right? And it and the chatbot basically turned into a racist a-hole within a day. Uh, some of the things that it said, I will not repeat on this webcast. They were really bad. This is using language, something we're good at, something we know, something we understand, something we have 20,000 years of history with. And the real kicker for me was they took it offline for about three months, changed the code, brought it back online again, and then it only took four hours before it turned into a racist a-hole. Now, the reason we knew it was a racist a-hole was because it communicated and it sent out information that we could see and we could say that is not appropriate things for a chatbot to be saying, I know this is broken. Now, apply that to the security context. You're gonna trust AI, a you know two-year-old hummingbee type of thing, to go in and find things that you can't figure out how to find on your own and hope for the best. And when it misses stuff, there's no alert. If it misses things, it isn't like it, you know, again, with the chatbot, it would say racist things. We knew something went wrong with the software. With security software, it just missed it, which means you didn't see it, which means there's no indication that things went wrong. So I am not a big AI fan when it comes to this. And I really think for a lot of folks, it's a cop out. I really feel like folks look at this problem and they say, wow, this is really hard. Oh, they're using AI, software will deal with it and I won't have to? Great, let me just throw some AI at it and call it a day. 
and it's a cop out. If you can't understand this and you can't get the process down, what are the possibilities of writing software to be able to do it? It's like, so think of it this way. Could you program your car to drive to the grocery store and back by simply programming what it should do on each road and when and where? Of course not. It's too many variables, right? That's the same problem we have with security. You know, unless it's got some way to adapt as it goes along, you're hosed. And even then things go wrong. You know, there was the Tesla crash problem they ran into where Teslas were T-boning cars. And it turned out they taught it what a car looks like, but they taught it what the front of a car looks like and what the back of a car looks like. They didn't expect for the side of the car to be there. But the reason we found it was because, you know, Teslas that were in auto mode that the driver was not paying as much attention as they should were T-boning vehicles because to the, to the software, it didn't look like a car. Yeah. So when that comes to security, yeah, I'm just, I'm not a big fan because I don't feel like we're good enough at this yet to be able to hand it off to software, understanding what all the possibilities that might come up in that data set. All right, so that's my AI room. We got that out of the way, yay. <laughs> so um, talking about timing, right? So I talked about jitter. I talked about, you know, they can go in and they can vary the timing. Well, one of the interesting things with that is that if you start creating larger data sets, you can actually normalize out all that jitter. So my example was beacon once per minute, plus or minus 50%. Well, 50% is a lot of variance, right? So it could be as short as 30 seconds, could be as long as 90 seconds. Well, it's still gonna be about 60 beacons an hour. It's still gonna be about 120 beacons every two hours. So if I take my connection data and I collect it together in two hour chunks and then analyze that, that's actually going to normalize out the jitter, right? Because for every time I pick a 30 second interval, I'm probably going to pick a 90 second interval and for everything in between. So that's going to normalize things out to make it easier to say. So one of the night, again, one of the nice things about having a larger data set, like, you know, 24 hours versus 15, 20 minutes is not that I just get more data points to work with, but I can do more with it, like combine the data sets together to be able to normalize out jitter. So one of the ways we can also, so here we're looking at the data over time. We're looking at it over a 24 hour period of time. You know, I, you know, I described this chart a little bit earlier. Each bar is an hour. My Y axis is quantity. How many connections are taking place every, every hour? The other way I can go in and look at that is I can just simply analyze the deltas. So I can go in and say, how often did I see a specific time delta? So this is saying, you know, I saw the one second time delta, you know, 68,000 times. All right, well, now I got to look at how many connections took place total. And if it's 68,000, okay, this is a very consistent beacon going off exactly once per second. Um, but there might be some variance in the timing. We looked at that earlier. I showed you that graph where I said, yeah, okay, if we ballpark this, it looks like it's taking place every 30 seconds. But the reality is it was actually, you know, varying the timing. You know, we looked at this one earlier. This is a classic signature of cobalt strike. That jitter that I described, you know, beacon once per minute plus or minus a percentage, that's cobalt strike. It's its beastly function. So with cobalt strike beastleep, I can go in and I can introduce jitter as a percentage and it will vary that percentage. <laughs> anytime I see this, you know, anytime I see a bell curve, I know, yeah, okay, this is somebody running cobalt strike. What's fun is when you get stuff like this. So here's a five second interval, here's a 46 second interval. Notice there's no bell curve here. Somebody put a lot of thought and effort into varying this timing and trying to make it look as random as they possibly could. There are some time intervals in the middle that are missing. There's some group clusters. Um, there's very little consistency here, but I can still tell it's a beacon. So one of the so like I said, one of the ways to look for beacons is based on size. The other way to do it is based, excuse me, based on timing. The other way to do it is to be do it based on size. So with size, I'm just going in and I'm looking for how often when this one when the source IP talks to the destination IP address, am I seeing the same amount of data getting transferred each time? And um, there's definitely false positives for this, like like in, like network time protocol. You know, with net time pro protocol. I'm asking the same question every time. What time is it? I'm getting back the same answer each time. You know, here is the time in this you know, length of a string. 
So that's going to be consistency in size. Um, when we're talking about beacons, that is um, the most consistent signal we're going to be, especially when we have a short time interval between communications, a short time delta, is that calling home to say, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. If I have a beacon that's calling home once per second, the attacker isn't queuing up commands once per second. So a majority of the time when the compromised system checks in and says, do you have anything for me to do? The answer is going to be no, go back to sleep. That's what we refer to as the heartbeat. What's kind of interesting about this is what will cause that uh, session size to change is when the answer changes. In other words, when it calls in and says, do you have anything for me to do? And the answer is yes, that yes answer is going to do, uh, generate a different data size, typically larger, because the um, it's going to be whatever the command was the attacker wanted to run, as well as the data that get exfiltrated out. Well, this is kind of cool because this can give me, um, most command and control channels are encrypted, meaning that if I have full PCAPs and I try to pull it apart, I'm still not gonna be able to figure out what's going on. But if I use size, I can actually get a pretty good estimate of that. So if I look at this data here, here's my heartbeat. My heartbeat's sitting around, we'll call that 90 seconds just to pick a round number. And notice I've got three different data points here. What I know is over whatever time period this data was captured, let's call it 24 hours just for consistency, the attacker uh, used this command and control channel three times. Here's how much data got transferred each time they used it. Now let's talk about the biggest one. Looking at the scale, I'm gonna guess this is around 300 bytes of data. What can you do with 300 bytes of data? Not much, right? That is show me files in the current directory. That is, maybe it's show me uh, processes owned by a specific user. It's not, hey, let's start you know, trying to do lateral movement and move to other systems because that would be a lot more data flow. This is not grab every Excel spreadsheet off of the local system because, again, that would be more data flow. What if I've got a customer database on this system that has all my customers' private information in it and that database is 10 gigs in size? I ask you, did the attacker get access to that data set? What's the answer to that question? No, right? Did they get the data set? No, they didn't, because that data set's 20 gigs in size, or 10 gigs, or whatever I said. Even if you compress that, it's still going to end up being like five gigs or more. So unless I see a, data, a session size of five gigs or higher, I know they haven't grabbed a copy of my database yet. So again, we can't see it, what was in the command set, because it's encrypted. But by using that session size, we can make some estimates about what's taking place on the network. So here's a quick, dirty way to go in and kind of do a session size comparison using Zeek data. So here I'm saying cat con.log, pipe that through Brocut. I want to pull out, I want to extract out the source IP address, the destination IP address, and how many bytes the source sent to the destination. And then I'm piping it through this grep command that's looking for only sessions that involved this one IP address. And then I'm saying sort the data. So now anytime the source and destination are the same, it's going to go through and it's going to uh, combine those together. And then I'm using this command, which we haven't talked about yet, unique C. Unique says, hey, regardless of how many lines you see of the same thing, you know, in other words, uh, lines one, two, three, four, and five are all the same. I only want you to print one instance of that. So let's say lines one through five were exactly the same. Run it through unique and only print that line out once. If I say unique dash C, it'll print the line out once and it'll put the number five at the beginning of the line to let me know, hey, there were five instances of this line within the file, but I compacted it down to one and I'm just telling you there was originally five. So that's what the dash C does. Then I'm saying sort dash RN. So sort, starting at the left, largest uh, reverse order sort, largest number first. This is a numeric value. So all this is doing is normally sort would put the uh, one above the 2,868. Two dash R just does it in reverse order. Mm -hmm. So what is this telling me? This is telling me that when this IP address talked to that IP address, 546 bytes was transferred 2,868 times. Okay, that's consistency in session size, right? That could potentially be a heartbeat. 
meaning this could be a command and control channel that the attacker just hasn't used yet. Now, what if I saw, you know, 2,865, and then I saw some number of connections that are maybe, you know, a meg or five megs or something like that? Well, now I know they, they activated the channel a couple of times. Notice one of my lines is a dash. What that means is one of the times when this system called into the command and control server, command and control server said, yeah, not now, I'm too busy, <laughs> go away. So it's possible this command and control server actually has multiple com compromised systems calling into it, and it just got too busy at one point. So detecting beacons with jitter. Like I said, the easiest way to do this, normalize it out over a longer period of time. So if I look at my data in one hour or two hour chunks, that jitter starts to uh, normalize out. So it becomes a whole lot easier to see I've got persistency at connection. The other thing that uh, when we identify persistency, when we identify a beacon or a long connection, that doesn't immediately mean it's evil. It's just a uncommon method of communication, right? Usually communications are opportunistic. I need to go to Google, you see traffic going to Google. I need to check my Gmail, you see traffic going to Gmail. You know, the, it's based on the person that's sitting behind the keyboard. When I see persistency 24 hours a day, that's something that is programmatic. I need to understand, is there a business need for that? And that's not something you can answer with software. I'll give you a good example. So this internal IP address is calling out pretty frequently to this external IP, and they resolved, this IP was resolved from client.teamviewer.com. In other words, this system said, hey, what's the IP address for client.teamviewer.com? And then started connecting to this IP address after they made that query, and this query resolved to that IP address. Is this evil, yes or no? Well, it depends, right? Do I expect TeamViewer to be running on the server? Did I purposely set that up? If so, yes, this is a business need and this is fine. I can create an exception for this so that I don't need to see it as part of my future threat hunts. But if I went through and ran this and I didn't know TeamViewer was running on that server and I can't I find anybody who can identify why TeamViewer should be running on that server, oh, we got a problem, right? We've got a definite problem. So here's the same endpoint, TeamViewer. It's all a matter of business content. So once we identify persistency, part the reason we're going to research that connection is to specifically figure out, can I identify a business need behind this? Because if I can, life is good. If I can't, we got a problem. And sometimes it can be the same endpoint, just different systems. I've gone into environments where they've said, yeah, we got TeamViewer running on these three servers, and we found it running on like 14 or 15 different systems. So for those three servers, it was okay. For all the rest, there's a problem. They need to figure out why it's actually there. So potential false positives you can run into looking for uh, beacons. We've talked about some of these. Things like NTP, Windows Message Bus. You know, I always go looking for things that are going back to Microsoft's infrastructure. You know, what were they querying? One of the nice things about it is that most of the connections back to Microsoft, you're going to be able to identify a Microsoft-issued digital certificate that tells you, yeah, this was just going to one of our Windows Message Bus servers. So if you look at the digital certificate on this connection that's beaconing back, that lets you know, yeah, this is something I don't need to, need to be worried about. Um, you can also run into things like, uh, okay, more of a mischaracterization. Uh, Zeek has a timeout issue. Five minutes is just too short, meaning that you, if, uh, what should be recorded as a long connection sometimes actually ends up looking like a beacon simply because Zeek is hitting its five-minute timeout. Um, and I see that with Microsoft traffic a lot. I'll see situations where Microsoft traffic will pause for about 30 minutes and then start communicating again. And Zeek will record multiple sessions, even though they're all the same long connection taking place. But at least it's still detected as a beacon type of thing. Uh, you can fix that. You can go in and you can just tell Zeek, use this different timeout, and that fixes that problem. I usually set it for an hour myself. All right. So let's start talking about some additional techniques before we go in and we take a break. So these are pretty straightforward in this section here. You shouldn't need as much of a description. So you want to look for things you don't expect, like remote access to a server that you don't know has remote access set up to it, the whole TeamViewer thing. 
anytime you see something like that, any type of remote control software, and it's not expected to be there, yeah, that's something that's worth paying attention to. On an unknown app on a standard port. What I mean by that is, you know, um, C2 wants to tunnel data out of the environment. Sometimes it will use the protocols associated with the port. So the most common example is HTTPS, right? So that's TCP 443. That's normally, that's the well-known port for HTTPS or encrypted HTTP traffic. So normally what I would expect to see when somebody communicates with that port is I would expect to see the client send an SSL hello packet, which basically is, hey, here's how I want to do authentication and, and data privacy. And then I would expect the server to send its SSL hello packet, hey, here's what I want to use. And hopefully they meet, you know, they can negotiate TLS 1.2 as part of that. Um, but then you'll see the server send its digital certificate. So as part of every connection to TCP 443, I expect to see SSL client hello, SSL server hello, digital certificate, a negotiation of parameters take place, and then and then things go dark, right? And then the data becomes encrypted after that, but I expect to see that all the time. Well, what if I don't see that? What if I just see a system passing what looks like encrypted data out TCP 443 and I don't see that handshake? Well, somebody's tunneling data. That's worth paying attention to. So understanding is are the well-known ports being used by the applications you expect to see using them that is really important and you need to be careful with this because most tools get this wrong in other words if your firewall says hey that's http traffic what it probably means is the traffic's just going to tcp port 80 and it's assuming it's http but it could be an ssh session and it wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two so when a tool tells you the application make sure you understand is it actually decoding that application layer or is it just kind of passing data what's nice about zeek zeek actually understands applications over 50 of them so when zeek tells you an application is listening it means it so for example here in this first connection we see it's going to tcp 22 and it's identifying it as ssh it's identifying it as ssh because it saw the SSH client share, hey, here's the version of SSH I'm using. It saw the server share, hey, here's the version of SSH I'm using. Then it saw the negotiation of parameters. Here's how I want to do authentication. Here's how I want to do data privacy. It actually saw that take place. So it labeled that as being an SSH session. But notice this connection to exactly that same server that's capable of speaking SSH. Dash. That's Zeke saying, I don't know what application is on that port. Now, in this particular case here, that probably means it never completed the three-packet handshake. It never actually got into the negotiation. This is probably a system that was port scanning to see, does anybody have TCP 22 open? But because it didn't see the actual SSH handshake, Zeke is saying, I don't know what they were trying to do on that port. I didn't see a recognized application there. So again, if I see TCP 443 traffic and it doesn't label it, is being SSL, which SSL is just a default for, it could be SSL, could be TLS within the Zeek world. If I don't see that, that's somebody tunneling out data. Uh, let's say, on initial 443C2, how would we detect? So uh, Zeek, what I'm showing you here, is a great way to go in and detect that. So I can go in and I can look to see, hey, does any of the connections on well-known ports not show up with the application I expect to see. If they don't, that's a problem. That's what I want to go in and try and flag on. So you can also see situations where they're following the RFCs, but they're kind of bending the rules a little bit. And probably one of the best examples of that is C2 over DNS. So for example, how many fully qualified domain names? Does it make sense? For a domain to expose to the internet. For most domains, this is pretty small, right? I might have a web server, a mail server, a couple of DNS servers, maybe a customer portal. Hey, look, I'm still counting the fingers on my first hand. You know, in other words, it was like five or less. So we can probably ballpark and say less than 10 for most environments. Then you get into the ones that everybody recognizes, like Amazon, Akamai, Google, Apple, and you might resolve a couple of hundred in a day especially if you're using like a cloud infrastructure there right but what if you get into a thousand 
You know, what if you get over 100 and it's a domain you don't immediately recognize as a big player? Or what if you get over to 1,000 regardless of who it happens to be? Well, that might be an indication of C2 over DNS. Remember we said the attacker is changing the query each time to make sure that the local DNS resolver doesn't just hand back cached information. So it's going to send a different query. Well, if we're seeing tons of queries, like I said, more than 100 for a domain we don't immediately recognize or more than 1,000 for anybody, that could be command and control taking place. Regardless of the record type, you know, whether it be text or C name or whatever it happens to be, we don't know, we don't care. It's just the large quantity of unique queries. So this is using T-Shark to go in and read this capture file. Let me hit this real quick and then we'll take a break. And it's using one of my favorite command line switches, which is the dash T fields. Dash T field says, don't print out summary information about each packet, just print the field I specify. And here I'm saying, I wanna see the DNS query field. And then I'm sorting it and I'm reversing it and I'm doing some stuff to go through and basically cut out the domain that we were querying. But what this is telling me is, 62,468 unique queries went to r-1x.com. Okay, I have no idea what that domain is, right? I mean, you know, here's Akamai, here's Amazon, here's Microsoft. I, I recognize them, but I don't recognize r-1x.com. That's probably a C2 chain. So it's real easy to go in and kind of figure out, yeah, here's where I need to go and pay attention. And with that said, it's the top of the hour. So we're going to take a 10-minute break. So at 10 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll jump back in and go on from here.
All right, we still have a couple minutes, but a uh, lot of questions going by. A couple of them I wanted to hit. Uh, one was, you know, folks talking about, <laughs> I love this community. I really do. Because <clears throat> I've been involved with a number of security communities in the past where if you asked the wrong question, you were belittled. You know, it was, you know, oh, read the fact or, oh, do your homework. And, oh, why are you asking me? Oh, that's too basic. and you know, I raise my kids on um, there's two ways to make yourself better. You can build yourself up or you can tear others down around you. And the second one is easier, right? It's easier to have negative comments to everybody else. And what I love, love, love about this community is that you don't get that. People are helpful. You know, I've seen comments like, hey, you know, stick with it. Everybody starts somewhere. You know, it's okay if it doesn't stick to you right away. You know, you might have to go through it a couple of times. I did. I, that, that's awesome. It's awesome reinforcement. You know, the fact that folks are here to kind of help each other out. I mean, that's really what this is all about. I just think that is incredibly cool. I have seen a few people come through that, you know, want, they're, more, they're more interested in trying to show they're smart by belittling other people versus actually being helpful and they don't last long. <laughs> they don't last long at all. Uh, they get ejected like a virus, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So for the folks that are jumping in and helping out, you know, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, folks were also kind of talking about, you know, the goal is to know what you don't, you know, is to get better at knowing what you don't know. Yeah, Dunn and Kruger. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Dunn and Kruger effect, you can do some reading on that. But basically when you're brand new to a topic, you think you know more than you actually do. And um, I've never had that problem with security because there's always been stuff I knew I didn't know. But, um, but yeah, you can definitely run into that. There's kind of that um, you don't know much and then you know a little bit and you're like, oh, this is actually not too bad. I think I'm doing pretty good. And then you find out about all the stuff you have no clue about and then you start feeling like, you know, oh crap, I'm dumb, dumb again. And no, you're not, that, that's where you want to be. You know, you want to kind of recognize that, hey, I don't know everything, but the stuff I know I'm pretty good at and, you know, that's cool and I'm just going to keep moving forward and that's the way to deal with it. Uh, I also saw um, some folks talking about Zeek, like, you know, how can you learn information? And yeah, there are, there are uh, tons of stuff on YouTube about it. The advanced class, the next step after this, we spend an awful lot of time going through Zeek because it really is an awesome tool. You can really do some cool stuff with it. All right. And with that said, um, well, let's just jump right in. Well, let's jump back into what we were doing. So we were talking about bending the communication rules, not necessarily breaking them, right? So tunneling some obfuscated data through TCP 443 that doesn't have an SSL handshake, that is obviously breaking the protocol, right? That that's, you know, we're not seeing the protocol we expect to see. But we can see folks bend the rules too, where, yeah, these are RFC compliant DNS queries, it's just an excessive number of unique queries to a domain we don't recognize, and that's what makes that behavior kind of suspicious to us. This is one of the things you can use to kind of lever, uh, tag in on, do I have C2 running over my DNS servers? You can also, there's a couple of different ways you can go in and carve it. So this actually just goes through and kind of breaks down that command. Remember I talked about sometimes it's easier to understand a command if you take it in smaller sections, like look at the first set of output, then the second, then the third, that's what I just broke down for you here. Basically what I did is I took the DNS query, I switched all the characters backwards on the line, and then just carved out everything that wasn't part of the domain, and then printed it right back in the same order again. And that allowed me to see the number of unique queries I was getting in each of my domains. So along with seeing, looking for things like too many unique queries within a domain, the other thing you can go in and look for is traffic utilization. Are you doing queries, but no one's actually actually using that information for anything? I'll give you a good example of that. So in this screen, what we're looking at is an, an analysis of the DNS traffic that took place on our network over a 24 hour period of time. We resolved 125 unique host names within AkaDNS.net. Okay, AkaDNS.net is Akamai. They're the biggest CDN provider in the world. So the fact that we resolved 125 CDN server names over a 24 hour period of time, not a surprise. Remember we talked about the different thresholds, you know, like 10 or less for domains we don't recognize, 
but for the busy ones, and Akamai is definitely one of them, we might see a couple hundred. So this kind of falls right into that, right? 125, yeah, that sounds legit. Then what I did is I pivoted and I looked at, okay, did anyone actually go to any of those 125 hosts? And the answer was yes. I had 13 different systems that connected to one or more of those 125 systems some number of times over this 24 hour period of time. This is expected behavior. Think about what happens when you do a web browser session, right? You type a name into your web browser, DNS resolves it to an IP address, you go connect to that IP address. So we should see this type of behavior where we're doing any queries and then people are connecting to those IP addresses that came back in the answers. This is what we should see for every domain. What you're gonna see when C2 over DNS is running is something more like this. So we see 62,000 plus unique queries took place. We said, okay, all right, that's way too many. Anything over a thousand is suspicious, especially if we don't recognize the domain name in r-1x.com, I've never heard of that before. But further analysis shows that the only system that ever connects to that domain is the one making the DNS queries. Well, wait a minute. Why are we looking up all these different host names if no one ever wants to connect to one of those hosts? That makes no sense, right? So here's a great example of bending the protocol as opposed to outright breaking it. You know, it, it's behavior that doesn't match what we expect to be taking place. Um, I'm big on what is the story, right? Like I, I talked about the story of using your web browser. The story of using your web browser was you type a domain name in the in the browser bar, your system resolves that for to an IP address, and then you connect to that IP address. You know, that's how that connectivity is supposed to work. If what you're looking at doesn't match that story, like, hey, so yeah, we're resolving things in the domain, but I'm not connecting to it, you gotta ask yourself why? What what's what's breaking the story? What's causing this problem? You know, and a lot of times it may end up being C2 that you're looking for. You can also look for things like unique user agent strings. So here I'm going in and now this is another log file that Z creates. So Z creates con.log. And anytime it recognizes the application being used, it'll write out a separate log for that. So if it recognizes as HTTP traffic or SSH traffic or SSL traffic, it will create an http.log file or an ssh log file or an ssl log file and now you can go to those log files to get additional details about what was going by as part of that session so here i'm looking at the http log and i'm cutting out the user agent string and the user agent string is how is the web browser identifying itself right like hey i'm a mozilla 5 system running on windows nt 10 and you know i'm powershell <laughs> or you know i'm like um, um you know windows 64-bit environment you know and it's like gecko i know like gecko sounds kind of weird but that's actually a legitimate user agent string that you might say and what i may choose to do is go in and look for unique strings because unique strings identify unique applications running on my network now every network's got one-offs so this might be perfectly fine, but I should at least understand that there. So this is why this one to me is, I referred to earlier as a, a minor modifier. Just because something is unique doesn't mean it's bad, but if it's unique and it's beaconing, or if it's unique and it's generating long connections, oh, that definitely makes it worth going in and taking a close look at that. You can also look at things like how are SSL TLS sessions being negotiated? Because again, this is kind of like the user agent string. If I'm running uh, Chrome, same version of Chrome on Windows 10 for all of my desktop systems, everybody's user agent string should look the same. Everybody's, uh, everybody should negotiate TLS sessions exactly the same way. And if I'm getting different stuff, that means I've got different applications running on my systems, and I should be able to understand what are those applications and are there, is there a business need behind it. The, uh, I'm, part of the reason this is a minor modifier is the false positive rate is higher because we've all got one-offs, right? So I'm running Chrome on Windows 10 and that looks a certain way, but every now and then Windows Update kicks off. And when Windows Update kicks off, it, um, it has a completely different signature to it, but that's okay, it's just Windows patching. Uh, the user agent string that we were looking at here, this is actually just a Linux system patching itself. 
So while all most of my desktops are Windows 10, you know, running Chrome, I've got at least one person running a Linux box. And this is just Linux going out to check for patches. That's okay. So, you know, again, the false positive rate can be higher on this. This is why it's a minor modifier for me versus a major like beaconing or like long connections. So, like I said, once I've looked at persistency of connection, once I've looked at abnormal protocol usage, the next thing I'll want to do is start analyzing my endpoints. And whether I do my internal versus my external depends on how much data I have on my internal systems. If I have nothing, start with the external IP address. You might be able to solve the problem by analyzing that. So again, I know nothing about my internal systems and I see this weird you know, TLS connection going out as a persistent connection out to this IP address on the internet. But then when I run down that external IP, I see, oh, it's in Microsoft's ASN. Um, it's identifying itself as a Windows notification service. And it's even got a digital certificate that was issued to Microsoft. Okay, great. Now I know I can trust that session. That's okay without having to learn anything about the internal system. But if I have internal information, if I have, you know, if I'm creating, let's say I'm logging all applications that do network connections off of my internal host, it might actually be easier to start there. You know, go look at what would app me that connection. Is that an app I expect to have running on my network? If it is, great, I'm done. I don't care what that host is. <laughs> if it's not, oh yeah, I need to pay attention to it. You can check thread intel feeds. Um, sometimes these can be helpful. What I, you know, what I like about these is it's good for things like abuse IPDB will give me a history of what's been associated with a specific IP address. So it, like if it says, you know, it's Microsoft today, but over the last year, it's been a bunch of other domains. Oh, that's going to make me really suspicious because Microsoft hangs on to their resources and they use it internally only. Um, so if I see an IP that changes what it's associated with over time, especially a, a lot over like the last year, yeah, that to me is kind of an untrustworthy IP. But if it's Microsoft and always has been, and it's just different systems within the Microsoft domain, yeah, that's a little bit more trustworthy. So for me, that's more the use of thread intel feeds versus, you know, is it bad or not type of thing. And like I said, once I look at my external, I can then go look at my internal, but I would do it the other way around if I have good data on my internal systems. So this is where we can leverage that internal host logging. So like I said, it's about context for me. It's not that internal logging is bad, it's just that those logs have no context besides signatures we can try and write against them, which isn't really very helpful for finding uh, malicious patterns. But if I see suspicious traffic on the network and now pivot that back into what applications are doing it, now I have context, right? This application is connecting to an IP address on the internet I don't recognize every 30 seconds and it's doing it all day long. That's some serious context to help me recognize, you know, whether this is an application that should be on my system or not. And Sysmon is a great tool for this. So with Sysmon, I can go in and I can say, I want to record ID3s. ID3 is an application that communicated with the network. So it could be an inbound connection that came to that system. It could be software running on that system that connected to a remote host out on the internet. So you can see here, you know, Slack was running and it connected to, you know, this host here on TCP 443. So you get some good summary information about what's going on. And what's nice about this is now when I see something that looks suspicious, like here, this internal IP address is talking to that external IP and the application is making that connection pretty, pretty consistently. There's a little bit of jitter in there, but it's pretty consistent, right? I should be able to understand what that application is. So I see this on the network. Now I pivot into my host login. So what you're looking at here is a tool called Beaker. Uh, Beaker is an open source project that we run that uses uh, Sysmon to collect ID3 information. So applications that are talking on the network and that's the only thing we, we, we record. And we record everything. There's no exceptions that are set up. So um, I love Security Onion. But one of the things that kind of bums me out about the default settings is that it uses Sysmon to try and collect everything, you know, local process execution, registry key changes, um, you know, permission changes. It wants the whole ball of wax. 
And the tough part about that is now you're collecting a crap load of data off of each host and it doesn't scale as well. You know, that's fine if I've got a half a dozen systems, but if I've got a thousand, that's a ton of data trying to come in that I need to process. And it's not just about network performance and storage. It's about query time within my data set itself. If I want to go in and look for something, a pattern that might be interesting, it's going to take longer for that query to respond. Further, to try and reduce some of the traffic that gets recorded because they're trying to record everything, there's exceptions for different applications in there, like Chrome. I think the thought process was, well, everybody runs Chrome, so we just won't log anything from Chrome. Well, wait a minute. What if Chrome gets a malicious plug-in and it starts C2ing out to the internet? Now you're saying, don't pay attention to that? No, that makes no sense. So what we do with Beaker is applications that talk on the network only. That minimizes the data set down to the stuff that actually really matters. And it allows you to pivot in to be able to see what application made some connection. So let's say you're looking at your firewall log and you're seeing an internal host is constantly calling out to an IP address out on the internet. You could go into Beaker and you could say, hey, that internal IP address, when it was talking to that host out on the internet, what application was doing that? And that'll give you some context to that network traffic you were seeing. So in this case here, notice we're seeing HTTP connections going from this host to that host that are being created by Notepad. Oh, well, wait a minute. Notepad doesn't make network connections. Notepad should be a local process only. I should never see that talking to the network. This is bad. Something's really wrong here, right? So if I was just reviewing my host logs, to see that Notepad was getting kicked off on a system, I probably wouldn't even pay attention to that, right? But with this context of it's what's generating traffic on my network, oh, now I'm definitely gonna pay attention to that. Now I know this is something I need to be concerned about. So like I said, Beaker open source project, you may wanna take a look at that. You can read all about it up at the ACM website. But I have no system logs. Well, it might be a good idea to try and get some. And Beaker open source tool, it uses Sysmon, which is a free tool from Microsoft. It uses WinLogB to pull the data into an Elk stack that's open, also an open source tool. You can build a good host logging system just using open source stuff that'll scale pretty well. You don't have to pay a lot of money. Okay, now what do we do? So we've seen some networky stuff. We've got some host data. What do we do? Well, this comes back to that threat scoring system I talked about. So if we've gone in and assigned points, like we're saying, you know, 70 points because of this persistency of connection, and you know, we're seeing some weird protocol usage, so that's going to add in another 15, 20 points. Yet we can easily figure out what do we do with this next. You know, maybe maybe it's you know we see persistency of connection, so that adds in 70 points, but then we can explain away the connection as having a business need. Well, that should subtract like 50 points. And now what we do is we kind of set up a range. We say anything from like zero to 10 points, that's something that I'm gonna deem as being safe. If it has 90 points or more, that's something that we need to go in an incident response mode for. So we got 70 points for there being persistency of connection, but there's a business need behind it. Yeah, that's a safe system we can kind of move on from. Or, hey, there's persistency of connection and I can find a business need associated with it, and Notepad is the one making the connections, okay, now I'm pretty close up to 100 out of 100 potential points. We need to go in incident, incident response mode. So again, that threat scoring system can help you kind of figure out what do I do so that you don't get in this constant loop of here's a good thing, here's a bad thing, here's a good thing, here's a bad thing, yeah, I don't know what to do. You've got to make a decision, go one way or another. You know, threat hunting, that is our only real job is to disposition every internal system as safe or we need to go in incident response mode. That's the only thing we need to do. You need to be careful too, by the way, because it's real easy to get down the rabbit hole. Like, hey, we saw Notepad doing that thing. Now it's really tempting to go look at that system, to go poking around at Notepad to see what's up, right? No, no. Our job is to identify it as being a potential threat or not. Once we identify it as a potential threat, we must go into incident response mode. We need to follow the criteria that's defined within that documentation. Because maybe the documentation says take that system offline. Maybe the documentation says monitor it for some period of time. Maybe there's outside third party contractors that we have a, a, an agreement with that are gonna come in and take a look at it for us. You need to go into response mode. The, the line for me is any time I could potentially corrupt the evidence trail, that's when it's time to kick it in incident response mode. 
In other words, sniffing packets off the wire, analyzing where they're coming from, where they're going to, looking at host logs, none of that's going to corrupt the data, right? None of that's going to corrupt that actual system itself. As soon as I could potentially corrupt that, yeah, that's something I need to go get into your incident response mode for. All right, let's talk about some tools. So the first tool, TCP dump, this one's been around forever. So this is a packet capture tool. So I can read packet captures, I can create packet captures with this tool. Um, it's probably one of the oldest tools out there for that. Upside, it's very lightweight. It's very fast. Uh, one of my issues with Wireshark is if you're using Wireshark to capture packets off the wire, it Wireshark has a lot of overhead associated with it because of the GUI and because of the, you know, the translations it's trying to do or the decoding it's trying to do with the packets. It's easy to miss things. It's easy to have Wireshark running and not see some of the packets that went by because Wireshark got too busy to pull the packet in. TCP dump doesn't have that problem. It doesn't give you as much data as Wireshark would, but I could use TCP dump to create the PCAP and then go use Wireshark to do the analysis if I want to go through and do that. The commands at the bottom show you a way to go through and run Wireshark so that it'll sniff on, in this case here, the Ethernet Zero interface. And every hour, it's going to create a new compressed PCAP file. So if I want to have a PCAP, constant running PCAP of what's going by on my network, this will do that for me. And every hour, it's going to write it out to a new file for me. T-Shark is also another cool tool. So T-Shark is the command line equivalent to Wireshark. So a lot of the functionality is the same between the two of them. Um, this will also, by default, go in and print a summary of what it sees for packets going by. But like I said, my favorite part of T-Shark is the fact that I can go in and I can say, show me this specific field. Here are the exact things I want to be able to go in and look at and do an analysis on. So I just ran a, uh, a pack, the uh, intro to packet capturing class. And one of the things we use T-Shark for is there was a, there's a situation on the network that's kind of hard to wrap your brain around, but there are certain fields and different headers that can help reveal clues about what's going on. There's some information in the ethernet header, the IP header and the TCP header that can help us figure out what's actually going on. And with T-Shark, we were able to go in and pull out just ex those specific fields only so that every packet is still on one line, so it's easy to follow, but all the data you need to figure out what's up is all right there. Um, the dash E, you know, so dns.query.name, how do you figure out what those are? This is the same thing as the Wireshark display filters, right? So with Wireshark, I can go in and I can like read in a PCAP file, and then I can say, only show me this type of traffic. Those are display filters. The display filters on T-Shark uh, um, provide that same type of functionality, except it will only show you the field that you actually want to go in and target in on. And here's an example of going in and looking for the user agent string. Now, this is limiting it to destination port 80, right? So this is saying any traffic going to TCP port 80 I want you to print out the HTTP user agent field. Now, technically, I don't need this filter. I could just go in and say, hey, T-Shark, print out the HTTP user agent field. Anytime a packet doesn't have the user agent field, it's just going to print a blank line. The problem is I end up with a lot of blank lines in my output. So if I don't mind the blank lines in my output and I want to check for that user agent field, regardless of what port it might be going to, I don't have to limit things down like this. But if I want to remove the blank lines, one of the easiest ways to do it is to restrict what I actually, what uh, packets I will actually go looking for this field within, and I want to restrict it to whatever packets might actually contain this field. And then there's Wireshark. Wireshark's an awesome tool. Uh, it's a great analysis tool. It's just very cumbersome. When I'm dealing with big data sets, you know, five gigs, 20 gigs, I'll use T-Shark, I'll use Zeek, I'll use command line tools because they'll process them very quickly. One of the downsides of Wireshark is if I have a 20 gig file, that I, a PCAP file that I wanna analyze, with T-Shark or with Zeek, it's processing it packet by packet, no problem. With Wireshark, Wireshark needs to load the whole PCAP into memory first. So if I don't have 20 gigs of free memory on my system, while Wireshark is running before I load this PCAP file, 
I'm going to be throwing things to swap an awful lot. It's going to run slow. Um, so that's one of the cumbersome parts of it, but it is a really good tool. So for me, it's useful when I have a target. In other words, hey, this session between these two IP addresses looks really interesting. I want to do a deeper analysis. Okay, great. That's when I'll pull out Wireshark. But to find that interesting session, I'm going to use Zeek, I'm going to use T-Shark, I'm going to use some other tool. And I've mentioned Zeek a lot already. So there's two tools you'll hear, Bro and Zeek. What's the difference? Bro is what the tool used to be called. Zeek is what the tool is called today. They just simply changed the name on the tool. And a lot of the reason for that was, you know, back when it was called Bro, anytime you internet search to try and find helpful information about it, you found lots of information that had nothing to do with this tool anytime you searched on the string Bro. Zeek, yeah, okay, that hits up a little bit easier. Uh, so that was part of the reason for the name change. Plus, they didn't want to be associated with the bro term, you know, whatever. For me, the big thing was, yeah, I can just never find the data I'm actually looking for. Uh, but this is an awesome tool. And we'll actually work with some of these log files when we get into doing the labs. And like I said, I can use Zcut to go in and extract out just certain fields if I want to. So here I'm telling Zcut, I want to look at the SSL log file. And I want Zcut to pull out the source IP, the destination IP, the destination port, and the validation status field. What's that? The validation status field is you can actually set up Zeek to check the digital signatures that it sees going by on the wire. So when someone goes to a Microsoft and it looks like a Microsoft cert, you can actually configure Zeek to say, hey, go ver validate that cert and make sure it's okay. And then what I'm doing is I'm checking the validation status field for the character string self-signed. In other words, I want to see who's talking to servers that have a self-signed digital certificate. And then I'm just saying, I only want to see one instance of it. So if somebody talked to that server 20 times today, I don't need to see it 20 times, just show it to me once and that's it. And notice I didn't even bother doing a unique dash C to count it. I just said, show me one line per. Because now I know these um, source IPs or these servers, are all always going to be self-signed. You know, it's not like it's going to change it up as it goes through. And I apologize if there's any background noise coming through the mic. Uh, it sounds like there's a pretty heavy storm blowing past me right now. So lots of thunder, lots of lightning going off. Hopefully that doesn't mean I'm going to lose power because that would be that would be a real bummer. Another cool cool tool is ngrep. So we we already talked about grep, G-R-E-P. And we said that pattern matches in text files to look for lines that contain a certain string. Well, ngrep is similar to that, except it checks packets for a particular string. And I say, hey, I want to look for this character sequence within a packet. ngrep will print out every packet that has that character string in it. A couple of important switches. The first is dash capital I. This is what you use to read a PCAP file. The common convention is dash lowercase r to read uh, a file, but ngrep went a different way. They went with capital I to input this file information. Whatever, just so long as you know. The other switch you need to know about is dash q. If I say, hey, ngrep, look for this pattern and packets going by, anytime ngrep checks a packet and doesn't find that pattern, it'll print out a pound symbol. Well, what you end up happening with even just a fairly quiet network is you get pound symbols scrolling by on the screen, and then every now and then you might see the data you're looking for scrolls past the top of the screen because it's doing, you know, it's printing out all the pound symbols. So dash Q just simply says, do not print out the pound signs. And here's an example. So I'm saying ngrep, don't print out pound symbols, read in this PCAP file, and I want you to look for the character string admin. And it is case sensitive unless you tell it otherwise. And then print out the first 15 lines. Notice it popped back and said, okay, I'm going to read odd.pcap and I'm going to look for admin. And then here it's saying, hey, in this TCP packet with this source IP address, this source port, going to that destination IP address, that destination port, this packet had the ACK and the push flag set. And in the payload, was get this long string, which included admin right here. 
And then here is the server responding back with a 404 error message, basically saying, hey, that file you tried to get, start, stop, HTML, I don't have that file, 404, file not found. But as part of returning the file not found, it tells you what file was not found, and that included that admin string. And notice this, you know, this happened to be on TCP port 80, but if this happened on port 200, it would find it there too, because I didn't tell ngrep port. I just said, check every pat packet for this particular pattern. And then this data mash. So data mash is a really, um, you saw me using this a little bit earlier. It allows me to process data on the fly from the command line, which can be super helpful. So for example, I can look at things like, um, if I'm looking at you know, packet sizes, I can go in and I can figure out what was my minimum session size, what was my max, what was the mean, what's the deviation off of the mean. Uh, but where I use it a lot is just in simply adding up lines. So, hey, this IP address talked to that IP address for a certain amount of time. Well, let's add up all those durations every time it connected to see what the total duration time was. Uh, that's a really good use for data mesh. The, this is very similar to the R-Base tools. R-Base, if you want to, I find data mesh to be a little bit more flexible to use, but the R-Base tools were, are, are just as efficient. So here's an example, right? I'm going in and I'm saying cat con.log. So I'm looking at Zeke's con.log file. I'm saying bro cut. I want to look at only specific fields. I want to see the source IP address, the destination IP address, and the duration of the connection. How long was this connection up and running for? And then I want to sort it. So uh, dash K3, which means I want to sort it based on this third column. It's a numeric value, reverse order, biggest before smallest, and then show me the first 10 lines of output. So what I'm looking at in this first command is how, what is the longest unique session that took place over the time of this capture file? So let's assume it's 24 hours. So over this 24 hour period of time, what was the longest connection that took place? And notice my um, results two and three are identical. It's the same source and destination IP, the duration time is different, but what this is saying is this source IP connected to that destination IP talked for just under 42 seconds, and then later on within that 24-hour period of time, it connected back and talked for a little over 31 seconds. Well, if I'm looking for, if I want to know total communication time, I don't want these broken apart, right? I want them combined together. So here's how I did that. Cat con log cut out source destination duration, same as we did up here. Then I sorted it, but I sorted it from the first character in the line to the end, not dash, not on the duration field like we did up here. I just said, hey, anytime the source IP address and the destination IP address are the same, put those one line after the other. And then I pump it through data mesh to say dash g, one comma two. <clears throat> sum three. So when columns one and two match, add up the value in the third column. Then I did the sort dash K3 here to say put the largest durations first. Now, for the folks that are really paying attention, you'll notice I missed two commands. I missed those two grep commands that I talked about earlier, one to remove blank lines and one to remove dashes. So I got a little cheap on this just because I knew what the data output looked like and I knew I didn't have any zero durations. But uh, this is the second time I've shown this. The first example is a better example than this one. But notice when I did that, that just combined these two lines into one, so I got a total duration time. Uh, notice uh, this one here, 192.168.1.1, this was 4.19 seconds. Now it's up to 5.46 seconds, so clearly there were other connections I didn't see in that first output. So again, this will show me cumulative time as opposed to just a unique session. And then there's Rita. So Rita is another open source tool that we produce. Uh, Rita is named after John's mom, Rita. Um, it's short for Real, uh, Real Intelligence Threat Analytics. What Rita does is Rita speci is specifically designed to look for command and control channels for you. So rather than you having to, let's say, manually parse Zeek data to try and find it, 
Rita will go find those connections for you. This can be a huge time saver, especially when you get into things like looking for beacons. Rita takes a couple of different types of input, but the one we really prefer is BroZeek data because that is the most accurate. You can get it to work with like NetFlow. It was horrible from a security perspective. It's very inconsistent in what it provides. And it doesn't give you a good level of detail. You miss a lot of things in the application layer. Uh, so Zeek is really preferred. So what folks will typically do is they'll have a network probe set up and it could be something as simple as a Raspberry Pi that monitors all the traffic going in and out of your internet link. And what's monitoring that traffic is Zeek. And then Zeek takes, those, uh, takes that traffic, writes it into Zeek log files, and then Rita reads those Zeek logs and goes in and looks to see, do I see anything that looks like it's a, a possibility of command and control in there? So for example, one of the things Rita can go in and look for is beacons, that persistency and connection. And it provides a persistency score. So the very first value is a persistency score on a scale of zero to one. So think of this as a percentage, right? So for these first two entries, we're 100% certain there's connection persistency here. For the second one, we're 83.8% .8 certain there's connection persistency here. Well, why is this a percentage? Well, because it might just be a couple of connections during the day and there's a big delta in time between when those connections took place. So that could be somebody triggering an application a couple of times within the course of the day, or it could be actual persistency. It's programmatic in, that, in the way that it's calling back in. So it's a scale. For me personally, anything that scores 80% or better, that's probably worth going in and taking a look at. Now there's a ton of data here. The, one, the data that really matters to you as an analyst is the score that we just talked about, source IP address, because that's the system that's creating this connection. That's the one we're gonna to have to analyze if it turns out, yeah, this looks like persistency of connection. Who are they talking to? That's important because that's gonna help us figure out is there a business need here, right? If they're calling back to Microsoft servers, this might be okay. If they're calling out to r-1x.com or honestimnotevil.com, yeah, no, I don't know those domains. You know, why do I have a persistent connection with a domain I don't recognize? I need to run this down. So the destination IP address is gonna help us with that. The next value after that is the number of connections that we're seeing in this data set. So if we're looking at 24 hours of data, this is the number of times the source IP connected to the destination IP address over that 24 hour period. The next value after that is um, the average amount of data that was getting transferred each time. So remember I said 0.8 is my cutoff. Anything that's 0.8 or higher for a score is something I wanna go in and analyze. There's an exception to that rule. If I see very large data transfers, but the score is down in like the 0.6s, or, high, or you know, somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8, I'll run those down too. You know, It's far less likely it's persistent connection, but it's moving a lot of data. So it's probably worth scrutinizing a little bit heavier just to be sure because it's moving a lot of data. Oh, the rest of the values, this is really for the, uh, the developers, right? So if someone was to come back to us and say, hey, somebody was running Bob's Beacon software and Rita gave it a really slow score, we can say, hey, okay, run it through Rita, send us the full data output, and we can look at what did we see about Bob's Beacon software that made us decide that we should give it a low score, a high score, or whatever the case may be. Uh, it, the data is really there to just help make the tool better. It'll also look for C2 over DNS. So I can go in and I can say, hey, Rita, show exploded DNS in this data set test. And you know, show me the first 10 lines of output and Rita will automatically summarize this for you. So remember I had two slides on, on doing this uh, with Zeek data where I was going in and I was cutting things and extracting things and changing the order that things got printed and flipping them back and doing all that weird crap. You don't need to worry about any of that with Rita. Rita will do this for you. So what Rita is saying is, Simu, we did 227 unique queries within that domain. Okay, Simu, uh, Simru, however you pronounce that, is actually a domain that will go in and do uh, threat intel for you. So basically what it's designed for is anytime your user wants to go to some place out on the internet, 
you can send that query to them and they will go and check to see is that a no malicious domain or not. It was useful 15 years ago, not so much now, because like we said, attackers are changing the stuff up all the time. But this is clearly in an environment that uses that. So now I know, okay, yeah, false positive. There's a business need for that. I expect to see that as well as the next two domains after that, right? Because they're all part of SEMU as well. We break out subdomains just in case that's interesting information for you here. Then this passer. This is a cool tool. So this is another open source tool that we have. Uh, this was the brainchild of uh, Bill Stearns. Um, this is an awesome tool. Because what it does is it watches what's going on on the network and it will create a profile of the systems that it sees. Like, you know, it's saying, oh, hey, TCP 43 is open on this system. Well, how does it know that? Because it saw somebody communicating with that port and it saw that the system didn't reset the connection, that it actually accepted the data. So therefore it knows this system now has an open IP address or an, that, that port is open on it. It will also go in and try and do some rudimentary fingerprinting on it to be able to tell you, you know, what type of you know, host is actually running on that, or what type of system is that. You know, like this is an Apple TV device that shows up over here. So if you don't know much about your internal environment and you want to monitor for new things that might come on the wire, uh, this is a great tool for that. And like I said, this is another open source tool. All right, let's get this started. We're uh, 10 minutes before the top of the hour and it's gonna be our midpoint. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a 20 minute break this time. So I am gonna go through and kind of set up this lab and talk you through what it is you need to do. We'll take the next 10 minutes doing the lab. Uh, then we'll take our 20 minute break and then we'll come back and shortly after that, we'll go through and cover the lab. So if you need a little extra time, I like to do it this way because now we got that 20 minute break. If you need extra time, you can go into that 20 minutes. You don't have to worry about falling behind the rest of the class. So I mentioned this earlier. All of these labs are gonna follow a similar format. I'm gonna give you a problem. So I'm gonna say, hey, go to this directory or go to this you know, location on the VM or on your system that you ran the script on. And I want you to find the 10 longest connections, right? That might be a problem I toss out at you. Show me the 10 longest connections. Uh, show me the top 10 uh, longest cumulative connection times or whatever the case may be. I'll throw out something like that. And that'll be the problem slide and that's it. Now, if you hear that, right? If you hear, oh, show me the top 10 cumulative connections and you say, oh, hey, I know how to do that. I know where in a PCAP file or a Zeek file or wherever it is you're supposed to look. I'm not going to give that away because I think that is one of the ones I give you here. But if you know, yeah, this is where I need to look and this is what I need to extract out. Let me, and I don't remember the actual name. So let me go look in the file to find out what the column title is. And yeah, I, I can do this. And if, if that's how your brain is firing on that problem, great, go for it. Use that problem slide only and just run with it and try and solve it. Now, if you look at it and you say, okay, duration, do I use PCAPs to that? Do I use Zeek for that? What is it I'm actually looking for? If you're like, yeah, I remember him talking about that and I, I know what they're looking for, but I don't really know how to find it. The next slide after the problem slide is the hint slide. Go read that. The hint slide won't give you the answer, but it's gonna help you start thinking in the right direction to potentially be able to solve the problem. And if you read that and that helps you out and you're ready to go, bang, go do the lab. You're in good shape. If you're saying, dude, this is the first time I've seen network traffic in my life. I've never decoded packets. I've never looked at network traffic before. All of this stuff is new to me. Fine. Go to the next slide after the hints, right? If you go through the hints and you still don't know what, what you need to do for the lab, go to the, uh, go to the next slide because that'll have the actual commands you need. Copy, paste in the command and analyze what is it that I'm looking at here? Where did this go look for this data? What did it find? Why does this answer that question? You know, and you can even uh, up arrow and pull out portions of the command if you want to go look and see what is each section of a command doing if it's a compound command. So that'll go through and that'll kind of walk you through that. Hmm. After that is the actual solution. So after that, I'll show you the output of the command. This is what you should have seen. This is what's interesting in that data. 
So you can go through and kind of solve it that way. So again, what I'm trying to do is make these labs applicable to a wide range of skills so that folks that are good at it still feel challenged, but the folks where they're just getting started don't get frustrated and say, I have no freaking clue what to do. There's still stuff while you're here. Go for it. All lab files are on the VM, or if you ran the script, the script created a couple of directories for you that are start with lab and then a number. They're going to be the um, they're going to be uh, the labs will be located in those directories. If you're running a VM, login name T Hunt, password is short for all your base belong to us, so that'll get you into the VM. And then, like I said, all the labs are in the your home directory, lab something. And it might be one, two, three, whatever the case may be. So, but we're going to start in the lab one directory. So here's what we're going to do. I want you, so there's two piece, two different types of data I gave you in that directory. One is a PCAP file. The other is Zeek logs that were created from that PCAP file. So you have the same data in two different formats, PCAP and Zeek logs. I want you to pick and choose what do you need to use to identify A, the 10 longest connections that took place from an internal IP to an external IP, and B, the 10 longest cumulative connection times that took place from an internal IP to an external IP. So that's the lab. Go to it. Like I said, we get about five minutes and then we're going to take a break. We'll come back. We'll do it for just a little bit more and then we'll go through and we'll talk about this lab. If you have any questions, problems, just go ahead and throw that in the Discord channel. Okay, I'm going to cover one thing real quick uh, because I changed up the slides and this got pulled out. So it's not fair to expect you to do it. <laughs> so I want to <clears throat> kind of cover it as a class and then we'll go through and we'll take a break. So we want to look for long connections. That was the problem. We want to look for individual connection time as well as cumulative communication time. One of the things we need to wrap our brains around is well, how much data are we looking at? In other words, if we have a five minute packet capture, this is a useless exercise. 
looking for long connections in a, in a packet capture that ran for five minutes doesn't do me any good because I'm going to have tons of stuff in there that I don't have to worry about. There'll be a ton of false positives. If it's an hour long, okay, that's a little better. I won't get as many false positives. I'll still have some. If it's five hours long, 12 hours long, 24 hours long, okay, now it starts to become a little bit more useful to go in and actually look for long connections. So one of the things I need to understand is when does this capture file begin and when does it end? The tool that'll help you do that is Cap Infos. This is part of the T-Shark Wireshark toolkit. So when you install T-Shark, you'll get this tool. And Cap Infos, if I don't use any command line switches, it gives me a ton of information. So notice, so notice this is identifying um, Here's the file name, here's the length of time, start stop time, what's the file format, you know, what was the what's the size of the file, um, you know, what was the data rate on the network when this was created? Here are different hash file values for this PCAP file. It gives me a ton of information. How many e interfaces were capturing traffic to create this file? There's a ton of information that pops up here. But the ones I only really care about are this information here. Actually, let me clear the screen, pull that back up. AUE. So this goes through and this will show me, uh, and really I only need one or the other. What I want to know is how long did this capture file run for? Well, this is telling me here's when it started, right? So on June 4th, 2020 at this time, and here's where it ended. Now notice it ended two seconds shy of a full 24 hour period of time. I can see that here too. 86,400 seconds is 24 hours. So notice we have 86,398.49. So I'm missing about a second and a half of data to be a full 24 hour PCAP. Okay, fine, we'll call this 24 hours. So now when I go in and I look for my long connections, anything that shows up close to that 86,400 seconds time frame. That's something that was running all day. Okay, top of the hour, this is our extended break. So we're actually gonna take a 20 minute break this time. So at 20 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll pick up from here and keep going. So go ahead and keep going with the laps.
And we are back. Uh, so we're doing the first lab. So like I said, if you look at this slide, not sure what to do, the next one's the hints, the next one after that is commands, after that is the answers. I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to go through this.
All right. So in the uh, Discord chat channel, I put uh, each of the commands you need to be able to go through and do the lab. If you format formatted yours a little bit differently, uh, don't sweat it. Meaning that some of these you can do them in a slightly different order. Uh, so let's go through and let's kind of talk about some of these. So um, actually, let me go right back to the beginning. So when I first log in, clear the screen. Here we go. So when I first log in, I'm going to be in the root of my home directory. If I type the ls command, that'll list out all of the things that are located in this directory location. And I've got the install tool here. You can safely ignore that. Here are the three that we're most interested in, lab one, lab two, lab three. Don't worry about whether you have the other files that are located here, like the install tool, the key, TCAP lab. That was just kind of part of building up this VM. It's the lab one, lab two, lab three that we're looking for. So the first command I can run is I can say CD, I have a couple of ways to do this. I can say CD space lab one, and that'll get me into that directory. Or I can do an absolute path where I can say a tilde lab one. And what that's good for is the CD space lab one only works when I'm in my uh, the directory one above it. If I'm someplace else, like if I'm in the uh, ETC, well, I have to spell ETC, right? Say I'm in the ETC directory. When I do that, uh, absolute path, that'll automatically jump me back to my home directory, get me into the lab one directory. So your prompt should look like this with the lab one directory specification in order for this to work. The second command I ran was I went through and I looked to see what was the, uh, what was the duration of this file, right? We talked about that right before we went on break. And we said 86,400 seconds, that's a full 24 hours. So we're just shy, a second and a half shy of 24 hours here. That's perfectly fine. So now we know any long connections we see that look like they're running 86,400 session, seconds, that ran for the entire day. That ran for the entire uh, period of the capture file. So the first problem or the first challenge was to go in and find the 10 longest connection durations. We had two things we could work with the Zeek log files or the PCAP file. You want to use the Zeek log files. The reason is while the PCAP has all the raw traffic in it, trying to figure out how do you like capture the timing for each individual session is going to be a real challenge to try and do with the command line. With Zeek, it's easy because Zeek's con.log file, uh, and actually let's take a look at that. So if I say, uh, if I look at the con.log file, there's a couple of fields I'm interested in here. I'm interested in this one, which is the source IP. Actually, let me clean up those columns. So I'm gonna say cat con.log, and then I'm gonna pipe that through column, and I'm gonna say dash T. Um, oh, need to pipe it, there we go. And then I'm gonna pipe it through less space dash capital S. So we looked at this command a little bit earlier. And then this is just gonna kind of clean everything up and give me columns, I can say. So the columns that I'm actually interested in is my source IP address. Um, yeah, that went, that went bogus. If my timestamp is here, it should be over here. So, okay, so that didn't do a very good job of formatting things. That's weird. Uh, oh, maybe that. Chris, the far left column where you see TS, if you look yep. to its left, it says fields. And so it, that's the label for the line. You have fields and types. So really you have to go and shift everything one column to the left. Oh, TS yeah. and time are the left-hand column. UID and string are the second column and so on. Yeah, okay. Yep, thanks, dude. No problem. Okay, got it. So yeah, the fields we want to see, ID.RIG underscore H, that's my source IP id.resp.h, uh, that's my destination IP. And if I scroll over to the right a little bit here, I have my duration field. So this is how long that connection took place for. And notice some of these are identified as a dash, which means there was no connection duration for those. Okay, so that's the data I have to work with. So now if I go back and look at the command I'm running, I'm saying Z cut. So I'm saying these are the fields I want to extract out telling Zcut, I want the source IP address, 
id.org underscore h. That was that column title for the source IP. So I just use the column titles here to tell it what data I want to extract out. I want the source IP, I want the destination IP, and then I want the duration. Pretty easy. I only just want to grab those three fields. And then I'm saying, uh, so let's do what I was telling you about before. Let's go in and let's say, let's just print out that first command. So when I do that, you can see there's my data, but everything just scrolls by on the screen, right? So I've got the right data that I need. Now I just need to organize it the way I wanted to see it. And the way I wanted to see it was I want to see the top 10 connections. So I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to run that through sort. And I don't want to sort starting at the left-hand side because that's the source IP address. I want to sort it based on the third column, which is my duration, my time. So I'm going to say sort based on uh, three. So let me go through and do that. And you can see, okay, it did that, right? Now I'm getting my time interval here. But notice I have 89 seconds and then I have eight seconds, right? What happened there? It's processing it as alphanumeric characters. And a nine comes before a period in the, in the hierarchy. So I need to tell it, no, 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 don't process that alphanumerically. I want you to process that as dash n numeric values. Now let me try it again. When I do that, oh, hey, look, this is better, right? Because see the numbers are going up. So that's what I want to say. But I only want to see the top 10. Well, I could do it this way and then look at the bottom 10. But an easier way to do it is to say reverse the sort order, right? Now when I do it, it should go from highest to lowest. And see my lowest are there's no connection duration at all. Okay, so I don't want to see all the data scrolling by. I just want to see my top 10 entries. Well, that's what the head command does for me. So now I reversed it so that my bigger number's at the top, and I'm saying only print out the top 10 lines. Here's what I was interested in. So I have one connection here, 86,389 seconds. Okay, that's really close to a full 24 hours. So as far as what's here for long connections that I need to worry about, it's just this first entry. If I go to the second entry here, right? Look at the duration here, 243 seconds, that's it. Okay, that's not much, right? That's four minutes. Four minutes isn't anything to worry about. You know, that could be a you know decent sized file. That's not a big deal. So how many long connections do I need to worry about? It's this one. So my next thing to do would be to say, okay, can I find out what application running on that system made this connection? If so, I would do that first. If not, now I'd start looking at, okay, what is that IP address? You know, I'd also, I might go back into con.log. Let's copy that, right? And now I'm gonna use my grep command. So this isn't in the book. We'll, we'll cover this, or in the slides, we'll cover this just a little bit. But I'm going to say grep that IP address out of con.log, and I'm going to pipe it through head just to see the first 10 lines of output, because I want to say, okay, so this connection's been running a long time. What is it? And this comes back, and this tells me that this is traffic that is TCP traffic going to port 9,200. And see this dash here? That's the application layer. So it's Zeke saying, I don't know what the application is. Now that's not surprising. So this is a 24 hour capture and this connection has been running those full 24 hours. See this identification here, OTH? Zeke will tell you what TCP flags did I see set in that, in that packet, or excuse me, during that session. OTH means I didn't see the start or the stop of the session. Typically to identify what the application was, Zeke needs to see the start of the session because right after the three packet hand, TCP three packet handshake takes place, that's when you'll see a client signature go by or stuff like that. Um, so again, uh, because we didn't see that, it can't identify the application layer. But this is telling me, yeah, it's going to port 9200. That's kind of an odd port, right? So that tells me a little bit more about it. So I have this one thing I need to run down that's going to 9200 and it's this IP address all on the internet, so I may want to go in and start looking up into that. Okay, so that was my long connections, right? So my next one was, I wanted to look at cumulative communication time. 
And this is where the command gets kind of complex <clears throat> because I'm catting con.log. I'm using Zeek to cut out the same fields I did up here, you know, source, destination, IP address, and duration. I'm sorting the data. So let me go back and let's just go to, so we saw what it looked like when we just printed everything out. So now I'm sort, telling it sort the data. So what does that do for me? Well, notice when the source and the destination IP address are the same, it gets them together next to each other line by line. Um, I'm going to pump this through less just so we can kind of page through it. So you can see here's the source IP address connecting to those destination IPs, the broadcast address. Here's this IP talking to that IP. Um, so as I scroll through, notice anytime the source and destination IP address match, it just puts them one line after the other. Cool. All right. What was the next command we had? The next command we had was grep dash V dash E single quote caret dollar sign single quote what's this do this removes any blank lines from the data output so if <clears throat> let's say zeke had a blank line and it may be at the very end of the data or something like that that would go in and remove that line out okay what's the second one do well if i go back let's see if we look at this data here some of these had a dash associated with them. Say we've got all this data here where the duration field is a dash and data mash wants a number and a dash obviously is not a number. So we need to pull those out. So this correct grep command says everything but if you see a dash on the line someplace. Now we're never going to see a dash as part of the source IP or the destination IP. The only time it would show up is under duration. So if it sees that, pull that data out. So once we go through and do that, the data isn't going to look that different to what we have coming up, right? It's just if there's any blank lines or anything with a zero duration, that just automatically got removed. Okay, what are we doing next? Next, we're running it through data mesh. We're telling data mesh when the source IP address field, when this first field and the second field match, just like we see here on the screen, sum up the values in the third column. So for what you see on the screen right now, the IPv6 address is the same source IP address going to the same multicast address every time. So it would add up all these duration fields. Let's look at that. So notice before I saw this line listed out multiple times. Now I only see it once with a single duration listed and that's it. But notice my durations are not in order. Right? This one's longer than that one, and then it drops back down again and then goes back up. I want to fix these so that the duration times are closer together, or that the uh, duration times are highest to smallest, just like we looked at before. Well, this is the command we used for that, sort dash K, three. So we said sort on that third column, the duration field, dash RN, reverse sort, biggest to smallest, identify it as a numeric value, and pump it through head just says print out the first 10 lines. So let's look at these two side by side. So let me go back to, uh, this one. So this is my top 10 duration times. Actually, let me cut these down a little bit just so I can fit them all on the screen. Well, actually I can do this. This will fit them all on the screen, make that a little bit bigger. There we go. So my longest time before was 86,389 seconds. That's still true when I add, try and add stuff up. So nothing beat my top talker there. Before, we said our second longest connection was only about four minutes long. Well, once we start adding things up, notice what we ended up with here. We ended up with a little over 4,000 seconds. That's not quite the 20,000 seconds that I said, if it's 20,000 seconds or more for a duration, you should pay attention to it. But you can clearly see, yeah, there was more communication going on than we originally thought, right? And then down here, we've got some multicast traffic taking place. Uh, IPv6 transmits out to the multicast address a lot. So you can see that's fairly extensive here as well. Also notice that uh, after my first two, everything after that was like three minutes or less. 
well, we don't even get down to three minutes in our top 10 when we go, go in and we look at cumulative duration time. <clears throat> so again, so we wanted to see longest connection, longest communication time. So I gave you hints on what to use and where. Here are all those commands and I pasted them into the chat channel as well. I think they already scrolled by on the top, but if you want to copy paste them out, feel free. Uh, or you can grab them out of the slides, whatever works for you. And then I went through and gave you the answers. So here are the fields you need to extract. Here's what you need to be able to do with them. And then I gave you, you know, here's what the output looks like. Here's how we figured out what fields to use. Um, I use cap infos to find out how long that file was. I have run into situations where somewhere around 50, 60, 70 gigs. If you have a PCAP that is 50, 60, 70 gigs or bigger, cap info is just pukes on it. It's just too big for it to process the data. Hmm. You can use this TCP dump command instead, and that'll print out the timestamp for the first packet in the PCAP and the last packet in the PCAP, and then you can do the math yourself to figure out how long of a capture file you have. But cap infos is easier if you can get it. But we went through this together. You know, we know we have a 24-hour capture. <clears throat> and then here I said, this is the only one that's really worth worrying about because it's the full 24 hours. And then when we went in and looked at cumulative time, that showed us some longer connections were taking place. But I mentioned five, five and a half hours or more is really what I want to see for, to analyze it as a long connection. And we only got up to 4,000 seconds here. So we're in pretty good shape there. <clears throat> okay, so this connection wasn't quite that 20,000 seconds that I talked about, but I said, just so we're looking at more than one IP address, let's investigate both of them. So I tagged this IP address that ran all day, and then this one, just because it was the second one in there. And I said, okay, let's kind of dive in and do some investigation work on this. <clears throat> one of the things we can do is we can use the host command from the Linux command line. So I can say host space and IP address to say what is known about that. Here's two websites you can use to look up these IP addresses to say what's there. So we've seen, we've got two IPs we tagged as potential long connections. Now we're trying to, we know there's persistency of connection. Now what we want to figure out, is there a business need? How do we figure that out? Well, if we know what the user was trying to get to when they went there, that might help us figure that out. If we know uh, what's associated with the external IP, that might help us figure it out. So that's what we're going to do next. So go in, give this one a shot. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to work through it, and then we'll talk about it. Uh, the class VM doesn't have X windows installed because that would have taken up a lot more storage. So you're going to have to run these from your host system as opposed to within the VM. I'll give you a couple of minutes to go through that.
All right, this one was pretty straightforward. So let's talk about this one a bit. <clears throat> so the first tool I said you could use is the host parameter. So I just said host space in my first IP address. And it came back and said, oh, hey, that points at this domain here. Well, now I have to figure out what is AIHhosted.com? Is that an organization that we're doing business with? Is there a reason why this connection should be taking place? <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I will answer that um, this is Active Countermeasures, our organization. So if you're one of our customers and you saw this, that might be expected behavior. You know, you could say, oh yeah, hey, I recognize who that organization is. We use their software. You may want to ask, okay, what is that data that's going back there? That's something that you might want to resolve. Is it appropriate for that to be happening? That's something we see a lot, by the way, you know, where folks will go in and they'll start analyzing connections. And what they find is that software they've purchased is in constant communications back to the manufacturer. And they may not have known that was actually taking place. Um, that allows them to kind of stop and ask them, so what's in this data stream? And do I feel comfortable with that? And if not, maybe I got to go in and set up a firewall rule so that traffic can't get out. So let's assume that's a known business partner, that connection's okay. So this first IP address is looking all right. And then I did a host lookup on that second IP address and nothing came back. Which Now, that just means there's no PTR record association pointing to a specific host name. It happens, it's not rare, but it's not something to freak out about either. It just means, yeah, okay, this isn't gonna be really helpful to me. So for this first thing, trying the host command, it gave us some additional information about the first IP address, but not about the second IP address. Okay, the second thing I gave you was a couple of websites you could go and investigate this through. <clears throat> so abuse IPDB comes back and tells us that IP address is run by Microsoft. It's part of, in other words, they're saying Microsoft is responsible for the autonomous system number, the ASN, which is the group of IP addresses that this IP address is part of. You know, domain name, Microsoft.com, here's where they're located, and there's no abuse associated with this IP that's on record. In other words, there haven't been other people who have filed into this data set to say, hey, I saw it doing this type of malicious traffic. So that tells me a little bit more about it too. <clears throat> Threat Crowd is where it kind of uh, kind of becomes helpful because Threat Crowd does a couple of things for me. The the one that's the most useful to me is this right hand side because on this right hand side it says this IP address has been associated with this fully qualified domain name as of this specific date. So notice this goes back you know, over a year's worth of information. Now, if I look back over that last year, it's always been mp.microsoft.com. So even though, well, actually this one here is different, but that's actually their CDN services. It's still mp.microsoft.com. It's just running through their CDN. So this has always been associated with Microsoft that whole time. And it seems to have the same type of functionality to it. That makes me feel a little bit warmer, fuzzier. This is actually Microsoft traffic. Now, what's all this mean? <laughs> this is kind of a graphic representation of all the different related uh, sites to this one. <clears throat> like what else might be within this ASN space that's been resolved? What else is associated with this particular domain? Like this was Microsoft.com, <clears throat> not Hotmail.com, but Hotmail is also registered by domains at microsoft.com. So that pops up as a data point here. <clears throat> so that tells me, okay, whoever's managing microsoft.com, the domain that this IP address is part of, is also managing hotmail.com. And that might be useful information to me to kind of figure out, do I trust this or not? In this case here, yeah, right? Because we know Microsoft owns Hotmail. I would expect to see them managing Hotmail too. I might be more nervous if I didn't see that right? So sometimes you can pull out some inf interesting information out of all of these interconnections. Uh, one I've seen before is <clears throat> you, uh, you do this investigation and it points back to a known pen testing company. Okay, now you know there's a red team running against your environment and they're the ones who set up this domain. 
because they use the same registrar service and the same account to register their red teaming domain that they use for the main corporate domain as well. Hmm. Just something to kind of keep an eye out for. All right, so the first one we said at aihhosted.com, we assumed, yeah, we know there's a business connection with that. <laughs> But this IP address, it looks like it's Microsoft calling. But can we verify that? Yeah, actually, we can. So there's a couple of things I can do. So I can take that IP address. Let's go through a few things here. So I'm going to take that IP address. And I'm going to say, grep, con.log, uh, that IP address. And I'm going to pump it through head and say, just show me the first five lines of output. Um, oh, <laughs> also if I do it in the right order. Grep this IP address out of con.log. So see, if you've typoed and you're saying, wow, I feel really bad for doing typos, watch me do them too. <laughs> it happens. <clears throat> okay, so what's con.log telling me? It's telling me that that IP address, excuse me, we have an internal IP address, 192.168.99.51. They were the ones talking to this external IP. And it was a TCP SSL connection that was going to, and it kind of line wraps here, TCP 443. So that's our well-known port for HTTPS. And then it's identifying it as SSL. So remember, Zeek is application aware. It would not label it as SSL unless it saw that SSL client hello, server hello, digital certificate get exchanged. But now I know it's SSL traffic. So what that tells me is I can also wrap that IP address in the SSL.log file and pull information out from there. When I go through and do that, Here's the common name, part of Microsoft.com, issued to Microsoft. So this looks like it's pro, and if um, if Zeek is set up to go in and automatically validate these certificates for me, you know, this tells me, okay, micro, this was a valid Microsoft certificate they were talking to. So now it's not just that that IP is part of Microsoft, it has a digital certificate installed on it that was issued to Microsoft itself. So that can kind of help make it a little bit more trustworthy for us. The other thing we can go in and query is we have a DNS.log file as well, right? Remember we said users should be looking things up and then going to that IP address. So this is telling me that that IP address came back as an answer as part of this look up here. Array.503.prod.do.dspmpmmicrosoft.com. Great. Okay, that, get a little less data here. So if I look at my CN, that should match what was being queried, and it does. In other words, we did a DNS lookup to get an IP address. We connected to that IP address. We got a digital certificate, right? So here's what we looked up in DNS. Here's what came back for a digital certificate. Those should match, and in this case, they do. This was array53.prod.do.dsp.mp.microsoft.com. The digital certificate was issued to any host that's part of prod.do.dsp.mp.microsoft.com. Okay, that jives. So this looks like, to me, it's a legitimate Microsoft system. Did Zeek, does Zeek create the SSL log file and DNS log files? Absolutely it does. So uh, let me take a look at the con.log file again, right? So remember we said con.log is the main log file. If I scroll over to the right, I can see what applications were decoded at the, uh, were decoded traveling across the network. So DNS here doesn't just mean it went to UDP 53. It means I saw DNS headers in there. HTTP doesn't just mean it's our going to TCP 80. It's saying I saw headers in there. So I have HTTP, I have DNS. Uh, let's see if I can spot something else real quick. 
uh, DHCP, right? SSL traffic. What Zeek is going to do is every time it sees one of those applications, it's then going to create an application specific file. So when it sees SSL traffic, it will record additional application layer information about that connection in the SSL.log file. <clears throat> when it sees DNS, it's going to put additional application information in the DNS.log file. Same thing with HTTP. Um, anything it doesn't know what to do with, it'll put here. X509 is information about the digital certificates that were exchanged as part of the SSL TLS connections. So yeah, as it's so notice I don't have an ssh.log file. That's because it didn't see any SSH traffic in this PCAP. But had there been any there, it would have recorded that here as well. Hmm. Okay. Get that out of the way. So yeah, so it looks like we're looking at legitimate traffic talking to Microsoft. Um, also, <clears throat> so in the SSL.log file, right, we got back this information we were looking at. One of the things it did is I came up with a unique identifier for this SSL session. If I look for that number within the X509 log file, That'll show me what was on the digital certificate that was used as part of that SSA, SSL session. So they kind of go together. The X509, for the most part, tends to be your SSL information if you're looking at traffic going out to the internet. It just puts it into a different log file to kind of keep things neat and organized, if you will. So both of our long connections look okay. The first one looks like there's a business need associated with it because it's a partner. The second one looks like it's connection, connecting back to Microsoft. This is a Windows system that's expected behavior. All right, for our next lab, which we'll do when we come back from break, we're gonna go through and we're gonna look for, <clears throat> excuse me, we're gonna look for beacons based on session size. Now, there's two ways to look for beacons. We can look based on timing, or we can do it based on session size. Timing's hard, right? Even though Zeke goes through and records when every session started, to go through and try and calculate that versus the delta the next time those same two IP addresses connected up and to do that on the command line, it, it's painful. It's really painful. So we're not gonna do that. But what we are gonna do is we're gonna do two things. We're gonna take a look in con.log. We're gonna look for when, when did two IP addresses seem to be talking to each other a lot? In other words, we're looking for when a source IP address connected to the same IP address out on the internet, and did it like a thousand times or more over this 24 hour period of time. If we see that, now let's look at the session size to see is there consistency in that? Do we see consistency in the session size? Because if we do, this could be a beacon and the most consistent session size could potentially be the, uh, could be the uh, heartbeat. Could be that, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. <clears throat> so this will be our next lab. So we're going to take a break. It's the top of the hour. Ten minutes after the top of the hour, we'll come back. We'll jump right back into doing this lab. Hey, actually, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll answer it when we come back. There's a question about um if we whitelist a vendor and then they get compromised like in the solar winds attack does that mean we'll miss it not necessarily and i'll talk about why when we come back
All right, we are back. <laughs> so, uh, sorry, a couple questions go by in Discord. I wanted to go through and hit one, and they both kind of revolve around whitelisting. So, the first is, um, how do you do whitelisting with Rita? Rita doesn't have any built in capability for that. So, there's two ways you can kind of deal with it. The first is you can do it with packet filtering. So, one of the uh, log files, let me clean up my screen here. <clears throat> So one of the log files that gets created is packet underscore filter dot log. You can feed Zeek BP filters. So I'm going to show the ca uh, contents of that file. <clears throat> and it has one rule in it here for this particular capture that says, you know, the traffic that Zeek is capturing is IP or not IP. That is the question, right? IP or not to IP? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, what that basically means is it's capturing everything. But if I find an IP address that um, I've gone in and I've identified as being okay, like that Microsoft address, I could go in and I could create a BP filter that says, you know, destination host this IP, you know, and don't capture that traffic. That's fine. The challenge is, what if you're wrong? In other words, what if you figure out later, oh shoot, I should have, I shouldn't have created that whitelist entry. Well, the problem is you created a BP filter, which means you told Zeek ignore anything associated with that host, which means you don't have the data to fall back on. The other way you can do it, and this is something we cover in the advanced class, is you can go in and you can say, okay, take the Rita output, the Zeek output from my command, whatever output it is that I'm processing, and then pass it through a grep command that removes any entries that are associated with an IP address that you've whitelisted earlier. So now, for example, that long connection output would take that long connection output, pass it through this filter, and then display it. And now what we would get back is everything that we haven't created an exception for in the past. The nice thing about doing it that way is the data is still there. So let's say we do that and we realize, oh, hey, that whitelist entry or that exception entry we created a week ago that we shouldn't have, oh no, what do I do now? Well, the data's still there. You've just been choosing not to look at it. So you could actually modify your exception list, remove that entry out of it, go back and review the last week's worth of data and see what would have happened if you had that as part of your analysis. So the first way is the easiest to implement, filter out that any traffic associated with that IP. The second way will keep you from shooting yourself in the foot. The other question I saw come through was, hey, so if I create an exception for something, like the solar winds attack, if I went in and created a whitelist entry for, um, <clears throat> for the company itself, does that mean I would have missed a compromise like that? And the answer is probably not. So we actually had customers catch this, right? What changed was where that host was communicating out to. When it was calling back to Solar Winds, they created a whitelist entry for that, or they created an exception for that that said, "Hey, when my Solar Wind systems calls back to the Solar Winds network, that's okay. I don't want to see it." And you know that traffic no longer shows up in the threat hunts. But what happened is, is once the malicious code got on the system. It started beaconing out to a different IP address that wasn't part of Solar Winds. So now that showed up. So now they got to see, hey, my Solar Wind system used to only beacon to Solar Winds, and we created an exception for that earlier. Now it's beaconing out to this different IP address. And when I run that down, that's a public address space that has nothing to do with Solar Winds. What the hell is going on here? So yeah, if you create a whitelist entry like that, unless they completely, totally compromise that environment. Like, let's say they set up their C2 server within SolarWinds environment. Yeah, okay, that you would probably miss. But they're probably not gonna do that because that's generating more traffic that someone's more likely to see, right? So they're gonna send the C2 traffic someplace different. You don't have an exception list for that different address. You would still be able to go in and catch that. Um, let's see what else we got. Chris is correct. My earlier comment was wrong. Bill, you weren't wrong. You know, it was just, it, it's, it, it's granulars, right? Like I said, if they've totally compromised solar winds and put their C2 server there, you're right. You're going to miss that attack. 
Uh, but if they put it someplace else, yeah, okay, now you are actually going to catch it. So it's one of those it depends answers, right? There's never a 100% always truthful. It always kind of depends on the conditions. All right. So I also saw some questions around like the session size and why are we analyzing that? So like I said, there's two ways to look for a beacon based on timing or ba based on consistency and timing or based on consistency and session size, how much data is getting transferred. Timing to calculate that manually is really hard because again, I could go in and I could look at my, you know, let me pull this back up. So I could go into con.log, right? And here's my timestamp for all the start of all my connections. Let's make this easier to read. Here's my timestamp for all of my connections, right? So like here's 99.51. So let's say that went out to the same destination IP address each time. Well, now I would have to look, I would have to go in and say, okay, what was the timestamp for the first connection? What was the timestamp for the second connection? What's the delta between the two? Now, how does that compare between the delta time connect between the second connection and this third connection? And fig doing that manually on the command line, it's a pain in the backside. It really is. Um, and it's something you never want to have to do. So we could go looking for it based on timing, but the manual process to try to do that is, in is incredibly hard. So we're going to skip that. The other way to look for a session size, or excuse me, beacons, it's based on session size. So if I see a lot of connections going by, if there's consistency in that session size, that may make it something worth going in and paying attention to. In other words, if I see the size is all over the place all the time and there's no real consistency to it, that's probably not connection persistency. That's probably not something I have to worry about. But if I see that there's some pretty consistent connection sizes, that could be indicative of a heartbeat of a, of a C2 session. That may be something worth paying attention to. So let me give you a couple of more minutes to go through this one, and then I'll go through and I'll cover it with you. Someone asked the question, are we still in the lab one directory? Yes, we are. So we're still working with the same set of data that we did with that first lab. So we're still working with that same stuff. Give you another minute or two and then we'll cover this. All right, so we wanted to analyze these based on session size. The next question is, okay, so which connections should we analyze for session size? 
because we're gonna to have to scrutinize the individual pair. We're gonna to need to look at only the traffic going between those two IPs. There's probably hundreds of IP pairs within this file, if not more. How do we know which ones to scrutinize? And we said that what we're gonna do for now is we're just gonna go in and look to see, hey, anytime I've got an internal system that connects a lot to a host out on the internet, that's something that's worth going in and paying attention to. So how do I figure out who's connecting to who most often? Here's what I did. I said cat con.log, run that through zcut, and I will tell in zcut I want the source IP address and um, the destination IP address, and then I want to run it through sort. So again, let's do what we were talking about before, where I'm going to go in and I'm just going to say, all right, we're going to uh, pull these out one at a time. So I'm going to go through and run this first. Okay, here's all my connection pairs in here right, all in the order that they happened within the PCAP file. There's no additional data. I'm just looking at who was talking to who and when. Okay, great. Now what's the next thing I did? The next thing I did is I went in and I sorted that data. What did that do? <clears throat> that made sure that anytime the source IP and the destination IP address were the same, those lines showed up one after the other. So if I page back up through this data, There's a lot of it, lots of broadcast traffic. Here we go, here's one. You can see anytime all the lines are the same, they're one right after the other. So uh, that gets all the connections together, great. Now what did we do? The next thing I did is I put it through unique-c. What did that do for us? Okay, let me run that command. That went up and said, okay, rather than printing out all those lines, add them up. So this is telling me that this IP address connected to that IP address 319 times. This IP address connected to that IP address two times. So now I get to see how often did one of my internal systems create a session with another IP address. Then I just said, okay, this number here, I want it sorted highest to lowest. So I said sort dash rn. This is a numeric value. I want to sort r reverse order high to low. Pump it through head. Show me the first 10 lines of output. That's how we. So that's where this data is coming from. Now, if I look at this data, I have 3,000 plus connections from this internal private address going to 104, 248, 234, 238. Okay, that's a lot of connections, right? 3,000 that's something that's worth paying attention to. After that, this is going to a multicast address. That's going to a multicast, uh, IPv6 multicast address. This is going to an IPv4 multicast address. Multicast, 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 multicast. It isn't until I get down into here. So this one was 297 connections that went to an IP address out on the internet. Now we're saying, we said anything more than 1,000 is worth looking at. Well, wait a minute, Chris, can't we have a beacon that's only going off like once per hour or twice per hour, in which case we'll have like 50 or less in a day? Yeah, we could. Well, wouldn't we miss that with this method? Yeah, we would. This is, remember earlier I said methodology versus actual implementation. I just want to teach you what should be happening behind the screen scenes. This is one of the examples of that. <clears throat> because to try and scrutinize every pair would just take us way too long manually. We need a tool to automate it, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But for now, we're going through it as a manual process. So this internal IP, when it was talking to that, there was a lot of connections taking place, over a thousand. So now what we want to look at, okay, was the data size, the amount of data being transferred consistent each time? Because that could be an indication that we're looking at a heartbeat on a C2 session. So how do I get that? I'm uh, not using that command. <laughs> Let me pull this up for you. Sorry, just being lazy rather than having to type out the whole thing. Here we go. So I'm saying cat con.log, right? Z cut, extract those IP addresses. And this time I'm including ORIG underscore bytes. What's that? That is how many bytes of data the internal system sent to the external system. Now I could look at the number of bytes that came back instead. I could look at either or and check them for consistency. I like to check original bytes 
because it represents how much data is my internal system sending out to the internet. That number is a little bit more important to me than how much data is the internet sending to this system. I should, if there's a deviation, if let's say it's a C2 channel and somebody sends through a command, I'm gonna see a deviation in the size in both of them, right? So either one will work. But uh, bytes leave in the network, that one's just a little bit closer to home for me. Now I only wanna see that data when this is the source IP and that's the destination IP. So I said, grep, look for the first IP, grep, look for the second IP. Now sort it, unique see it, sort it dash RN. So that, you know, sort unique sort, You'll notice I do that a lot. That's similar to what we just ran in the last command. So the only thing I've really added in is the ability to say only I'm only interested when it's these two when these two IP addresses are involved in the conversation. And when I run it through that, I just get back one line. And this tells me that for those 3,011 connections, 477 bytes were sent from the client to the server every single time. Okay, that's obviously consistent, right? That could be a heartbeat for a beacon signal. So the next thing I would wanna go through and run down is like we did before, what is this external host? What application is running on this system that did this? This is something that makes it worth paying attention to. All right. And I gave you the slides for this. So I kind of talked you through in the hints what to look for. I gave you those exact commands that we just ran. I said, yep, over a thousand here. So that makes it worth taking a look at. And when I go in and did my analysis, the session size is very consistent. This could be a heartbeat that's part of a C2 session. Now, we could start running down the endpoint, right? That was one of the things we did before. If we think back, what do we do with the first, first set of checks we did on long connections? We started running down what was that endpoint, was there any host information associated with it? And we would want to do that here too. But I also wanted to kind of take a slightly different tact on it, which is, hey, we're sending data to this host out on the internet all the time. What is that data? What data are we sending it? We can do that analysis with ngrep. We could also use Zeek logs, right? Zeek logs will work too. But I wanted to pull ngrep out so we can use that. So here's what we want to do. Oh, here's what we're doing. We're using ngrep to go in and analyze when that when these two IP addresses are talking to each other. ngrep uses the host parameter to create a filter. So I would want to tell ngrep when host 192.168.99.51 and host 104.248.234.238, when those two values match, when they hope when the source or destination IP addresses those two IP addresses, what's the payload look like? And ngrep should be able to produce that for us. So go in, give this one a shot. I'll give you a couple minutes and then we'll go through and cover it together.
So this one was really a matter of just kind of referring back to the ngrip command I gave you and then seeing what was there. Um, and I ran the command slightly differently here just because I wanted to show you the command and some of the output first, and I'll explain that in just a second. But here's what we're doing. So I'm saying ngrep dash Q. Remember, if we don't do the dash Q, anytime it doesn't see a match, it's going to print out a pound symbol, and we want to avoid that. So that's what the dash Q is doing for us. We're reading in the PCAP file. We're saying the host, host 192.168.99.1. What this means is that the source or the destination IP address has to match this value for this statement to be true. And host 104.248.234.238. So that IP address also has to be the source or destination. So what this filter is doing is saying these two IP addresses have to be in either the source or the destination in order for this to match. So the only traffic we'll see is traffic going back between the two of them. And then I pumped it through head, the command I gave you in the book pumped it through less. And I'll use less in a minute, but I wanted to use head just to print out the first 10 lines so you could see what the beginning of the output looks like. So this says, okay, I'm gonna retrace 1.pcap, and my filter is, notice here's the filter we created here. It's gotta be uh, those two IP addresses. And here's our first match. So this is saying it's a TCP packet. It was going from our internal IP address, this upper port number, to this destination IP address, port 80. And here's what we see in the payload. So there's a couple of components here. First, here's the get request that was sent out by this client. That's a kind of long get request, right? That looks kind of weird. Um, it's also kind of weird in that it's not getting like an index.html file or something like that. It's just a, it looks like a call to a directory that would cause the index.html file in that directory to run. Um, it, 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 it looks kind of weird the way they went through and did it. Um, this is an HTTP 1.1 connection. This thing, yeah, I can do text, I can do HTML, I can do images. Um, User agent string, Mozilla 4, okay, that's kind of old. Windows 7, okay, that's kind of old. Java 1.7.0, oh, please tell me I don't have that running on any of my internal systems. But that's something that I can kind of key in on with this. My user agent string should reflect whatever is associated with this internal IP address. So if I know my internal system is running Windows 10, but the user agent string is identifying it as Windows 7, I got a problem, right? Why is it misrepresenting itself? My host shouldn't be doing that. Maybe it's an application running on that system that I don't know is there that's doing it manually. So that's something that's definitely worth going in and paying attention to. The other thing that catches my attention here is this. Notice the host parameter. It's an IP address. Uh, was the please know Java because of the version or just because of Java? Uh, a little of both, but definitely mostly because of the version. <laughs> Java has been known to have problems. Anything does. If we don't need it, we shouldn't have it there. If we need it, yeah, okay, we need it. We just need to make sure it stays patched up to date. But, the, you know, the, the fact that it wants, you know, it, it's using Java of that version, uh, hopefully none of my systems are running Java there. That's where that came from. But my host parameter here. This is supposed to identify the fully qualified domain name that I was trying to get to when I ended up at this IP address. And it's there for virtual web servers. So it's possible for me to have 50 different web servers running all on the same uh, piece of hardware that has a single IP address assigned to it, and that's it. And the way it works is when a TCP connection comes into that IP address and it tries to do an HTTP connection, the host parameter is supposed to tell me which one of those 50 virtual web servers were am I trying to talk to. Like this should say www.foobar.com. And now the web server would know, oh, I need to pass you to the foobar.com virtual server as opposed to the you know, boff.com virtual server that's one of the other virtual servers. Running. Well, but this doesn't say that. It says an IP address. Your web browser should never do this unless you're 
specifically connecting via URI to an IP address, not a fully qualified domain name, this shouldn't happen. So that these two things together make me really suspicious. So we know that this system connected to that system 3,000 plus times over this 24 hour period of time. And now we know the URI it was sending look kind of odd. The user agent string, hope, you know, let's assume we're not running Windows 7 on that host. So the user agent string is now bogus. Why is that bogus? And the host agent field is now bogus. So this host is generating traffic that should not be coming from legitimate applications. I'm really leaning towards, I've got a serious problem with this internal system. Now, it could be vulnerability scanning software. It could be C2. I don't know what yet. I need to do a little bit more investigation. Um, we're only ever to examine this because it was an HTTPS connection, correct? That is correct. Because this is HTTP, we can see what URI they were requesting. If it was an HTTPS session, we would not see the URI string. So we'd have the SSL hello, the client server hello, the negotiation to go by, and that's it, because we wouldn't get to see the actual data strings going by or the user agent or anything along those lines. So yeah, here I just kind of walked you through it. And you know, we talked about all these different things in here that look like they're weird. Um, if we scroll down a little bit more, we can see that the server says, yep, that's a valid request against me. In other words, this get request with this big long string that we said look weird, the server apparently is okay with that. It thinks that request is perfectly fine. And we see it over and over again. So Zeek also has this information in here as well. And it's gonna store it in the http.log file. Um, let me give you this, because we already kind of covered this with the last one. Let me give you the string, that way you can just kind of do a copy paste on this. And while you're doing that, I will talk you through it. Okay, so that string is in Discord. Let me pull this back up. So do the same. You can just paste in the command so that you have it. Uh, by the way, when you run these commands, they all get stored into this file. I'll show you this in a second here. They all get stored into a file. If I go, uh, if I go back up to the directory above it, if I go back to my home directory, and I do an ls-al, one of the files in here I'm going to see is this one here, dot bash underscore history. <clears throat> all these commands I'm typing are going to get stored to that command. Now, they're not going to be there right away. Meaning if I go through and I cat this out to see what contents are in there, notice this was not the last command I just ran, right? What commands you type get written to this file when you log back out. So where I'm going with this is um, after we get done with the labs today, you know, I'm giving you these commands. If you wanna be able to go in and review the commands you typed, log out of the session, log back in again, and they'll all show up in this bash.history file. So if you wanna see everything you typed as part of typing out, uh, doing these commands, you know, here's the command you type. Go into the home directory, actually I'll give you the full path, because this way it'll work all the time. So if I, and let me throw this into Discord. There. That command's in Discord now. So log out, log in, and you'll see everything you've typed up until now. It only writes it out once you actually log out of the system. Okay, so that's that. So let's get back into the lab one directory and get back to what we were doing. Okay, so here, here's, eh, let me clear the screen so it's the only thing here. There we go. So here I'm catting the http.log file. I'm using zcut to pull out the source IP address, the destination IP, and the URI. What was the data being requested? <clears throat> I'm saying grep that external IP address. So the only log entries it's gonna match on, here, let's do what we were doing before. I'm gonna go through and just grab it to here. The only thing it's gonna match on is when that IP address is the IP address that we're doing this request from. 
So if I run just that portion of the command here, it prints everything out. What I'm looking for is I'm looking at this and I'm saying, are they asking for the same URI over and over again, or are they asking for different URIs? Because that may help me figure out, is this a command and control channel or is this a vulnerability scheme? In other words, this might be one of my internal systems checking this remote web server to see if it has any known to be vulnerable files or known exploits. And the way that'll typically work is if I know uh, bad.html is a web is a uh, page that has some coding issues that'll allow me to execute local commands, I can check the website to see, hey, do you have that, do you have bad HTML on you? And if it comes back and says 404 not found, I know it's not vulnerable to that. If it comes back and says 200 okay, well, I know that file's there, which means it might be vulnerable. I might want to go back and check my vulnerability against it. So if, I'm, if it's checking for different known vulnerabilities, that's a vulnerability scan. But if it's running the same URI over and over again, <clears throat> that's more likely to be something that's command and control based. So what I want to see is, even though if I eyeball it, these URIs look the same, there's a lot of characters here. I could, you know, like maybe an E character halfway through is different. Sometimes it's F. And I'd never pick that up just by eyeballing. So what I want to do is I want to use my command line tools to say, is it actually getting changed? So I'm saying Z cut, cut out the source destination I pay, only match when it's that uh, IP address that I'm interested in. And then I'm saying sort the data, unique see it, sorted RN. Sort unique sort, same thing we talked about before. So this is going to sort it. So all, anytime the URI matches, all those entries are one right after another. Unique dash C will count up how many times we saw each particular pattern. And then the biggest matching patterns will show up at the top. And when I run that, here's what comes back. Let me give a little space in here so it's easier to see. So this is telling me 3,011 times. Hey, remember that number from con.log? That's how many times my system connected to this host. So 3,011 times, this was the URI string that was sent. In other words, we're requesting the same URI string over and over and over and over and over again. That's not a vulnerability scan. That to me says, you know, this isn't someone on that system acting malicious, trying to see, scan and find vulnerabilities on the internet. This is that system is probably compromised. And this is the command and control server checking back in to say, hey, do you have any work for me to do right now? And we know that it's a command and control server that it's talking to because the response code that we saw come back with ngrep was 200 okay. The server looked at this and said, yep, I understand what that means, 200 okay. That tells me it is a legitimate command and control server. It's not just some random web server out on the internet because a random web server would say 404 you know, or 400. I can't find this resource that, of which you speak. I don't know what you're talking about. That's what I would get out of this on a legitimate web server. So we've got a beacon. It's calling out to a server on the internet. It's sending a consistent URI string. This is looking like this is a compromised system. So with our long connections, we had two false positives. But this one, I'm really starting to lean towards, yeah, this looks like it's a compromised system. Um, the other thing was, remember the host parameter showed up, right? Remember when we were looking at the host parameter was an IP address, and I said that should be a fully qualified domain name. Well. Did someone get to this based on fully qualified domain name? In other words, if I go in and DNS.log, I would expect to see a query for that. And yeah, I don't. If I use the host command to see what's associated with it, yeah, that comes back with nothing. That's not legit for a website, right? Web, people make websites accessible and they try to make them accessible. You're not going to leave it out of your DNS and everything else. So this makes it really suspicious to me. So uh, Houston, I think we got a problem. So here's those same data results that we just talked about. So it's doing that same one over and over again. Okay, so how do I run this down? Well, now I would look at where is that IP address located? Do, is it associated with a business partner? Probably not. Uh, the other thing I did is I said, okay, in that URI request, the directory name, this portion of the string right here, that's kind of unique. That might be something worth doing a search for. So I just went out and used Google. And when I Googled that string, it came back and said, oh, hey, Fiesta EK malware uses that string. 
is part of the command and control channel. Yeah, okay. Now we know that box is whack. It's got Fiesta EK malware on it. It is time to go in an incident response mode. We now need to figure out what do we do with that box? Do we want to isolate it? Do we want to take it offline? What is it we want to do? The first thing I would want to do before I took that box offline or did anything is I'd want to look to see, are any of my other internal hosts talking to that IP address? One of the things we find consistently is when an attacker gets in, they move laterally and they compromise other systems. The idea is when they have control of one of your internal systems, that connectivity is brittle. Take that one box offline and they've lost access to your network and they don't want that to happen. So they'll move laterally, compromise additional systems, get them to call back out to the same command and control server, but they'll do it at a much slower time interval. So where this thing went off 3,000 times in a day, the secondary systems they've compromised might only call home like four times in the course of a day, and that's it. So now what I want to do is I want to go back and look to see, is anybody else talking to that IP address? Because if they are, they're probably compromised too, which means if I take this, this source IP address system, if I take that offline, the attackers might become privy that I'm onto them and they may start getting malicious or you know doing bad things or you know whatever. I don't want to let give them any indication I'm on to them until I can take all those systems offline at the same time. That way they have no additional access to my network. All right. So that was the lab one directory. Now let's go to the lab two directory. And in the lab two directory, we want to check to see if there's any potential command and control in play. I covered this in a couple of, a couple of times earlier. So remember what we're looking for is how many unique queries am I seeing taking place in each, in each uh, domain. And as we said, for the average domain, I would expect a query like 10 hosts or less. If it gets into the hundreds for a domain I don't recognize, that's worth paying attention to. If it's a domain I recognize, like Amazon, Microsoft, you know, Google, whatever the case may be, I might see a couple hundred. I don't expect to see anything in the thousands. So if I see stuff in the thousands, that's stuff that's worth paying attention to. So if you see any domains where there's more than a thousand queries taking place, uh, that's worth going in and paying attention to. So what I want you to do is to go in and look at um, the Zeek logs, specifically the DNS.log file, using the query field and see if you can identify, does it look like we have any potential command and control taking place? So this is in the lab two directory. So we've been working in lab one the whole time. So I'm just gonna say cd space dot dot forward slash lab two. And that'll move me up one directory, that's what the dot dot does, and then move me back down into the lab two directory. And you can see my prompt changed from saying lab one to lab two. And now when I use my ls command to list out what's in this directory, Notice this time I have Zeek log files, but I don't have a PCAP file. I don't need it because we're only going to use the Zeek logs for this. And specifically, the Zeek log we want to use is dns.log. I mean, certainly, you can go poking around in the con.log file if you want to. That is totally up to you. But we want to look for potential command and control over DNS. The dns.log file is the one that's going to be helpful for that. So. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to go through this. We can go through and cover it real quick when we uh, just before we go and hit break. I'll give you a couple, a little bit of time to go through this. Any questions, just throw it into the Discord channel.
Okay, let's talk about this a little bit. <clears throat> I see uh, some commentary going by about, you know, we've got to change the subs and stuff like that in order to doesn't get cached. What do they mean by that? So this is the this is the architecture we were talking about when there's C2 over DNS. That the attacker is going to make a query. It's going to go to the local resolver. The resolver is going to say, okay, I don't have an answer to this question. So I'm going to go out and talk to the authoritative server for the evil.com domain, which just happens to be the command and control server. And that's how the marching orders get passed back in again. Well, what if this system waited 10 seconds and then sent this exact same query again? Well, now this system is going to look at that and say, oh, I have that information in cache. Here's the answer you got last time. Well, wait a minute. Now it's just giving back the same answer. What if there's a queue waiting in the, in the command? Uh, what if there's a command waiting in the queue over here? This didn't actually go ask that any questions. It just handed it back cached information. So how do you prevent that? Well, we could give our answers back with a TTL of zero to say don't cache this information but the local resolver can actually override that. In fact, most people, most admins do this. I know I always did. You know, you tell me not to remember a TTL. Yeah, that's okay. I'm still going to remember it for five minutes because I don't want my systems doing constant DNS queries if I can help it. Part of the reason to have your DNS internally is to reduce the amount of DNS queries going out over your internet link. So even if the attacker tries to set a TTL of zero or one or something like that, it isn't going to work. The server can override that. So the only way to make sure that anytime this thing wants to say, hey, do you have anything for me to do? The only way to absolutely positively make sure it comes all the way back here is to make sure this query is different every single time, that this doesn't look at it and say, oh, I can just hand back cached information. So that's one of the reasons why that's what we're looking for. Now, Let's talk about this one a little bit right before we go to break. So we wanted to see unique queries. And quite honestly, it doesn't take much, right? If I go in and I just, so here I'm saying cat dns.log and show me what was queried. And I'm just going to hit enter and let it scroll by on the screen. This is pretty straightforward, right? You know, honest I'm not evil.com shows up in every query. So we really don't have to do much to figure out in this particular use case, hey, we've got a lot of queries going to you know, honestimnotevil.com. I might have a command and control channel running back to that environment. Now, let me kind of talk you through what we were doing. Um, you know, That's fine for this test data set, but what if there's a lot of other stuff mixed in there too? How would we extract this out? So I'm saying cat dns.log. Pull out Z cut, pull out the query field, this one here. I'm running it through sort, then running it through unique. So sort is any time the query was the same, put them one line after the other. Unique says collapse it down to one. Notice I'm not doing unique C. I'm not saying count it. I'm just saying I want every line to be a unique query that I send to each one of my domains. So what I end up with is something that looks like this. Each line has a unique query on it. That's it. Then what I did is I said, okay, I want to reverse the characters. Why did I do that? Because I want this portion here, honest, I'm not evil.com. I want to be able to match on that. <clears throat> the problem is there might be, uh, if this might be host domain. This might be host subdomain domain. This might be host subdomain subdomain domain. I have no control over that. So I want a way to be able to pattern match on things. <clears throat> so the way I chose to solve this problem was to simply reverse the order of the characters. So honest I'm not evil dot com ends up looking like this. And then anything after that is the host or subdomain domain, you know, whatever it happens to be. But now my top level domain and my domain name are right of the first two fields that show up. Then what I did was I said, cut out those first two fields. Well, now that I have it backwards, the first field is going to be my top level domain. My second is going to be the actual domain itself. So when I run it through that, I end up with something like this. 
So this was na.jp. This was honestimnotevil.com. <clears throat> One line per unique query that was done. <clears throat> then what I did is I said, reverse it back so it's actually readable. Now it's just a simple matter of saying, um, sort it. I probably don't need this sort, but I put it in anyway, just to be obsessive, just to make sure. Unique C, count it, and then sort it highest to lowest. So when I run it through that, I had 2,074 unique host name queries that went to honestimnotevil.com. So 2,074 unique resources I was looking up. One to ne.jp, one to in-address ARPA, and one looks like a fail query. So we said, when I don't recognize the domain, like honestimnotevil.com, I expect it to be about 10 or less, certainly less than 100, absolutely not into the thousands, and this is 2,000. Okay, it is break time again, but let me give you the next lab just so folks can kind of start thinking this through. So I mentioned earlier that, um, oh, and let me throw that command into the uh, Discord channel so you have that, because you're actually going to be kind of building off of this for this next lab. So remember I mentioned that um, folks like to go looking for text queries, because they think all C2 over DNS is going to be text, so they're going to go in and look for that. So what we're going to do in this lab is, for those queries going to honestimnotevil.com, I want you to look at what query type was used. Was it text records or was it something else? Go in, give this one a shot. So it's the top of the hour. We're going to take a 10 minute break. When we come back, we'll continue going with this lab. Talk to folks in 10 minutes.
All right, we are back. So with this lab, you know, we identified honestimnotevil.com. It really appears to be a, a domain that we're funneling C2 traffic out to. So our DNS server is acting as a relay point for some internal compromised host to send that traffic out. But the question was, what type of traffic is it? You know, we're told text record queries. Those are the ones we have to worry about. Um, is this text record queries? Could we just write a simple NID signature to say, hey, if you send a lot of text uh, queries to a remote domain, trigger an alert. Could we do that here? Would that work? That's kind of the question we want to answer. So let me give you a couple more minutes, and then we'll go through and we'll talk about this one. So there's a question about certs for this. Yes, certs usually go out 24 hours after the class ends for anybody that tuned in live. So think 25 hours from now or so is when they'll start getting issued out. Uh, we had 2,000 people register for the class. Um, I've seen somewhere between like six and 700 people in here at any given time. So it might take a little bit for all of those certs to get out. So if it's 25 hours and one minute from now and you still don't see it please don't freak out uh give it till you know tomorrow uh give it until monday morning so give it about 30 hours and if you don't see it then say something otherwise you know you should get it no problem all right so here's what we ran the first time right we talked through this command already and we saw we did 2,074 unique queries to honestimnotevil.com. And we said, yeah, that, that looks like C2. And I said, yeah, but are they all text record queries? So here's how I changed that command. So I still catted the dns.rog file. I pulled out the same information, the query field, but I also pulled out query type. There's two fields. Uh, there's, there's Q type, which will just give you the ID number and there's Q type underscore name, which will give you the actual descriptive name. And as humans, we tend to find those a little bit easier. Then what I did is I said, I only care about data that's associated with honestimnotevil.com. So in other words, the .jp, the ARPA, I don't want to see that stuff. I only want to see honestimnotevil.com. Then what I did is I said, cut field one. Let's kind of look at what that is actually doing. So up till here, this is just making sure that um, <clears throat> the only matches I get are for honestimnotevil.com. So adding in the query type name, here's the query type name here. So it's printed out, this was a C name query, and here's what it was for. This was an MX record query, and here's what that query was for. And we use the grep command to focus in on honestimnotevil.com only. And then the next thing I did is I said cut dash F1. What does this do? Well, if you're not sure, 
do what I just did right now. Pull up the command, delete everything up till this command, and hit enter. That'll show us what it does. <clears throat> Notice what it did. It pulled out that fully qualified domain name that was being queried. So cut dash F1 means cut out and print only the first field. It's the only thing I want to see. Because again, what we're looking for is how often am I seeing you know, each different query type taking place. Then I'm saying sort them. So all the MXs are together, the C names are together. Unique dash C, so only print one line and count them. And sort dash RN, highest to lowest. And our output looks something like this. So the question was, are these text queries? And the answer was, yeah, about a third of them. But about a third of them were MX records and about a third of them were C names. I honestly tried to get them to be the exact same number for all three, but I was always a little bit off and I just said, screw it, this is close enough. <laughs> but my point was, no, it's not always gonna be a text record query. I could have had it never be a text record query if I wanted to. I could have just used MX or just used C names. But I decided to mix it up to show you, hey, they could even do that too. They can throw different types of queries at you so that if you're looking for one particular type or a lot of one particular type, you're still not going to pick up on it. So it's that behavior we saw in the first command where there's a lot of unique queries, regardless of what type that they are, going to a domain that we didn't recognize. That's what lets us know, yeah, we got some C2 running through our DNS server that we need to focus in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that one. And you got the command in here. Here's where I went through and covered it. You know, we can see it's the same number as the fully qualified domain names that we saw in the lab pro just prior to this. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use Rita. So Rita, it doesn't matter what directory you're in when you run the Rita, okay? So Rita, let me pull this up to show, show it off a little bit for you. So if I type in reader with no other command line switches, I'll get something like this. So this will go through and this will show me what commands our, um, our reader supports. If I scroll back up just a little bit, so reader will go through and say, you know, looking for evil needles in big haystacks. It'll show you the version number and then it'll show you what all commands are applicable. So for example, one of the most useful commands is, and there's actually two options, show database or lists. So what I would do with Rita is I would import in Zeek log files. So for example, if I'm in like the lab one directory or the lab two directory and I wanted to import these records, I would go in and say Rita space import space this directory location star.log and then give it a database name. Now you don't have to do that in these labs. I've already imported them. So once they get imported, you can do read it space list and it will list out what databases does it know about. And what I did is I took all the data in lab one and put it in the lab one data set. All the data in lab two, put it in the lab two data set, lab three and so on. So I want to now go in and do an analysis, right? So let's say I want to look at long connections. Well, if I look here, Rita says, yeah, I know how to analyze long connections. So I'm going to say Rita space show dash L, just enough to make it unique versus any other command. Hit the tab key, and that's going to auto-complete the rest of the command for me. <clears throat> and then I'm going to say, what data set do I want to analyze? Well, I want to look for long connections in the lab one data set. So what I want to do is we, we took the Zeek logs and we did the manual commands to try to figure out where my long connections are. I want to see, can Rita show me that same type of data? And when I hit enter, it's going to print some stuff out. <clears throat> if I'm interested in top 10, which most of these are, remember that head command. So here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I want you to check the lab one data set and the lab three data set for DNS C2, long connections, and beacons. I want you to go in and analyze looking for each one of those three. Let me give you a little bit of time to work through this, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about it.
Hey, so I see a couple questions coming in. Um, do you do you have to create the DB or does it create it automatically? In other words, I've got Zeek logs. Does Rita just kind of figure it out? And the answer is you've got to tell Rita what it what you want to import, right? So Rita can do a couple things, and it's a little bit beyond what we can completely get into here. I cover it more in the advanced class. Uh, but Rita, you can go in and you can say, hey, I want you to import Zeke's data every hour into this rolling data set. And that way you have a data set to refer to that's always the most current 24 hour period of time. And then Rita will just write out uh, a day's worth of information from midnight UTC to midnight UTC. So you can always go back and review if you want to. So you need to tell Zeke, or you need to tell Rita, I want to import that Zeke data. And here's when I want to do it and when, but usually that's all done with cron jobs. It's pretty straightforward to go through and set up. And in fact, if you go in and you install Rita, when you run the Rita install process, it will look to see is Zeke there. And if it's not, it'll install it for you. And it'll you know set everything up for you. So installing Rita will actually automate a lot of that. So if you go up to the GitHub for Rita, uh, which we have a link on the Active Countermeasures website, <clears throat> there's an install script to run. Just go ahead and run that. And that'll take care of getting Rita on your system. It'll take care of getting Zeke on your system and it'll get everything configured the way you need to. Uh, someone tossed in the, um, the uh, builds tossed in the link to that. Thank you, Bill. So yeah, that's a good way to go. Uh, someone asked, what does dash capital H mean? So um, <laughs> I actually like stumbled across that switch. So uh, I posted into the Discord channel, I'll toss it in again. Someone was asking, how do you get columns to line up, right? So here's how I did it. Actually, let me clear the screen. So here's the command I showed it through in a Discord. Read a space, show beacons. Actually, let me just do this first. And you can see it's not exactly easy to read, right? When I go through and just say, you know, pipe it through head or whatever, the raw output is not easy to read. So what I did is I gave you this command here. So this says Rita show beacons lab one, same as I had here, but I'm using this dash capital H switch, which no one's ever mentioned out of my engineering team. Thank you guys, <laughs> I had to stumble across this. But what that does is that adds in the little bars and stuff like that. It basically gives you kind of an ASCII graphical interface. And then you pipe that through less space dash capital S to kind of clean up the column output and oh, hey, look at that. Isn't that nice and neat and easy to read, right? So um, so the dash H kind of gives you this kind of ASCII graphical display, you know, for the folks who've been around here, have been doing this stuff since like EGA days, this is probably, ooh, right? <laughs> Using curses interfaces, that was all the rage back then. Yeah, yeah, so this gives you kind of an ASCII curses almost type of interface to it. So that's what the dash H does for you. Uh, let's see, you had to stumble across it. You did not read, did you not read the docs? Um, no, I help produce reader. Why would I read the docs? <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding, but only half so. Um, you know, it, what I use is the read to help output. And I didn't see it documented in that. So it may, the dash capital H might actually be in the docs. Um, usually Ethan's pretty good about stuff like that. But uh, yeah, no, I just kind of stumbled across it. Yay, curses. Yeah, I like curses. You could get a graphical interface without having to like run X windows or something like that. And it's, you know, it's graphic enough. I don't need real pretty. I just need to be able to process my data, right? <laughs> that, that's my primary concern. I'm not too worried about, well, is that light blue or is it teal? Who cares? You know, is that data helpful for the problem I'm trying to solve? That's the thing I care about. And Curses was always just fine for that. And you could run it over an SSH session, bare bones. Woohoo. Less dash capital S is help, very helpful. Yeah, totally. How do I leave less dash capital S? So when I'm in this mode and I want to quit, I have a couple of options. I can hit the letter Q, 
that'll do it, right? So hit the Q just does that. I could also hit Control C. Uh, no, Control C doesn't want to quit it. So just hit the uh, hit the letter Q, and that'll get you back out of that mode. Imagine interviewing with someone who helped create Rita. <laughs> Yeah, you know they don't read the docs. Yeah, yeah, if you can teach me something about my own tool, oh yeah, that's definitely gonna impress, definitely. So let's start talking about some of these. So lab one, right, one of the things we wanted to look at was uh, warm connections. Clear the screen. So I'm gonna say Rita show long connections in lab one and let's pipe that through head. Oh. There we go. And here's what I get for output. And actually, let me, th let me throw it into less because that'll clean it up a little bit. There we go. That makes it easier to read. So, Source IP, destination IP. This is telling me this TCP traffic to port 9200. This is telling me that Zeke did not know what was on that application layer. I will tell you it was SSL, but the SSL session started before this capture file did, so Zeke didn't have the information it needed to figure out that this was TLS traffic. So that's why it's mislabeled. But you can see, yeah, that's running for almost 24 hours. So that's something that's worth paying attention to. If I look at my second entry, TCP 80 traffic, it saw the HTTP header, but that's only four minutes in length. This is TCP 443 traffic, it saw the SSL negotiation take place, but now we're into like the two minute time scale. This one here, so it's saying TCP 80 HTTP, TCP 80 dash, what does that mean? That means that there was more than one connection from this source IP address to this destination IP address. And at least once the HTTP header was seen and at least once it was not. Well, why not? Eh, something probably went wrong with the connection. Maybe the receiving system was rejecting connections. The input queue was, was already full. Uh, there may be a number of performance reasons why that happened. But you can see one of the nice things about the reader output is it's showing me what were they talking to and did I understand the application layer. So that can be kind of helpful in running this stuff down. Now, could we run this through data mesh to look at cumulative communication time? We could, we're not gonna get inaccurate results. One of the things that Rita does is for long connections, it ignores anything less than two minutes. So if I've got two systems that are talking to each other and they're doing it at intervals less than two minutes, that duration time isn't going to get added in. So it's actually possible to look at cumulative communication time in Zeek and get different larger values than looking at cumulative communication time within Rita. And Zeek is the one that's correct. And the reason we do that is if it's connecting for less than two minutes, and it's doing it over and over again, long enough to actually show up as a long connection, we're already gonna tag it as a beacon because it's going off constantly. So it was decided that for connections of that type, we'll analyze them as beacons versus long connections. We are adding in an option to look at cumulative time. So it'll just be a switch you add in to be able to look at a cumulative versus individual sessions like you see here. Uh, but that has not been added in just yet. So, but we had two long connections we looked at before. You know, this makes it really easy to go in and find them. Now, the other thing was beacons, right? So I'm saying, Rita, show beacons out of lab one, and then I'm reformatting the data. This is kind of cool. So here's our first one, right? This is the one that we found before because we said, okay, there's a thousand connections that took place, or 3,000 connections that took place, and notice. Um, Rita said, hey, I'm 88.5% certain there's persistency of connection here. You want to go in and pay attention to that. So we didn't have to manipulate data or look at session size or any of that stuff or count connection quantities or any of that. It just tagged it. Um, notice this one. This is one we missed before. 
because there was only 72 connections. But Zeke's saying, hey, you know, those were spread out over that 24 hour period of time. I'm 83.5% certain there's persistency of connection here. That's when we may actually want to run down. So that's when we missed before. So we missed it because we were assuming beacons would always be thousands of connections in a day. And unfortunately, that's a mistake a lot of commercial tools make too. They want to see many, you know, most of them only look at 20 minutes of less of timing. Uh, Vectra AI does 20 minutes. Everybody else is less than that. So looking at 24, looking at data in 24 hour chunks is actually a, a, a unique identifier for Reader and AC Hunter. Most tools are, like I said, 20 minutes or less and that's it. So they want to see a lot of connections taking place quickly in order to try and tag it as a beacon. 72 in the course of a day, yeah, most folks aren't going to pay attention to that. But Rita can look at that and say, is still persistency here. So this is one we would have missed doing that check manually, but Rita was able to tag it for us and tell us it's something worth going and paying attention to. So that's that. So now if I do Rita, um, show exploded DNS for lab one. Let me clean that up dash H, that's dash capital S. So I'm using show exploded DNS. Now it's saying, hey, the domain you queried the most was Microsoft.com. We query 24 unique systems within that domain. Okay, that's perfectly fine. We know who Microsoft is. It's nowhere near in the thousands. There's nothing here in DNS that we need to be concerned about. Now we'll go through and repeat that for lab two. So I'm gonna say, Rita, show, Beacons, lab two. When I go through and run that, Rita comes back and says, hey, you know, I didn't see anything that actually tagged, uh, looked like a beacon to me. So there's nothing here to actually go in and analyze. It's a fairly small data set, so that's not a surprise. So now I'm gonna say, Rita, show long connections for lab two. No, didn't see anything that looked like a long connection either. So again, makes it nice and easy to go in and check. Okay, read up, show what am I doing wrong? Oh. There we go. So let's look at the DNS for lab two. And let me reformat that so it's easier to read. And now it's saying, oh, honest, I'm not evil. There were 2,074 unique queries we did within that domain. That's worth paying attention to. And here are the subdomains I saw. For this subdomain, there were 21 unique connections. So notice it just starts breaking it down into the different subdomains after that. So, but how many went to the domain itself? That's the one we care about. So if you think about like, what did it take us to look for beacons, long connections, and C2 over DNS in these two data sets? It was kind of a lot of work manually, right? And there were commands to remember, and the long strings, and what does this portion of the command do, and that portion of the command do? And Rita just does it for you. It does the hard part. Now we still need to, we would still need to run down business needs some of these, right? We had some beacons, we had some long connections, we'd still need to look at what was that source IP? What application was running on it making these connections? What's that destination IP? You know, is there any reputational information I can pull out about that? We still need to determine business need. But the persistency of connection, Reader is designed to find that for you, find it very quickly and find it efficiently. Uh, we've seen people with uh, 10 gig connections to the internet that run Reader to go in and kind of find this stuff. Um, it's tough in that you need to do scripting, you need to understand what you're looking for. You know, Rita goes through and, you know, gives you data in like this format here, and you need to know what kind of look, what to look for. That's different from, let's say, well, let me show you this real quick. Uh, this one. So this is the our commercial tool, and this is how it presents the data. So remember we talked about that threat score? That's built right into the tool. So how do I know which I, so let's say this is my network. How do I know which system I want to pay attention to the most? Well, it's going to be the system with the highest score. 
right? This list is all my internal IP sorted by threat score, highest score at the top. So which one has the highest score? That's the one I need to go in and pay attention to. Okay, where'd that score come from? Well, that's what the right-hand side of the screen is for. This is identifying, you know, 100 points was assigned because it looked like a beacon signal. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I can click on it to find out. So this will go through and show me, here's that graph we were talking about, 24 hour period of time. I can see this consistency here. Here's the change in deltas. Uh, notice, we, I can see things like, the user was trying to get to baddns.r-1x.com when they went to this IP address. Well, that might help me figure out that, you know, this is something worth going in and paying attention to. Um, I can see what were the communication protocols that were being passed across this connection. You know, what, what was it using when it communicated out? All my IP addresses are clickable. So if I wanted to, let's say I like ThreatCrowd and how it presented the data, I could click on the IP address, go to ThreatCrowd, and see what does ThreatCrowd know about this external IP? That might help me kind of run down kind of trusted reputational data. These menus are editable. So I can add things to them, I can delete things if I want to. So for example, let's say I have, um, uh, a SIM that's collecting log entries off of my host. I could add my SIM to this menu so that when I click on the menu option, it brings me to the web interface for my SIM and automatically loads up the log entries for this particular internal IP address. So now I can go look at, okay, what logs were getting generated on that system? Can identify what was actually creating this type of traffic? Um, so I can go in, I can look for stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> long connections are in here. I can go in and I can define what do I want to use for threshold. You know, by default it's using 10 hours, but I might want to say, yeah, you know, unless it's 15 hours or more, I don't care. And I can go in and I can change my view that way. Um, I get the same type of data here to kind of figure out what was the user trying to get to. There was some talk about uh, HTTP over TLS in the Discord channel. And my advice on that is just say no, don't let that happen. It's billed as a privacy thing. And I'm sorry, but that's BS. It, it, H, <laughs> DNS over, H, over TLS is there so that the browser companies can get your data versus your ISP getting your data. Don't fool yourself that it's anything more than that. You know, they want to make it seem like it's a privacy thing. It's not. What it does do for us in a corporate environment is it blinds us to one of our best tools, which is what was the user trying to get to when they went to that IP address? that can really help resolve a lot of potential security issues. But if it's all getting tunneled through TLS, you're not going to see that. So one of your best options is you can actually block access to the sites on your firewall, deal with it that way. You can push out configs to, you, to the endpoints that say, no, don't use DNS over TLS for anything. Um, that will help resolve this problem. You know, there are networks that are still uh, that are falling back on hey, I'm going to use this outside third-party service to go through and see, is that a known uh, malicious domain? And if so, block the user from getting there. Well, if you're letting users do DNS over TLS, you've just lost that functionality for that user. So DNS over TLS, get control of that in your corporate environment. Don't let it happen. If you want to use it at home, that's personal choice. But in a corporate environment, bad, bad, bad. And like I said, it has nothing to do with privacy. And it has everything to do with browser companies saying, hey, ISPs are making a ton of money off of the software we're writing. How do we get some money out of our out of our customers ourselves? This was one of their answers to that. And you know, quick goes down this path too, but that's a completely different thread. I'm not going to go there. But again, knowing what the user was trying to get to can be super helpful. Uh, knowing the DNS information can be super helpful. Uh, one of the other tools we have built into here is um uh, is a thing called deep dive. So let's say I'm looking at this and I'm saying, yeah, I think I've got a compromised system and I want to do a deeper analysis. I can go to deep dive and deep dive is going to go through and show me everybody this system talked to. And it's going to color code the traffic. So anything color coded in white, that's our way of saying, yeah, we don't think that was suspicious. We think that was just normal user activity. Don't worry about that. Anything color coded in orange, that's a way of saying, this looked at least a little bit suspicious. It might have been what generated all the threat points. It might not be. But if you think that this system is in a, in a compromised state, this may be something that's worth going in and paying attention to. So I can see everything that this system has gone through and talked to. 
Um, and again, everything's nicely color-coded, which makes things cool, uh, easier. The other thing that's really cool about it is let's say I'm doing this analysis and I say, this is definitely a compromised system, right? This is definitely compromised. One of the things we want to figure out is lateral movement, right? How do I do that? That's easy. Go to the external IP, go into deep dive. Deep dive will show you every one of your internal systems talking to that external IP. So if it's only this system, that's the system you need to clean up to recover. If there's 10 other systems in here, which is what I typically see, we've got to address all 10 systems at the same time, or the attacker is still going to have access to our network and it's bad there. And what you'll typically see is, you know, the system you spotted is probably calling home like once per minute. And all these other systems, they're only calling home every six to eight hours or something like that. It's a much slower time interval because they're there simply in case the main system goes offline that they're using to get into your environment. Now, when one of these secondary systems calls in and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? The first one that does that is told, yeah, you're now the primary channel. Start calling back home once per minute instead of once every eight hours. I'm gonna communicate with that network through, through you from now on. So this is a great way to be able to go through and find that. Uh, the other thing that's kind of cool is this directly integrates with our um, Beaker project to be able to go through and kind of correlate network versus host data that you're seeing. So we, I talked about this one. Remember I mentioned this was, this is actually, it's going to be weird to say, this is one of my favorite command and control channels because they're jittering the timing, but it's not that classic cobalt strike timing where it's a percentage change off of a mean. This is somebody who actually did a really good job of randomizing. So let's say I look at, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, oh, this looks really suspicious to me. If I'm running Beaker in the environment, I can click on this little Beaker icon and it'll go off to Beaker and say, hey, Beaker, this source IP address talking to that destination IP address over that time frame, what application was doing that? And when I do that, it'll pop back up and tell me, oh, hey, yeah, that was Notepad. No big deal. Just Notepad. Oh, no, wait a minute. Notepad doesn't make network connections. That's a problem. What I love, love, love about this type of a setup is it makes it dead simple to find hidden processes. Think about what you usually need to do in order to do, um, <clears throat> oh yeah, there's a question. Uh, this is not the open source version. No, it's not, it's a commercial tool. Um, and this is like 10K the first year and like 4K a year after that. So it's inexpensive, but it is commercial. Uh, but it is designed to kind of optimize this stuff. But I was mentioning, um, you know, finding hidden processes running on a system. So think about how do we normally deal with that, right? The way to normally deal with that is you get suspicious without any real data to fall back on, that there might be hidden processes running on a system. You take that system offline, you image it, right? So you make an image of memory and you hope, you really hope that if it is compromised with a hidden process, that the attacker is smart enough to hide processes within proc and you can't see them that they're not also smart enough to check for sequential memory reads going through RAM to figure out that that's you actually imaging RAM, in which case they need to take their malicious code, swap it to disk, wait until you've finished imaging RAM, and then load it back up into memory again, because now you're never going to find them. Um, you got to hope they're not that smart. I mean, that's what friend, and by the way, that system's going to be offline for at least days, maybe weeks, right? That's usually how we find hidden processes, right? Here's how you find it when you combine the host and the network stuff together, like we're talking about here. So let's say I'm looking at this traffic and I'm saying, hmm, this looks really suspicious. And I say, hey, Beaker, show me what application on this, IP, on this internal system was talking to that IP over this date time range. And when I jump into Beaker, Beaker says, ah, I didn't see anything. I didn't see any application making that connection. Okay, if I see that, it's one of two things. Either A, Sysmon is not running on that system, or B, it's a hidden process. How do I tell the difference? It's actually dead simple. I go up here to my query line that automatically got filled in for me, and I go in and I delete the destination IP portion of it. In other words, I simply ask the database, Hey, this IP address over this time frame, did you see any applications connecting to the network? And if it still comes back with no data, okay, Sysmon is not running on that system. But if it comes back and says, yeah, I saw Windows Update going out to Microsoft. I saw Chrome going out to Google. I saw all of these applications doing all of these different things. 
Now you're going to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. Why am I seeing that stuff, but not the suspicious stuff? And the only logical conclusion, because the suspicious stuff is being generated by a hidden process. We've now identified with data that system has hidden processes running on it at scale on the network without having to take systems offline to do it. That to me is just super cool. I spent enough years doing forensics, trying to find hidden processes, getting frustrated by that enough to like now have this capability is just like blows me away. So, and like I said, there was a question about, you know, is this commercial or open source? Yeah, it's commercial. But like I said, the software is dirt cheap. Um, this for us is about getting it out to the masses. It's not about, you know, how much money can we make off it? Um, <laughs> I had actually already retired before I got involved with this project. Um, to me, this was like the biggest problem in security that needed to be solved. You know, when our protections fail and the attackers get in, how do we fix that six month or more window? How do we en enable people to be able to find stuff? And that's where this training comes from. That's where the free tools come from. That's where the commercial tool comes from too. All right, so I walked you through all of these commands. I did show you that, yeah, you can do long connections using Rita, but like I said, it's not the most accurate, uh, excuse me, cumulative communication time with Rita, but I mentioned it's not the most accurate way to do it because Rita ignores connections that are shorter than two minutes in time. Zeek will still record those though. So to do cumulative time on Zeek will give you more accurate results than Rita. However, if it's going off often enough to be running for two minutes and less and that's it, but still be running for like four hours or more total over the 24 hour period of time, um, you're gonna have it pop up as a beacon within Reader as well. So I just went through and showed you, hey, here's another IP address we didn't check out before. Um, Reader is just designed to go in and make it real easy to find that persistency so you know what you need to pay attention to. So even if, again, you could have hundreds of thousands or millions of connection pairs taking place in a day, Rita's job is to say, here's the five or here's the dozen or whatever you need to pay attention to. Something to whittle down that amount of work as quickly as possible. So, you know, from here we'd look at, are there any connections that need more research? You know, is there anything that needs a deeper dive? And again, we've got a number of ways we can go about doing that. We can go look at, what was the DNS query that was sent out that came back with this IP? And if we don't see one, that's suspicious. If we see one, okay, is that potentially related to any business process we have? You know, is it potentially associated with some business software we're running? Once we go through and do that, we can look at what was the connection? Was it HTTP? Was it HTTPS? If it's HTTPS, you know, who was the digital certificate issued to? Is that a potential business partner? You know, if not, okay, I need to kind of run this down a little bit deeper. Um, so we could do some additional search, uh, research on the endpoints to kind of run these through. Uh, let's see, I talked to you through AC Hunter already. I just threw some slides in here. And I'm going to give you a take home lab. So we went through and we looked at, so you may have noticed that when I ran read a list, right, there was three databases listed and we only talked about two. There's also a lab three database that we didn't cover yet. And I'm not going to cover it. I'm going to have you do this as a take home lab. Here's what I want you to do. Don't do lab three direct, uh, the lab three. Don't do this lab right now. Wait at least a week. The reason is we just went through this training. Some things are going to be stuck in your head and other things are stuck in your head, but not with super glue. <laughs> it's just a little bit, you know, a little honey or something. It's just a little sticky right now, and in a day or two, it might fall off. In other words, some of what you learn today, you're going to retain, and some of it you're not. And that's okay. That's part of the learning process. What I want, the hard part is figuring out what did you retain and what didn't you retain. So here's how I want you to uh, figure that out wait at least a week, and then go do this lab. So the lab is going to show up after the wrap-up slide. But basically, I'm going to want you to go through and look for persistency of connection and then look for potential business need for anything that jumps out as a long connection or a beacon or C2 over DNS. I want you to go through and run those down. But wait a week. Do you remember the processes? Do you remember what to do? If there's anything that comes a little bit harder, hey, there's something that didn't stick. That's something you need to run down a little bit further. And if you want to be able to run things down further, 
uh, let's see, it's not that, not that, this one. Go to our website, go to the blogs, and as you can see, we do these things called malware of the day. They're not done every day, they're done about once a week. But this is an analysis of a C2 channel. So if you want to hone these skills, here's how you do it. Go back in history to the very first malware of the day we did, right? If you want to go through all of them. But as a regular process, anytime a new malware of the day comes up, go to that blog entry and don't read it. Very quickly skip to the bottom, like you just saw me do. Now slowly back up, and what you're looking for is this. We always include PCAP files of this C2 traffic. Download these. You know, typically I would grab the 24-hour one and work with that one. So download the 24-hour PCAP file, go through your threat hunting process that you're trying to hone, and see. Do you find anything suspicious in there? Can you run it down to figure out what's actually bad and taking place in this network? Once you think you have the answer, now scroll up to the top and read the blog, because the blog will tell you what the malware does, what systems were involved, what the traffic looked like, you'll get all those answers. So when you get out of this class and you want to hone it, start with the lab three that, I'm, that I gave you, but fall back on that malware of the day to keep it reinforced, and like I said, we come out with those on a weekly basis. Uh, let's see, what else in here might be interesting? I think that's about it. Yeah, I got some classes coming up. I talked about those back at the beginning of the class, at uh, the beginning of this content. So we're all set there. And I just want to say thank you for everybody that showed up today. Um, I kind of buzzed through AC Hunter really quick. If you're interested, um, within GoToMeeting, type in demo. That's it. Just type in demo and we'll have somebody reach back out to you and we can book some personal time to go through it. I don't want to go through it with everybody because I you know, kind of hate doing the commercial thing. Um, but if you're interested in it and you think it's a product that would be useful in your environment, book some demo time with us. We'll, Casey will take care of you. With that said, uh, we are done. Now, let's see. Did I go over running the PCAP? Oh, wait a second. Did you go over running the PCAP into Reader and Zeek? No, I did not. Uh, Agile Dennis, so that's an awesome name. So I'll, let me hit that up really quick for you. So let's say I'm in a directory and I've got a trace file in it, like I have here. I can say Zeek space dash capital C dash R, the name of the trace file and that will generate any log files that are needed. Dash capital C says don't do a CRC check. What, that, what happens is um, anytime you're capturing traffic going to and from the system that's actually capturing the traffic, the CRC is actually generated by the ethernet card, so it looks like it's zero when the sniffer sees it, and it'll tag it as the CRC is corrupt. Um, dash C fixes that problem, and then dash R, reads in that capture file, that PCAP file, and then that'll go in and that'll generate all those log files. So here's how I take a PCAP file and get it into Zeek log format. Now, once I have that, I can say Rita space import space. This is in the home, T-Hunt, lab one directory, and Z created a bunch of files that are named .log, so I can say star.log. And then I say, um, what do I want that data set name to be within read? So I, I put that on, on this command as well. So now that I have my Zeek logs, I can say read a space import. Where are the logs located? Here's the full path to them. And here's what I want that data set named within Rita. And then Rita will import those logs, pull it into its Mongo database, do the beacon analysis, the long connection analysis, and all of that fun stuff. So that is those commands for you. Uh, let's see, uh, folks, do we, did we have any other questions I may have missed? I think we're doing pretty well, Chris. Yeah, not that yeah Bill, Bill, I noticed you like jumping in a lot. Thank you for that. Much, no, no much problem. appreciated. And yeah, I was just wonder if Bill was a bot. He was so fast. <laughs> <laughs> All I have well, is a macro generator. <laughs> yeah, the bill bot. That would be frightening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody release the runs. ferns, right? Blast from the past. Yeah. 
Hey, thank yeah, you. So if, if folks get out of this and they have any questions, um, you know, drop me an email, throw it into this Discord channel. Um, you know, we, we, we keep an eye on this. I'm, I'm happy to go back and answer questions after the fact, folks. So. Yes. Shelby, you, Shelb, you got anything? Yeah, I just um, want to let people know I shared the link to all of your upcoming training classes. So the packet decoding and the advanced threat hunting, security leadership, um, all of those are also in the ACM webcast content channel, just so it's easier to find those links. Um, I also shared the link to our next October session. So if you enjoyed this class and you know anyone who might benefit from it, please share the link with them. Um, as you guys already know, we love helping to educate the community. So the more people, the better. Um, I also want to remind everybody one more time that tomorrow you will receive an email containing your certificate of attendance along with the link to view the raw recording of this. Um, we'll post the official recording onto the um, same web page where you downloaded your VM information within a week or two. Um, and I think that is it. So thank you yeah, again. Folks were asking for dates, date ranges for the advanced class. The next one is in September. Uh, right before Wild West Hacking Fest. And if the getting started with packet decoding is interesting to you, uh, that is a fun class. Uh, I just taught that for the first time. I've already got more content I'm throwing in. There's a lot of hands-on labs. Uh, we're running that in October and then again in December, if that's it. Yes, and a few people are asking about price, so I just wanted to let everyone know the advanced class is $4.95. The pay what you can is between $25 and $4.95. And those who pay $195 or more receive six months access to the Anti-Siphon Cyber Range, which is a hands-on testing environment, um, along with six months access to the recording. So minor correction on that. The next Advanced Threat Hunter training class is part of Wild West Hacking Fest. And I think right. you got to get a ticket with that. So it's not just the $495, it's actually $620. Um, yes, but you're getting you, a discount on the ticket. Uh, but yeah, when we offer it again after that, which I'm, I don't think we're running advanced threat hunting again this year, I don't think. But when we do, Shelby's absolutely right. That's a $495, $495 class US. And then the packet decoding is pay what you want, 25 bucks and up. And that's what Shelby was talking about as far as the scale. If you pay above a certain amount, you get access to the cyber range and all that fun stuff. All cool. right. And that is all um, I had for housekeeping notes. So with that, thank you again, everybody, for spending your Saturday with us. Um, whatever time it is where you are, whether you're about to go to sleep or whether you're waking up for the day, um, I hope you have a great time zone, evening, afternoon, whatever it is for you. And hopefully we'll see you in another webcaster training soon. Yep, thank you, folks. Appreciate you, everybody's Bye. time today, especially the team here. Uh, free cheesecake on me for everybody but Bill. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, I, I we'll throw some in the mouth. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill doesn't get it. He lives too far away. Everybody else, yeah, come to my place tomorrow. Free cheesecake. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, guys. Chris. All right. Thanks, Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.